Good morning and welcome to the annual Baltic Photonics event. Uh, this year, we will focus on medical and life sciences applications of photonics and laser technologies. And we'll hear 20 inspiring presentations. Uh, first of all, many thanks to the team which made this event happen. This is organizers, Laser Micro Machining Cluster Tulas, its coordinator of the Soil Information Technology Park, producer of custom laser products, Optogamma, uh, and future technologies, digital innovation hub, uh, as well as to our partners, uh, laser and engineering technology cluster Litec and Baltic Photonics cluster. This event will be moderated by two amazing people from our laser community. It's Kristina Nanicene, coordinator of Litec cluster, and Mangiras Malinauskas, research director of Linus University. So, thank you all for joining, and please enjoy the event. Yes, thank you, Maria. Uh, hi, everyone. I am Kristina, and I will be today with you for the first part of Baltic Photonics 2021 MedLife. Uh, I would like to encourage all the participants and all the viewers to be active. Uh, feel free to ask any question, uh, give your insights, and share it in the chat window. And we will go. Uh, we will go through it after each presentation. So let's begin. Um, the photonics industry is growing much faster than other economies, despite the dynamic situation in world politics and economics. To get to know more about Lithuanian photonics achievements and opportunities, let me introduce you to the one and only, the president of Lithuanian Laser Association, Gedimina Trachukaitis. Gedimina name. Yeah. Thank you for introduction. Uh, oh, okay, I'm sharing my screen. <laughs> oh. Why? Uh, what? <laughs> oh, okay. So, <clears throat> thank you for the invitation. I appreciate this, uh, this meeting. Uh, that's uh, combined the, the different technologies and I would like to, to see what, what are challenges and opportunities for, for the community. And really, if you look on challenges, uh, what we face, especially in Baltic photonics now, it's uh, related with the dynamic uh, world, political, economical and pandemic. Uh, changes uh, in the market. Uh, there is some li limitation in the market, uh, what we have and also what uh, we share with those markets. There is some uh, entry barriers for new markets, especially when we speak about biomedicals. And Baltic countries are small, so we are very narrow specialized in some niche markets. And there is uh, some limited uh, investment, uh, especially in the US for uh, photonics. But uh, also there are different opportunities. As Christina mentioned, photonics is growing. We, our companies have uh, excellent uh, reputations in the world. We have the community. And uh, there are some opportunities coming from Horizon Europe, so for, for, for new, new, new research areas. And uh, Brigitte will speak about more about this. Uh, there is also missions that are launched by Europe, but also there are missions that we are now discussing in our country. And we also discussing about how to combine laser, photonics, and uh, medical activities and what to do. Of course, collaboration and integration. <clears throat> if we look on photonic market uh, report as it made by, by, by Tematis uh, just recently, really a photonic uh, industry in Europe grows 7% uh, per year for, for many years and uh, growing three times uh, faster than the GDP of the European Union or, or five times uh, as a full uh, European industry. So it's really growing uh, fast and uh, there are a lot of uh, functions that can be performed by photonics, including sensing, uh, uh, imaging, uh, communication, 
visualizations, the lighting, uh, photovoltaics, or, or productions. There are a lot of opportunities. We can go and everybody can find uh, areas that they can uh, find for, for, for their applications or, or ideas how to implement. If you look um, uh, on the global photonic market by applications, it's quite large market and uh, especially related with this workshop. We see on healthcare and wellness, it's uh, close to 90 billion market. Half of this uh, is related with uh, vision correction, but nevertheless for biophotonics devices and systems, we have 44 billion markets. It's quite much larger than, than we have for in this industry for markets. It's all those laser machining technologies coming. Yeah, if you look for another, so uh, Photonic 21 multi-annual strategic roadmap, again, so uh, Europe Union see some uh, objective uh, for, for development, so digital transformation, green transition, digital and technological sovereignty and security, uh, building strategic uh, value chains in Europe. And there are also six key strategic value chains, including connected clean automotive, uh, hydrogen technologies, IT clouds, cybersecurity, low carbon industry, but also uh, smart uh, health. And this market is growing fast. And all of this, and if you look on those, what uh, what uh, topics are covered uh, today in the workshops? So it's microscopy, lighting, uh, some sensing for biomedical areas. It really, is growing. So there, there is a lot of opportunities where, where we can, can find our business or, or activities for for research that could be also transfer it to, to products that helps, uh, helps uh, companies to, to, to introduce some new methods for healthcare. Uh, another, another thing, if we look uh, on the value of photonic companies, it's for uh, Epic company may, may, may made some uh, estimation how biggest companies are working in photonics as well as uh, value of those companies growing uh, in time uh, in the stock market. We see that this compared to all other uh, stock market indexes is growing fast. And uh, even now, uh, there is a special stock uh, combined from different big companies, uh, photonic companies in the world, and you can invest not to a single company like IPG or Coherent, you can invest to photonic industry. And uh, you see that, you uh, know, the full year going, it's like rising the stock uh, prices of, uh, of, the, of those companies. It's really worth to invest in this. And so we are on the market that it's really uh, attractive. Uh, if you look at our photonic uh, laser ecosystem in Lithuania, you know it's, uh, it's well recognized in laser photonic community. And if a laser was developed in the 60s and uh, Nobel Prize in 64, the first laser started in 66 in Lithuania. And uh, now we have quite broad community, it's quite old picture. Uh, with, uh, in center, we have some research entities and uh, starting from, so from uh, uh, sky blue areas, a piece of glass going to, to blue area with different components in the uh, optical uh, or photonic uh, value chain and going to uh, integrated component in the green area, lasers in the uh, red, and after go we, we, we is, uh, to, to laser technology and the laser machines. So it's, we have qu quite uh, established uh, value chain in developing laser technologies. Uh, especially for, for productions, uh, it works very well. And uh, it's still a quite small community with uh, more than 1,000 people working at companies and about 200 people working in the research entities. But nevertheless, we have four, four lasers and optics specialists per 10,000 uh, of population in, in Lithuania. It's quite, quite, quite impressive for this kind of, of, of the country. And if you look uh, how this ecosystem uh, proceeds, uh, turnover is growing, uh, number of employees also growing, and we are selling uh, all products to all, all around the world. 
And uh, most important, that sales are growing uh, uh, twice in four and five years, where the number of employees grow, uh, growing in, uh, twice in two, uh, nine or 10 years. So it means that productivity of the company is growing uh, twice uh, during this, uh, this period. And another thing, especially for recession, it is uh, that about 10% of turnover, uh, those companies invest to R&D, developing new products or, or collaborative uh, research projects with, with, with universities and uh, research institutions. If we look also uh, <clears throat> how we look compared to other uh, clusters or, or some areas, some uh, we look laser and photonic sector in Scotland, the EAF turnover 1.4 billion, but working close to 6,000 6, people. The EAF uh, eight universities working in photonics and laser technologies. And you look on some uh, how it's structured. 35 academic staff, 40 postdocs, 100 PhDs. So a structure is there is a lot of young people like PhD working in those entities and they have a lot of uh, uh, development in that. And I guess uh, all this team is uh, uh, quite international, 20 nationalities working at least in one, in one, uh, at one university in this uh, area. Uh, so we can learn for that. And if you look on another area, the German, the center of German, Berlin and Brandenburg, is uh, nearly 17,000 people uh, working in this photonics and they are uh, 2.8 billion. And we now compare Lithuania now, what it's uh, added value of, uh, per, per one employee in the company in Lithuania now, uh, in Scotland and Brandenburg, uh, Berlin area, we see we are close to the Germany a little uh, was than uh, compared to, to, to Scotland. And if we have some ambition to make 5% of GDP in uh, 2030, so it means increase uh, our, our turnover or input 10 times, we need at least uh, 5,000 specialists. And half of them should be in physical background. If we look how much our universities can provide specialists, it's, it's, it's not feasible. So we should go look also so in the Scotland experience. So we look uh, uh, where we can uh, find more skilled people. And we should expand our system, uh, ecosystem to, to, to grow. And uh, if we have some laser, laser association, 25 members, also so called photonic sector in Lithuania is now is count about 55 companies, we have some clusters, Tulas, Litec, we have Scientific Park, uh, um, so with some companies connected. Uh, and we have laser digital innovation, we have just try to help other companies that would like to use laser uh, and photonic uh, uh, technologies in their productions. Of course, we have Baltic photonic clusters uh, combining uh, capacities of uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And number uh, for, for three countries is st still quite low, but we are discussing how to can, we can expand this, this community, making uh, building this ecosystem in the Baltic countries. Uh, we have some research entities combining together, making RTO with, with research entities to make more and more powerful working not only on photonics and laser, but all going to industry, uh, energy, energy or agri-food sectors. Uh, of course, Photonic 21, but it's, I think it's not so popular in Lithuania. We have not too much active members uh, because of personal members in, in this community, but we are very well presented in the European Photonic Industry Consortium. There's uh, more than 700 uh, members, uh, nearly 20 companies are now members from Lithuania in this. Of course, we are related with Laser Lab, uh, European uh, Light Infrastructure. We have now running two quite big projects, uh, Polisate and Photon Gap that helps companies to, to uh, implement laser-based or photonic uh, 
technologies. And we just recently, our center joined quantum industry consortium, another option that we can, can build on uh, new areas. If you look uh, on this community building, Lithuania is a founding member of uh, Extreme Life Infrastructure. Uh, that are like a running uh, research entity, you know, not simply to build some infrastructure and constructions. It's really opened new opportunities for us to, to, to collaborate, to can influence uh, on how this infrastructure working. And uh, we are looking now how we can co collaborate and do some common research with our research entities, companies, and, and those pillars in, in, in two. Um, and uh, we hope will be and also that, that uh, pillar will be joined uh, fast in this area. Where to go? If you look on our company, uh, competencies in laser development, so laser companies like Explain Light Conversion developed uh, quite powerful lasers for, for, for those extreme light infrastructure. And now they're building CLOS 3, so it means few generation up in up to 15 ter terawatts in the room size lasers. It uh, really opens new opportunity. Of course, our industry is quite famous with industrial grade lasers, uh, just two examples below. And if you look on those industrial lasers, uh, so we have also those ecosystems that uh, group of the companies working on uh, developing models, technologies, software, and system integrations. So even in our system, we, uh, ecosystem, we can build laser machines that can be installed and are installed in the companies worldwide. And uh, more interesting now that we have some spin-off from our center, uh, working on laser applications, they are not uh, not developing technologies, but, but they are using those technologies and providing services for the companies in the country and and broader. And really, there's a step of how to make that those technologies are really useful for the companies that not too much know about photonic and laser technologies. They can piloting uh, for the product development and also step to transferring those technologies fast. One example, so we are developing some technology in the European project, this project, we have some patented uh, technology, and after that, we have quite good investment from public founding uh, in La Poma project, we have finished last, uh, this year, so we are transferring this technology, how to modify polymers and other dielectrics and make selective metallization, and now we are running another tool, Two, two, two projects, uh, Competence Center and the Gamma. How those, uh, this technology can be implemented to a, a smart windows for electronics, also making some distributed network uh, of the sensors. It's a one way how they're working. And for that, we also joined uh, consortium of 3D MAD. So it's on, on uh, companies that are working in integrated uh, electronics. How, how we can proceed? We have quite good established uh, ecosystems that can build uh, up to laser machines and technologies, but we need also some uh, how say neighbor uh, uh, ecosystems working on particular applications, electronic sensor analysis, medical therapy, optical communication, nanomechanics or spectroscopy. I think the uh, main goal of this workshop is to make one of this ecosystem the one more specialized in the particular field. And we can, can see some so that we can uh, make the big progress in this and attract more and more people, uh, medical people, uh, companies are working in the medical field, how to apply those technologies that are on development in photonic and laser companies. We are working quite a lot on, uh, on some road mapping of our ecosystem, especially uh, in Lithuania, and um, trying to, 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 to respond to those European and social ch challenges and missions of Industry 4, digital transformation, health, green deal, security, and see where we have some experience in industrial lasers. We are very well now. We discuss how we can uh, expand our share in the global market. 
We have some activities related for medicine, and we have some ideas of working in this field how to use high intensity lasers in secondary radiation, also for non destructive uh, diagnostic uh, gamma X ray degeneration, high energy electrons applied to for them for cancer therapy or some um, radonuclide production or even some, some cargo inspection in security market. There is also quite open market for, for lasers for communications. I mean, it could be used for process control, environment monitoring, and also quite imagined here is quantum communication, quantum cryptography, and we're working in this field. And it's one of was a goal why we, we became the um, quantum uh, industry consortium members. Another area is um, infrared photonics or integrated photonics. It's mainly related with um, uh, photonic uh, components coming from semiconductors, uh, like uh, laser diodes, uh, uh, etc. And there is a lot of uh, process uh, control and, uh, and medical application and environmental monitoring. And, and night vision system for security. It's a magic also market. It's also, we need some consolidation efforts in research. And in, in this year, I see a lot of um, activities in Latvia and also in Estonia, where we can make more the collaborative research and uh, join in this more. If you look in some, some of these, so it's, uh, we have companies develop it quite terawatt class lasers. It's room size lasers who are working with partners uh, in Europe on making gas targets to make uh, plasma accelerations. And we just started some European projects with, with uh, different goals. And one was going go to the cargo inspection using laser, laser um, uh, um, ignited uh, X-ray uh, and electrons to, to, to look on, on, the, on this kind of the machine. But we see also this application could be expanded to, to, to medical treatment or diagnostic. Another emerging market, as I saw, it's, it's quantum technologies and it's quantum measurements, quantum communication, quantum sensors, uh, uh, quantum computing, uh, and still quite a lot of those technologies based on laser and photonics. And if we look on application areas of the quantum technologies and sensing imaging, et cetera, there is also quantum imaging for medical application. And it's also quite an interesting field when you can use less intensive laser beam for excitation to get images, uh, uh, what, what you need for, for biomedical uh, areas. And another vision, so it's um, together with EPIC in our Ministry of Economy and, uh, and uh, Innovation, we, we, we started a discussion and it's also running the first European Investment Bank. And the goal is to establish investment fund for photonics in Europe. And uh, this, this project is running uh, and we hope in the next year there will be such fund launched. And looking uh, what we have in the locally in our campus where we are located in some companies, Litex is lo located. We see vision, vision for expansions uh, from three hectares to 50 hectares and to think about laser and photonic innovation super hub. But now we are, we are facing how to attract global companies like LG, Intel, Google, or T TSMC for, from Taiwan to, to develop some, some, some yeah. Some technologies or R and D centers here that really lead, need our lasers and uh, or, or our photonic technologies that are developing. That maybe it could be also a biomedical area like Siemens uh, biomedical imaging R and D centers. So, so we're working this and. Uh, Area where we can also expand our system, as I said, so biomedical sensing and diagnostic. Why not? And uh, if you look, come back to this uh, market report, so there are areas uh, where it's uh, uh, photonic devices are used in, in, in healthcare. I do not read it. So you can uh, look also on this uh, report or but there are a lot of uh, laser-based treatment, 
uh, and also diagnostic fields uh, uh, that can be applied. And if you look, uh, the needs, uh, spectra technical functions, constraints uh, regarding regulation standards, uh, clinical trials, and also that photonic technologies and solutions, are that there are a lot of opportunities for, for this kind of application, bio, uh, biomedical application with photonics and lasers. And we have a fun today to discuss with the peers. Thank you. Thank you, Gedeminas. Uh, yep. That was a really nice presentation. Uh, we have a few questions. The first one that I would like to ask you is, um, Lithuania is a very small country, especially comparing with other European countries that develop uh, various laser-based or phonics-based solutions. Uh, but nevertheless, we, uh, in some cases, we are number one or almost number one. So what do you think, what, is, what was, what is the success factor for Lithuanian's um, uh, laser industry? Uh, is it the people, governmental involvement, support, infrastructure, or just luck? What do you think? You know, it's Lithuania is very famous uh, with the lasers, and, um, and now in two areas. Really, there's high power lasers. That silos kind of the lasers is really quite compact and quite powerful for, for this kind of high energy applications. Uh, uh, and really, it's a laser running at one kilohertz. It's not like a one uh, uh, pulse per minute. And it's Good one pulse per minute, good for, 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 for research, maybe, but not for application. Patient will be not lay for, for, for days until there's a beam. And you have uh, this dose is needed for treatment can, can be this. So it's good. And there's good advertisement that we, uh, we install those lasers in the big infrastructure. And now we are looking how to make them commercially viable for, for like to be, to be managed by, by medical people. Another is, of course, uh, those industrial lasers are uh, quite well, and we are very well compete uh, in the world market for that. Of course, we need, in most cases, uh, we need not only laser, but applications. Why I always happy to in this, our, our ecosystem that they are companies that are developing technologies, components, and the machines. So because it's to, 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 to um, <clears throat> Go with the technology and the machine is more easier to come in the market. But of course, there are different, different, different uh, problems or barriers for this. Coming from the for the support, of course, we are now working quite a lot to make a mission on lasers for medical application. Because I think in in industrial market we are quite good and there is no 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 to to make so too much. But we need a more integration in this medical field. Uh, looking uh, with, uh, with the governmental support, of course, researchers need some support to make public uh, public research. But what we see today is something, it's uh, the support, especially in diplomatic ways, uh, goes quite in opposite ways. It's it's quite quite challenges uh, are uh, coming from this area. That's okay, thank you. Uh, also, we have another question. Um, as a president of association, which top three laser applications you see are the most promising for the next 10 years uh, in LT laser growth? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I cannot say too, too, too much. Okay, I work in some fields. I, I see it's, it's my personal. It's the way I directly involved. It's, for me, it's quite difficult to, to discuss. But really what we put, we will put a lot of effort to make some breakthrough in those medical applications. I see a lot of activities at the research entities and also in the companies developing biomedical systems, but still they need some, some integration or collaboration efforts to make the yeah, We are also, Lithuania is also the center making laser and photonic based um, devices for biomedical research, one area. In industrial, there are a lot of uh, varieties. It's, it's difficult to, to say one, one thing that uh, will go because it's, it's quite a dynamic area. Uh, and third area, of course, we are, we are looking at this, our experience with very intensive lasers. How to go in this area, I see, and I believe that we, we succeed in this in collaborating uh, around the Europe and the 
business high power lasers to make secondary radiation. And after that, okay, going to industrial uh, diagnostic, medical diagnostic, uh, probably maybe we succeed to go to medical treatment and also some security applications. But we will see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. And also, one more question uh, Can you comment on the typical state of vertical integration in Lithuanian laser companies? Is the amount of subcomponents manufactured in in house or in Lithuania increased or decreased compared to amount of subcomponents being bought from like China? Uh, you know, everything in, in photonics starts from the piece of the glass. I really don't know who grows the glass. We have no glass factory in Lithuania, so for sure we should buy some the glass piece of the glass. And after that, we go to the optical components, lenses. We do we have some production here. We have quite well developed optical coatings uh, uh, industry here. So we're making some components, combining those uh, those uh, optical components, and after that, building lasers. So it's. I have no big, uh, figures how much in the, uh, let's say, complete laser machine or a complete big laser, how much it's uh, products made in, in Lithuania. But okay, it's, it's go a good reason to, to discuss. And I think it's, it's, this number will grow uh, simply for that uh, with our attention with the China, etc. We, we need to, to solve the problems. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the other questions. Okay, thank you, Vidim yeah. So yeah. we'll continue Thank with the... Good luck for everybody. Thank you. So we'll continue with the Baltic Photonics program. And um, Horizon Europe is the EU's key funding program for research and innovation with a budget of uh, almost 96 billion euros. What are the funding possibilities and opportunities for the photonics-based projects? Will tell us more Brigitte Serafinovichuta, the head of Lithuanian RDI license office, Lina. Brigitte, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Really nice to be here uh, with this uh, nice community of uh, photonic uh, industry and research as well. So, yeah, as you introduced, my topic today is about Horizon Europe and whether there are any opportunities for photonics. So let's dive into the topic. But uh, uh, before... That. Okay, why can't I change the slide? Yeah, why not? So, yeah, just a, a little reminder of who we are, why, why we were invited here to speak. So, Lino Office uh, was founded in 2017. It's part of the Research Council of Lithuania, but we mainly are based in Brussels. And here in Brussels, you bet me there are a lot of uh, liaison offices from different associations, uh, countries, regions, cities, even universities. So that's, a, as we call it, Brussels bubble is a specific place to be. But that's a place where you get a lot of information, very hot information, uh, and especially Horizon Europe, which is a very big program and uh, a new program. So it's not easy to grasp all, all of the aspects. So being in the loop really helps us to get the, the, the information. And that's why I'm here today, trying to share some of the knowledge. And okay, I will not be very exhaustive in my presentation because as I mentioned, the program itself is very big and complicated, but at least I will try to give you uh, an idea where photonics can benefits and yeah if you want to follow us on on facebook or other social media feel free so we are posting basically every day some of the news on what's happening in this uh, brussels area regarding all the policy developments and also some concrete opportunities like brokerages and info days and what's also important what i mentioned the this brussels bubble is uh, is a network of networks, and we are part of one of these networks, informal network of these na national liaison offices like ours. And uh, what I want to stress that we have a great cooperation with the uh, other Baltic countries, 
uh, with the Estonian Research Council, which also has a, an office here, and Latvia joined this year as well and um, founded an office. They started the activities, uh, well, basically this uh, September. But we've done some events already before, and so I'm looking forward for even more co collaborations. And that's what's also important that there's you can do nothing alone. You need to collaborate, and especially in all these complicated programs as Horizon Europe is. Yeah, talking about Horizon Europe, uh, as you read in the abstract of my presentation, it's uh, the largest research and innovation program in the world. Uh, it's bigger even than Horizon 2020. Uh, yeah, the ambition was to have uh, even 120 billion euros, but uh, due to all negotiations with the Parliament, Commission, and the member states, finally the D budget is 95.5 billion euros, which is still a great amount. And uh, yeah, a, a lot of opportunities you can imagine. Just a reminder of what, how the program is structured as basically three main pillars, uh, quite similar to Horizon 2020, just a little, uh, some tweaks uh, here and there. As the commission was saying, it's, uh, it was not the revolution, but evolution from Horizon 2020 to Horizon Europe. So those who, who are familiar with the Horizon 2020, you might be, might be easy for you to navigate in this new program. But yeah, the, basically it's the pillar first, which is based on the excellent science. Then the biggest uh, pillar is pillar two, but all the societal challenges as they were in Horizon 2020. Now they are grouped into clusters and Gediminas already mentioned some of these uh, challenges there. And uh, pillar three is the uh, uh, very strong uh, accent on the um, uh, commercialization and uh, SMEs uh, and even unicorns. The idea of the commission with the European Innovation Council, which is a new um, kid in the block, uh, so to speak, to help uh, European uh, companies to become new Googles or new Amazons. Like uh, what the commission is, was noticing that we have excellent science, but when it comes uh, to the commercialization and taking part in the global stocks, uh, European companies are losing there. Um, so with this new measure and basically this all pillar free should help these companies to benefit and uh, to grow. And the horizontal uh, part, widening participation and strengthening European research area, it's yeah, the same measures that we also had in Horizon 2020 uh, to help these uh, not, not so new, but still new European uh, uh, Union member states like uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, who joined the EU 2004, those two uh, excel as well in in uh, in the research and uh, the performances and to try to bridge the gap which is existing between AU15 countries now 14 <laughs> because of the brexit and AU13 because when you look at uh, who is benefiting mostly from uh, these countries these are the old uh, AU countries like uh, Germany Spain France uh, Sweden and all, all these uh, innovators who are high on the innovation scoreboard. So let's look uh, again. Yeah, that's a reminder of all budget. And as you see, the biggest uh, amount is allocated to global challenges and industrial, com industrial competitiveness. Uh, excellent science uh, with the European Research Council is also a prominent part. And uh, yeah, this innovation part, the, the third uh, pillar is smaller than the excellent uh, research uh, part. And the widening part is uh, the smallest, but still it's twice as big as it was in Horizon 2020. So 
So there are opportunities. I know that Lithuania was not very successful in uh, in that widening part, but um, now with the bigger bigger budget, should be more more accessible. Uh, what's important to know, speaking about Horizon Europe, it's uh, the political priorities, and Minas also mentioned some of them. The whole program serves these uh, high political uh, priorities of European Commission, uh, like underlying and political guidelines, and you see all the six uh, main points, including yeah, Green Deal, uh, Europe fit for digital age, uh, and some also like democracy-related uh, areas. So while uh, writing your proposals, uh, you have to tackle, you have to show that uh, your proposal is relevant towards these uh, political uh, priorities. So, yeah, know your funder. And as I mentioned, th there are some novelties in uh, Horizon Europe, uh, even though not that uh, great compared to what was in Horizon 2020, but yeah, with, with every financial period, there are some uh, new elements. And as I mentioned, this uh, political priorities are much more stressed than, than before, like uh, the sustainable development goals, all um, climate uh, pact, uh, even 35% of the Horizon, 20, Horizon Europe budget is uh, kind of benchmarked for um, climate-related issues. And uh, yeah, one of the novelties is the European Innovation Council that I already mentioned, I will talk a, a bit later as well. Uh, the cluster approach, which is just a different grouping of more or less the same stuff, but the idea is that uh, the clusters are not really very narrowly uh, focused on, on one sector. It's really collaborative research in the sense that all, all of research industry fields should work together. And all it should be not only like research with research, but also yeah, stakeholder involvement, uh, including citizens. It's it's stressed uh, much more than before. And then uh, the European partnerships were reorganized a bit uh, to make it more simple and more understandable. And the novelty is the missions that was also mentioned, and I will show a bit more on on that later. And yeah, association agreements and uh, with the Brexit in mind, now the Switzerland is out of game for Horizon Europe, uh, at least for now. So all these uh, association arrangements uh, have to be done anew. What was true in Horizon 2020, now, yeah, it's, it's a new, uh, new process. So the commission is uh, negotiating with all the association, associated countries. And the synergies are also very much stressed. So synergies with structural funds, synergies with the other AU programs such as Defend Fund, Life Program, um, and all and the rest of, of the programs. So it should be the idea is to make it really more synergistic approach. How it will happen, we'll see in reality with the first calls and first implementation of the calls. And now, yeah, talking about the opportunities. So the opportunities basically are everywhere for photonics. Uh, in pillar one, like it's uh, pillar one is uh, is not defined by by the top. It's not a top down. It's bottom up approach. So basically, any topic can be uh, submitted to one of these uh, instruments. As I mentioned, the European Research Council, we don't have that many uh, grants here, but uh, it's, it's bottom up. So um, what you need here is really like excellent idea, excellent science, excellent uh, track record of uh, your achievements. But by photonics or any of the ideas here is fully eligible. And what's also important, why if you get the ERC grant, then you are also eligible to for proof of concept grants later on. Um, 
which should help, help uh, commercialize the research acquired during this grant and go into explore the market opportunities. And then Maurice Kolodowska reactions that's a, a great opportunity to get some uh, postdocs, doctoral uh, candidates, uh, uh, staff exchange. So it's also bottom up. It's not about the topic. It's uh, it's the measures and. I think all these clusters that Gediminas mentioned in, in Scotland and in, in, in uh, Germany, they definitely benefit from these actions and uh, majority of the postdocs and doctoral candidates are funded via these uh, actions. So keep in mind these options. And the research infrastructures was also mentioned, the LA infrastructure is here under this pillar. Uh, I will jump to pillar three, uh, but yeah, well, basically what I mentioned, that's uh, that's for the SMEs and growing uh, and startups and growing companies. And there are three main uh, intervention possibilities, like Pathfinder and Transition or Accelerator. Um, and Accelerator is the novelty because you get not only the grant, but also investment. So... Uh, it's not clear as well how, how it will actually work out, but uh, that's the first time that the European Commission is actually investing uh, and having part of the shares in the company. And then they should pull out, but that, that should help with the companies to really become future unicorns. Um, and the uh, horizontal... Uh, Part, the widening part, what I was also mentioning, like teaming, twinning, error shares, or cost, it's bottom up. So photonics is fully um, understood. Uh, uh, and you can definitely benefit if you have a good idea for uh, teaming, like building a new excellence hub or uh, twinning with the. And it's uh, the idea is to collaborate between these AU13 new countries and the old country. So it's uh, an opportunity to really build some new partnerships. And uh, let's go back to the biggest pillar, the pillar two on the clusters. And there you find these uh, European missions and uh, partnerships. And talking about the health, that's, uh, that's the this conference. So the main cluster, of course, is cluster one health. And, uh, but yeah, as I sh I'm showing here, uh, it also includes developing of uh, health technologies. And uh, what I would also suggest to look into Horizon, Horizon Europe strategic plan, which is a, a new document, which uh, was not existent before in Horizon 2020, but now Horizon Europe has a strategic plan, which sets the... Uh, how the program will be implemented in four years. So this plan is four years. The work programs are only two years, but yeah, the strategic plan, it uh, shows kind of guidelines where the next work programs will be on, on what topics. So you can read that and guess what kind of uh, calls will be developed uh, in 2023, 2024. So that's uh, just a tip for me. And uh, examples of opportunities in, uh, in existing already approved uh, uh, work programs. Uh, so mentioned two, two years uh, span, 2021, 2022. Uh, uh, some of the calls on like one of the smart, smart medical devices already closing basically this month. So it's probably a bit too late if you're not in, in the consortium. So we have to look at what will happen next. So as I mentioned, this program is under preparation. It should be uh, the new work program uh, approved by, by the end of 2022. Uh, and you can find all these work programs and uh, look into where you could see your role. So it's all uh, publicly available. The missions, uh, yeah, that's a new, that's a novelty. The idea is to try to fund research and innovation uh, 
very much focused on the impact on, on actual results. Uh, so far, it, it is, uh, there were five mission areas uh, defined by the member seats and the commission, and one of them is uh, cancer. Uh, so definitely there is a role for photonics, especially in the devices in this mission and in other missions as well. So I <laughs> said, like, just be creative and, and see where's your opportunities and how to position yourself. So with the missions, it's, it's a work in progress. Uh, uh, there are already several calls launched under missions work program, which is a, a chapter in the, uh, the whole program. And uh, there should be a formal launch uh, this September. Okay, it's still not officially uh, announced, but uh, that's what the commission is saying for the, uh, during the program committee meetings. And uh, the ongoing work is updates on the current work program. So with more concrete uh, calls for proposals, so it should be finalized the, by December this year. And there will be more, more, more calls than it's now. Now it's mainly the coordination support actions, but there should be already research and innovation actions or innovation actions. So keep an eye on that, uh, stay, stay in the loop and uh, try to benefit and, and try to contribute to that mission. The partnerships, as I mentioned, they were restructured, re renamed, regrouped. So now we have three types of uh, partnerships, co-programmed, co-funded, and institutionalized. And you can find more information on the partnerships. It's a big topic in itself. Uh, and because there are 49 can candidate partnerships and they all will show up in the, in the work programs um, across the... the in the pillar two, but across the cl clusters. And there is a photonics uh, partnership and it was, Gediminas yeah, already mentioned that, so yeah, keep an eye on that. There is a call related to that partnership, which closes next year. So mind all these uh, different possibilities. And, and yet, just a reminder of yeah, budget again, and health in, indeed is quite a substantial uh, part here. So there are definitely opportunities that you can benefit. So all information is available online, free to, to read, and, and you need to read if you want to be uh, focused and, and to, the, to the point. And there is support. I know it's it's a complicated program, but yeah, please contact your national contact points. These are the primary people who will help with concrete topics, concrete calls. There, there are research project offices uh, at your institutions use, they help. Uh, there are these liaison offices as ours, so we can give some also tips and guidance or advice. And of course there are paid consultancies. So, there are various options how how to not to get lost in all this uh, uh, complicated uh, program. And visibility is important, so that's that's one of the examples of what we did as uh, liaison offices. So we had a webinar on uh, European innovation ecosystem and Baltic landscape. So maybe an idea to have something together with you. So that's just a suggestion to to think in the. And in a natural yeah, be ambitious, be in the loop, be creative, and be collaborative. Thank you, and let's stay connected. Thank you, Brigitta, for an amazing presentation. Uh, since we are a little bit out of time, uh, I would like to give you one question. Um, some of the partnerships are with member states' involvement. Uh, how active are the Baltic countries here? Yeah, I'm not sure about the Latvia and Estonia, but uh, yeah, Lithuania, it's the mainly Ministry of Research uh, that is involved uh, in coordinating this question. Uh, what I know for some of the partnerships, there was some selection process because yeah, we cannot <laughs> we have um, limited resources, so we, we cannot be active in all of these 49 
partnerships. So um, there was some selection cons consult consulting uh, process, and then some of the partnerships were selected. And from uh, uh, I think from the uh, whatever some structural funds or the uh, resilience funds were allocated for the partnerships. So like 1 million per, per partnership, which is not a lot, but better than nothing. So yeah, but it's it's also work in progress. That's, um, it's a hot topic. <laughs> Thank you, Brigitte. So in overall, we see that there is a lot of opportunities in the future also for different platonic B solutions uh, to be Absolutely. appointed. You just have to be open-minded and find the right partners and just to get that money back to, to Lithuania into the budget and, and create that innovation. So once again, thank you, Brigitta. And uh, also follow Lino uh, in them, their uh, social media to find the latest information. And for the rest of us, we will have a five minutes break uh, just for a sip of coffee. And we will return exactly at 11 o'clock in Eastern European time and 10 o'clock if you are more from the Central European region. So see you after five minutes.
Hey again. Uh, so welcome back from the short break. Uh, we will continue with the Baltic uh, Photonics 2021 MedLife program. And we will continue with the multimodal uh, spectroscopic imaging for optical histopathology presentation. Uh, Raman and infrared spectroscopies are coupled with the microscopes, fiber optics probes, and other optical modalities to address needs in histopathology. About the progress and data analysis of imaging of tissues will present work group leader at Leibniz Institute of Atomic Technology, Christoph Kraft. So Christoph, Christoph, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. I work uh, at the Leibniz Institute of Photonic Technology in Jena, Germany, um, in the department of, of Jürgen Popp. And today I will also present some work uh, of the labs of Ivan Shi and Michael Schmidt. Yeah, uh, topic is multimodal spectroscopy for pre, intra and post-operative imaging. There are medical needs in numerous uh, scenarios. First, to better visualize the tumor, better discriminate tumor from normal surrounding, better discriminate cancer also from precancerous lesion and chronic inflammation, detect cancer in earlier stage, uh, yeah, um, then avoid sampling errors, uh, provide optical online guidance uh, during surgery, monitoring during therapy, and also to help during follow-up. Oh, the slide stuck a little bit. Sorry for this. So, yeah. Um, as mentioned in the abstract, infrared, um, Absorption spectroscopy and Raman scattering spectroscopy are two vibration spectroscopic methods. And the animation shows a vibration of a, of a water molecule, of course, uh, in an enhanced way. Infrared absorption is based on uh, uh, excitation of a vibrational mode from a ground state to an excited state. And in Raman spectroscopy, this is a two photon process. So uh, a pump photon is needed or an excitation photon needed, another photon is emitted. And as a result, we have also an, an excited vibrational state. Yeah, I will start with Raman spectroscopy. It uh, uh, offers high specificity, but it's a rather weak effect. Uh, the sample preparation is minimal and the method is non-invasive, which is uh, important for medical application. Also, hydrated samples is possible. This is difficult for infrared spectroscopy. Um, after combination with a microscope, and the spatial resolution is uh, below one micrometer. And the fiber probes um, can be coupled to Raman spectrometers for endoscopic applications. So this is coupling with a microscope. So the visible microscope is a camera. A laser is coupled and focused on the sample. The scattered light is collected by the same objective lens. Uh, a notch filter separates uh, the green excitation light from the, from the Raman scattered light, which has a different frequency. And then this is analyzed by a spectrometer and a CCD. So the principle is uh, well established. And uh, as a first example, um, I uh, present microscopic imaging of brain two more tissue sections. So we, we scanned the tissue, uh, several thousand of spectra, and then decomposed the, uh, the hyperspectral image into uh, spectra, and uh, the color indicates uh, the concentration. For example, here, uh, green indicates that the uh, lipids dominate, and uh, there are only a few cell nuclei, blue, and this is a signature for cell nuclei. And this clearly shows a regular cell density uh, with a high lipid content. This is, of course, different for uh, tumor tissue with an increased cell density, as evident here by these uh, cell nuclei in blue. Uh, the lipid content is low, so there's almost no green, and there are a few uh, red areas, typical of are represented by this uh, uh, typical Raman spectra of proteins. Situation is again different for necrotic tissue. Here we have an increase of uh, cholesterol ester, 
and uh, also less cell nuclei. So Raman microscopy can give uh, uh, an image information and a spectral information, and this can be quantified. Yeah, um, a colleague now started to combine Raman spectroscopy with other multimodality to, uh, to, to complement the Raman information with, uh, with, with other, uh, for example, with optical coherence tomography and fluorescence lifetime imaging. These methods are, offer uh, advantages in, in speed and also you can um, uh, get complementary information. Of course, the setup of the instrument is uh, much more complicated. So we have a Raman spectroscopic arm, we have an OCT arm, and we have the FLIM, uh, that means fluorescence lifetime arm, and everything is combined in such a scanner head. And this is how it was realized in the lab. And here in, in the middle, uh, you see the fluorescence emission spectrum, Raman spectrum, and the FLIM spectrum that can be simultaneously collected and analyzed and also the data can be correlated with each other. And here on, 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 on the right side, we have a Raman spectrum and some typical OCT scans of, of, of tissue, uh, which uh, offers higher penetration than Raman spectroscopy. Okay, hold on a second. Um, yeah. Um, a next step in our lab was to develop a device for label-free non-destructive in vivo diagnostic. Uh, the device adheres to the guidelines of the medical device regulation, and it was designed for clinic application uh, with high and reproducible performance. Uh, so the Raman system was, was built on a medical card for easy access to the surgery room, also medical-grade computer and interface components were designed for clinic application. For example, here is this foot pedal. So uh, by, by tapping on this foot pedal, uh, uh, the uh, Raman spectrum can be uh, collected. There was an intuitive software control for data acquisition and visualization. Uh, the documentation was submitted for in vivo diagnostic of bladder cancer. And of course, uh, very important, also such a medical grade fiber optic probe that can uh, easily connect it to the Raman system. So here, this is another probe. We, we call it a mixed chemical reality. So here you see a fiber probe that is moved over the sample and the software um, analyzes the data online and then a projector um, project the results um, directly on this tissue section. So this is a porcine brain. And uh, so, and, and, and this can help to, to visualize uh, uh, pathologies during surgery. So I can, I can play the video once, once more. It's not funny. Okay. So I have to move on because I have just 20 minutes. Um, yeah, the next topic is multimodal nonlinear microscopy for interoperative imaging. So uh, nonlinear multiphoto modalities are coherent anti-Stokes Raman spectroscopy. So this is a, a variant of Raman spectroscopy, uh, which can en enhance uh, uh, the, the sensitivity. So um, and it can be combined with other multi-photon techniques like two-photon excited fluorescence, two-photon excited um, fluorescence lifetime imaging. That means uh, two-photon excite uh, uh, two red photons excite fluorescence uh, which is emitted in the blue and the green wavelength range and second harmonic generation is uh, if two photons uh, if two uh, uh, low frequency photos are scattered with twice the frequency and and these three modalities can probe different uh, molecular properties of course uh, fluorescence probe fluorophores, second monogenation probes uh, fibers, fibrous proteins such as collagen, yeah, and coherent anti Raman spectroscopy um, gives a molecular contrast. These uh, images 
can be correlated with histology uh, in tissue sections. And, and once it's called, such a correlation has been established, um, a prediction model can be trained um, to um, calculate a histological pseudo-stained image by machine learning method. I come back to this uh, in a few minutes. Yeah, why coherent Raman scattering in multifocal microscopy? First of all, the pixel dwell time is extremely short. Um, it's in the range of one microseconds. The photomultipliers are used for detection. So one million pixels, one million data points can be collected within a second. So this is a real-time imaging method. And uh, so the methods uh, to achieve such a high speed um, laser scanning microscope are used. Then this uh, multi-photon microscopy uh, only probes a small confocal volume. So we have an intrinsic confocality compared to these uh, linear microscopic methods that give a, a line focus. And uh, uh, for excitation, uh, pulse lasers in the biological optical windows from 800 to 1,600 nanometer are used. These wavelengths can penetrate deeper in tissue. And of course, all methods give uh, molecular contrast. So when I started at IPHD in 2008, uh, a, a lab was built to start this uh, research. And uh, so this is a laser system for excitation. This is a commercial laser scanning microscope from size. And uh, a few years ago, we already could shrink the system. We built a, 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 a mobile system. And, and the key was um, a fiber laser, which can be used for excitation of cars, two fold and excited fluorescence and second monitor generation. So this box replaces everything which is on this optical table. Yeah, one application is a multimodal interoperative um, inspection of cryosection diagnosis. So there is a rapid cryosection protocol. So uh, a biopsy is, is collected during surgery. Uh, it's embedded and cut. There is a quick staining protocol and the microscope is needed to inspect the um, stained tissue section. Usually this quick protocol gives uh, H&E tissue section in, in low quality. And of course, you not only need a microscope, you also need an experienced pathologist uh, to give an assessment. And of course, the surgeons in the operating theater has to wait for the results. If uh, multimodal microscopy is used to uh, inspect the cryo section, the protocol is much easier. First of all, uh, first of all, unstained tissue section can be studied, and then now uh, the latest version of this instrument, um, it was introduced in 2019, is even smaller. Um, the different modalities, casts, two photon fluorescence, and second harmonic generation gives a false color image. And this can be used for automatic prediction of tissue types. And of course, can also recognize disease. The waiting time in the operating theater is shorter and due to an instant feedback. And of course, automation uh, gives a smaller workload. So this is very promising and uh, we also, we, we already is, is started uh, in the university hospital uh, with first trials. Um, for endoscopic use, we have to develop uh, special fiber optic probes. And uh, in collaboration with other teams, we, de we, we developed uh, the first version of a rigid probe. And uh, with a two millimeter diameter, and we also develop a flexible probe with where the probe head is something like eight millimeter, 
And uh, these probes have been designed for this multi-photo microscopy. This, uh, uh, the, the challenge was to guide these uh, femto and picosecond pulses, which have a very high intensity of, uh, um, and uh, to guide these pulses, uh, yeah, we need special fibers and some of these fibers are also developed at IPHD in our fiber optic department. Yeah, photonic data science, we have uh, also uh, a department in our lab for this topic, and this department is uh, headed by Thomas Bocklitz. Um, the pathologists, the surgeons, are not used to, to look at these uh, false color images. And uh, for this reason, um, uh, a protocol or uh, an al uh, uh, a method was developed to convert, to generate a pseudo H and E stained image. So first of course, of course, you need training data and you need a, a multimodal image from the same sample and then uh, a linear discriminant analysis LDA is trained and then uh, the output is generated by partial square regression. And uh, uh, yeah, so this was published in 2016. And uh, now we use also machine learning techniques uh, like uh, these gen networks, um, these are uh, neural networks uh, which can be used in a supervised and unsupervised way. And uh, they give a very close, uh, they give a contrast which is, which is very close to the target contrast. So this is conventional stained tissue section. And uh, yeah, so um, this is a very important, important uh, topic of that, um, data science uh, for our multimodal um, methods. And the last topic, I would like to present some infrared spectroscopic imaging I mentioned before. Absorption of infrared radiation can also probe vibrations. Uh, this is a spectra contain spectral contribution of all molecules, in particular lipids and protein secondary structures. These Fourier transform infrared, spect and infrared spectrometers, they are state of art, and they can also be coupled to an array detector um, to collect images. Quite new is here this photothermal infrared spectrometers. They use a quantum cascade laser for excitation and uh, a visible probe laser to probe the photothermal effect. And, uh, um, this, uh, with a probe laser uh, examples, one example uh, using FTR imaging. We use FTR imaging uh, to uh, uh, probe unstained brain tissue section. Here in the first level of the classification, we identified the tumor, and then the tumor data was subjected to a second level of classification and determined the primary tumor of the brain metastasis here, in this case, lung cancer. One example for a wide field photothermal imaging approach, the field of view is here approximately two by two millimeter. And here, uh, the lab in the US, they also developed a reconstruction algorithm uh, to calculate a pseudo H and E image. And so, and this is on, on the right, this is uh, the conventional stained image. And uh, the agreement is uh, very well. Yes, I have this. Is, and uh, infrared spectroscopy can not only reconstruct H and E, also other immunohistochemical staining protocols can be generated for keratin fibers, cytokeratin, smooth muscles, and vimentin. Uh, so that's also an advantage. You just need one data set, and then you can reconstruct all these contrasts. The last slide. So we coordinated a few years ago a cost action called Raman for Clinics, and we presented already uh, a route from classic histology to in vivo optical biopsy. 
And so uh, we achieved already a number of points, Raman-based methods and combination of methods, software for automated tissue diagnosis, computer-based histo, spectral histopathology, fiber probe development, and uh, flexible endoscope, mixed augmented reality, where we scanned the probe over the sample. This has been achieved. Further things need to be done, for example, the devices need to be certified, validation, clinic, preclinic, preclinical validation studies need to be performed, technical improvements, and of course, combination with therapy, therapy and monitoring. But I think we are on the good way. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Christoph. What an amazing presentation about your uh, rich results. We have a few questions. Um, have you ever tried to enhance signals from tissue using substances uh, from CERS, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy? Yeah, of course, we are also doing surface enhanced Raman, uh, surface -enhanced Raman spectroscopy. And, uh, um, and uh, yeah, and, and the key for surface, enhanced Raman, for surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy is a substrate. So you can uh, use uh, silver or gold nanoparticles, but you can also prepare surfaces. And then you place the samples uh, on the surfaces. So uh, yeah, we are doing this, and this is also a very good option uh, to 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 enhance the sensitivity um, for certain molecules. And also uh, one uh, more short question. Um, what are the most desired laser parameters for all these applications, like pulse duration, wavelength, and etc.? So um, for Raman spectroscopy, uh, autofluorescence is uh, an issue, in particular if we use uh, a green and blue laser for excitation. So most people use uh, 785 and near infrared laser. And um, but but sometimes um, the tissue is the tissue auto is still too high. So you have to move even to 1064, or alternatively, you can uh, use infrared spectroscopy. Infrared spectroscopy is free of auto And an option is also coherent anti-Stokes Raman spectroscopy because the anti-Stokes um, signal in Raman spectroscopy is free of fluorescence. Thank you, Christoph. So once again, thank you for your presentation and we will continue. Uh, like it was mentioned, modern biomedical imaging technologies rely on lasers, especially now femtosecond lasers. As the ambition of these applications increases, so do the requirements on laser uh, features, performance and reliability. R&D engineer Lucas Contanis will, uh, will go over some of the imaging challenges from the laser source standpoint and some of the solutions capable from light conversion, one of the world's leading manufacturers of femtosecond lasers. Lucas, the floor is yours. Okay, um, hello, hello everyone. Uh, so my name is Lucas Contanis. Uh, thank you for the, for the introduction. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll be talking about the applications of uh, femtosecond uh, lasers. Uh, I say for life science applications in the, uh, in the slide, but it's gonna be imaging, which is also my background. Um, okay, so, yeah, page down, okay. Right, so today I'm uh, representing uh, light conversion. Um, we've been uh, uh, operating for uh, almost uh, 30 years now, and uh, uh, we have a substantial track record in uh, OPA, femtosecond OPA development, terbium-based lasers, and uh, also bespoke ultra-fast systems. Uh, as well as uh, high peak power, uh, essentially facility class uh, OPCPAs, and uh, um, this is uh, this is uh, proven also by uh, the fact that uh, 93 out of the uh, top 100 universities have one or more of our systems uh, installed. So this is something we're very uh, very proud of. Um, right. So uh, this is going to be interesting. You've seen this slide before, uh, but it's a good good one. Uh, I, I'm sure all the microscopists will appreciate. Um, so Christoph uh, um, made a very good introduction into how nonlinear signals uh, appear, so I don't need to repeat this, so this is very good. Thanks for that. Um, what I maybe would like to um, emphasize here is, uh, so uh, you see this, uh, you don't see my laser pointer, 
Let me, okay, this should be better now. All right, so uh, what I want to emphasize is, so this uh, uh, nonlinear focal spot appears because you have to concentrate your, uh, your photons, your uh, excitation light in space, so that's what the objective does, but you also uh, need to concentrate it in time. And this is, this is why you need uh, femtosecond laser sources so that uh, you, can, you can perform this nonlinear excitation efficiently. And uh, when you do that, uh, so in this example, you see a cuvette that's filled with a fluorescent dye. So you see multi-photon excited fluorescence, but has been mentioned uh, in the same focal volume. You also uh, get uh, second and th third harmonic generation, which has to do with uh, sample structure and uh, the uh, vibrational, so chemical specificity via coherent uh, and simulate uh, coherent anti-Stokes and stimulated Raman scattering is all uh, what the what the previous talk was about. So this is a good segue uh, into what I why, what I would like to say. So what I'll do next, I'll just go over um, some of our products and the applications that they are uh, used in um, to sort of give you an overview of uh, what, uh, what a microscopist uh, might use. Um, so at the core of every femtosecond system is a femtosecond oscillator. Uh, it provides, uh, so in, in, in our portfolio, this is called the Flint, and it provides a pulse train of 30 to 170 femtosecond uh, pulses at uh, about 75 megahertz. And uh, it, it can go up to 20 watts of average power, which is uh, orders of magnitude more uh, than you need for imaging, but it can do that. But uh, more importantly, I would say, is the fact that the, uh, the, the noise performance uh, of the Flint is, uh, is shot limited at, about, uh, at above one megahertz, which is essential uh, for all the downstream laser devices, as well as the uh, improving the signal to noise ratio in, in imaging, which is, uh, uh, which is important these days. And uh, so one example just uh, down the road uh, from us here at the Vilnius University from uh, Barsda Group is um, using a, an oscillator for laser scanning microscopy, which has been introduced as well. So here you scan this nonlinear focus over an image to form, uh, to form these, beautiful, uh, these beautiful pictures. Uh, here uh, a, con a conductive... Uh, Heart system is shown in SEG and THG, and so the collagen and myosin, which are structural proteins, can be seen in purple, and the uh, the cellular structure and nuclei nuclei are seen in THG, uh, shown here in blue. Um, so, right, and uh, so if you have an oscillator, but uh, you need uh, you need a tunable uh, wavelength. Uh, you, uh, you need an optical parametric oscillator on OPO. So uh, we have a Cronus 3, uh, 2P, which is uh, a dual output uh, uh, OPO. So it has two independently tunable beams uh, from 680 nanometers all the way to 1,300. Uh, it, it has a similar output uh, train to the Flint and uh, a one watt output power per beam. And... Um, uh, yeah, so it also inherits the uh, shot uh, noise limited uh, performance from the Flint, which is inside a Cronus 2P. And uh, so our Cronus family is, uh, as you'll see in, in the end, is, is designed for microscopy applications in mind. And so, for example, the Cronus 2P has integrated the GDD, so dispersion compensation, so that you can obtain the short pulses not at the output of the laser, but uh, further down the roads inside your sample, which is where it is important. And if you have such a two-beam uh, OPO, um, what you can do, you can simultaneously uh, perform a neuron stimulation, in, a, in this case in a, a mouse visual cortex, um, at 1,100 nanometers and perform ca uh, calcium, so uh, brain activity, neuron uh, imaging, at 940 nanometers. And you want to do that because if you, if you use the same wavelength to image and excite the neurons, you can have what, what are called um, uh, stimulation artifacts where the imaging beam inadvertently excites the neurons. And so it's, it's a, more difficult to perform experiments this way. So this is what you can do. Right, and uh, so for some applications, even the 20 watts uh, of output power of an of a oscillator might not be enough. And this is where amplified laser systems come in, which can deliver pulses uh, in the microjoule and millijoule level. And our ferros and carbide uh, platforms uh, go up to 80 watts and can deliver pulses uh, uh, in an sort of externally gated pulses uh, from essentially single pulses on demand all the way to two megahertz. 
And uh, so th these are industrial platforms. Uh, they are designed and they operate on factory floors. Uh, you set them up and they work uh, over days and months with essentially zero maintenance. So this is, from that standpoint, is an overkill for, a, for an optics lab, but it's really nice to have a laser that just always works. And they also uh, feature excellent power stability. Um, so routinely, uh, showing stability is less than 0.2%. That's actually so good that as you can see in this slide, it's, it becomes difficult to measure the stability with a traditional uh, high power uh, meter in the lab. Uh, as you can see, so it's, it's already the digital noise of the power meter rather than the drift of the laser, right? So if you have a, a, a high um, energy pulses, so this is a hat tip to IPHT in Jena, um, uh, you, can, you can transform your microscope into a precision microsurgery tool. So you can do femtosecond uh, ablation at a subcellular uh, resolution, which is, uh, so in this example, you can see uh, a part of a vein in a, in a rat uh, uh, liver section being selectively removed and also uh, some uh, epithelium also uh, being identified as being dysplasic and then uh, being selectively removed while uh, keeping the healthy epithelium intact. So, so this was done with a ferrous laser, the ablation. Simultaneously with a fiber laser, you can perform this uh, sort of chemically uh, specific vibrational imaging to also tell uh, where the sort of unhealthy tissue is located. So you can use the same platform for uh, tissue or, or like tumor identification and removal all via sort of femtosecond nonlinear processes. Um, so, uh, uh, if you have really intense pulses, you no longer need to focus them as tightly. Uh, so this is a bit in contrast to what I said before, but you can just spread out the uh, high pulse energies and still get uh, efficient nonlinear excitation over the entire field of view in what's called wide field nonlinear imaging. So in this example, you can see uh, an unstained fruit fly larva sort of freely moving under the microscope. Uh, in, and in SEG, you can see the, uh, the myosin, so the muscle uh, fibers contracting. So, so these are these striated structures. These are characteristic uh, muscle signals. Um, so using a, a sort of a fast wide field imaging is, is essential for these types of uh, dynamic uh, studies of, of muscle. And uh, this is really something that's very hard to do with a scanning system because you're always struggling with signal versus uh, result. Uh, uh, time resolution of your, of your scan. So uh, in those cases, wide field excitation is the way to go. Um, um, in, in addition, so um, because SHG is sensitive to structure, it turns out even, even as something as fine as uh, the action potential firing, so the voltage changing uh, in a cell, so in, in an axon of a neuron, changes the structure, which is reflected in the SHG, which is uh, allows you to use wide field uh, SHG imaging as, a, as a, some sort of a um, contactless patch clamp replacement. Um, so this is, a, this is a really interesting study from the uh, rocket group at the EPFL, uh, also using a ferrous laser. Uh, and sort of finally, um, if, if you have really sensitive samples, uh, like you know, a, a living brain, um, it uh, might be uh, not right for you to excite the entire brain all at once with the wide field excitation. So what you can do instead, you can combine uh, an SLM with a wide field excitation to sort of uh, selectively uh, direct the laser radiation only into a subset of, uh, of your image, the, the neurons that you'd like to excite. So this is essentially at the forefront of uh, uh, nonlinear neuron uh, excitation. And um, yeah, it's also been done with a ferrous laser. Okay, um, so moving on. Now, if you need uh, these energetic pulses, but also want them to be tunable, you need an optical parametric amplifier, so an OPA, um, which is to say like the, what an OPO is not to an oscillator, uh, an OPA is to a laser, so it makes it a tunable laser. And uh, our Orpheus family um, of OPAs uh, provides uh, tunability from 650 nanometers all the way to 2.5 microns, while still delivering these microjoule level watt class uh, pulses uh, up to two megahertz and um, in uh, sort of uh, pulse durations down to 35 uh, femtoseconds. And uh, these are, uh, this is an established uh, uh, family of devices. It's been used in many labs, so it's automated, hands-free, so it's, it's relatively easy to use. And um, so uh, in, in some of the modern uh, microscopy applications, uh, 
what people are trying to do, they're trying to push the sort of imaging depth further. And this is where the, um, um, the biological transparency window that Christoph also mentioned comes in. So you want your uh, laser to be tuned to, let's say, 1.3 or 1.7 uh, microns, where the, uh, the absorption and the scattering combine in such a way that you can uh, obtain an, a diffraction-limited excit uh, excitation focus all the way to like millimeters deep into opaque tissue. So this has been like a revolution in, uh, in uh, deep imaging microscopy, especially in brain imaging. Um, so in this example, uh, the, uh, um, um, a zebrafish brain was imaged uh, in vivo uh, and you can see uh, the uh, neurons firing uh, sort of uh, inside the, um, inside the zebrafish brain. This is done sort of through the animal. So you, d you do not need to, uh, so it, it purely because of the long wavelength excitation, just let's put it briefly like that. And in addition, you can see there, uh, there are these purple signals which come from the third harmonic generation, simultaneous TG generation from the 1.7 excitation, which is uh, an interesting new development because sort of traditionally TG is, is uh, emitted in the UV and it's very hard to obtain the signal anywhere sort of meaningfully uh, from any depth uh, of, the, of the sample. But at 1.7 micron excitation, TG is 570 nanometers. So this is, allows you to also get the third harmonic signal from deep inside the tissues. Now, so this, um, uh, the, the researchers chose the zebrafish uh, cleverly here, here because its nervous system is essentially transparent. So it's, it's a good model animal. You can, uh, you can see through it. But uh, mam mammalian brains are in skulls, which are opaque. So if you remember that um, NYU study that I showed a few slides earlier, so the mouse there had a um, what's called a cranial window implanted. So a portion of the skull replaced with some glass so that you can image through it. It's how it's done. Uh, it's, of course, invasive, requires specialist care, and the animal has to recover after the surgery before you can start your behavioral imaging. So, but uh, what if you could ima image through uh, skulls. And in this uh, uh, very hot sort of paper straight from uh, a preprint archive, uh, a group at the uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology did just that uh, using uh, adaptive optics, uh, which is uh, probably familiar from its use in uh, astronomy to correct aberrations. So what they did here uh, on the left-hand side, you see two columns. Uh, the neurons are shown in orange and blood vessels are shown in red and the gray on the top is the intact animal skull. And so even with the uh, adaptive optics uh, um, correcting for the uh, system, so, so to say, even with a perfect microscope, you can see that the image decays after 200 microns or so, and it's really hard to see. But if you enable, sort of, if you combine adaptive optics with uh, long wavelength excitation, uh, and you correct for the skull aberrations, you can essentially image through bone all the way to 750 microns uh, in, into the brain. And uh, you get not just any images uh, shown here. Uh, so with the, with the full AO enabled, you, you can clearly see the neurons, the axons, and even dendritic spines. So this, so this is to say that the uh, sort of long wavelength uh, femtosecond excitation is, is one of the sort of key enabling technologies of, of pushing live brain imaging further. And, uh, and uh, we're very happy that uh, sort of some of our devices are, are there along for the ride. Okay, so um, for the very end, uh, just a quick pitch then. Um, so I showed you the, the Orpheus uh, platform, which is a research grade uh, OPA designed to live in the lab on an optical table. It, it's good, uh, there's nothing wrong with it. But uh, as the sort of field advances, uh, we see there's a need for compact, uh, um, for compact uh, OPA, uh, low repetition rate sources that are better suited for integrators and labs that are imaging focused so that they don't wanna deal with the lasers and the optical parametric amplifiers. So they still deliver these uh, 1.3, 1.7 micron pulses at the microjoule level energies, which are required for imaging. Uh, also same uh, up to one or two megahertz. It has uh, automated uh, GDD compensation, again, uh, to enable um, the short pulse duration to be obtained uh, after the objective. And you can also compensate sort of brain dispersion as well. It, it had, uh, such things have been shown. And most importantly, this is a it's a it's a device that does not require you to employ a, a laser PhD uh, to be used. So it it can be used by specialists and non-specialists alike. 
Um, so uh, it, the, the, the technology, it uh, inherits uh, all of the sort of industrial uh, three-decade experience that we have. Uh, so, for example, the uh, long-term stability uh, here measured over 10 hours uh, routinely exceeds our 1% specification. So this is a device you can switch on and forget for days if you, if you have a very complicated imaging experiment. And I would say more importantly than the long-term power stability is the short-term pulse-to-pulse or, so to say, pixel-to-pixel, -pixel, like if you're, if you're doing a, a scanning experiment, stability. Uh, this is not that easy to measure, um, but uh, so as you can see, it also shows excellent sub-0.5% uh, 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 performance. So I guess we very good. Yeah, so I'm done. Uh, so thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take uh, your questions now. Thank you, Lucas, for an amazing presentation. And we have a question for you. Is light conversion planning to go beyond just providing lasers to other, uh, to the complete biometric <coughs> diagnosis systems? What is the future plan? Uh, I would say the answer is uh, uh, not in the near future. This is, uh, although I would like to see that uh, personally. So it's, uh, um, I, I guess uh, our current strategy is we're collaborating with microscope builders and integrators to sort of help them solve the problems uh, in the short term. But in the future, I don't know, I'm not the person to answer the question. <laughs> okay, thank you, Lucas. And now we'll continue with uh, our uh, Baltic Photonics Medlife. Next presenter will be Yanis Pingulis, the head of Biophotonics Laboratory at University of Latvia. Biophotonics Laboratory performs applied research on optical remote skin assessment for diagnosis of skin diseases like melanoma and microcirculation disorders like sepsis. Already more than 10 diagnostic prototype devices have been developed and clinically validated. And today Yanis will tell us more about the science behind them. So Yanis, so, very good morning to everyone. I hope that you can see my presentation. Uh, I am uh, representing Biophotonics Lab from University of Latvia. And uh, over the recent decade, we have developed uh, quite a number of uh, prototype devices for um, in vivo imaging of skin. So, all those devices are comprising CMOS cameras and they're intended for non-contact skin assessment, uh, which is patient-friendly and uh, good in uh, all, all senses. And uh, I, I will talk about some designs which uh, have been assembled and tested over the years uh, 2014 to 2020. And I will mainly uh, speak about designs of devices, uh, but uh, also all of them were clinically tested and uh, the test results uh, have been reported and I will show also references uh, <coughs> on the bottom of my slides where the uh, clinical results are presented. So the first device uh, mm, we, are, uh, we have developed uh, is, uh, was called Skimager. Uh, this device uh, was uh, kind of of um, concept device uh, so we we, would, uh, we tried to to get most of what we could from a camera okay, the camera can take uh, steady images and can take also uh, video images uh, so this device uh, was battery powered and uh, was uh, intended for multimodal imaging so so first, uh, it could take uh, RGB reflectance image of, uh, of skin at white polarized pol illumination to reveal uh, subcutaneous structures. Uh, then it could take four spectral images at those wavelengths. Uh, and uh, after that, it uh, could be possible to extract distribution maps of skin mm, chromophores, melanin, hemoglobin, bilirubin, as well as uh, mm, physiological indexes like erythema index or melanoma nevus index, which was developed in our lab. Uh, then it also could uh, take uh, photoplasmography, video images at green illumination, and uh, it uh, 
open the possibility to uh, to map skin blood perfusion and also mm, it could take autofluorescence video images at uh, UV excitation and to map mm, photo bleaching rates of fluorescence uh, which afterwards could be mm, converted into skin fluor fluorophore maps so it's, it, it's a small handy device and what's in there so basically, this is a camera, camera lens, and uh, for illumination we had LED ring comprising 24 LEDs. Uh, so here on the top you see mm, uh, emission bands of uh, all six used LEDs, and we had four uh, four LEDs of each type. So altogether 24 LEDs in this ring. Uh, so there is a main board, electronic board, everything was powered by a lithium-ion uh, accumulator and uh, uh, it was, uh, everything was displayed on the liquid crystal display module um, here on the top. Uh, so that was a very universal device, but uh, then we started uh, to develop maybe some simpler devices, and uh, one of one of those was uh, uh, a device based on a mobile phone, on a smartphone camera, uh, which was equipped with a specific uh, illumination source. Illumination in this case uh, was performed by by. Mm, four or five nanometer LEDs, uh, so the illumination power was about 20 millivolts per square centimeter, which is well below uh, skin safety limits. So there was camera filter, uh, long pass camera filter mm, uh, to pass wavelengths longer than 515 nanometers, and the device could take 20 seconds video with a frame rate. Uh, uh, one frame for two seconds, and uh, it uh, made possible to mm, to follow the autofluorescence photo bleaching parameters, and uh, to construct fluorophore distribution maps. And it was applied for some mm, skin cancer uh, studies, and we got pretty interesting results on that. Another device, uh, pretty similar, it's again about on smartphone and uh, the sm uh, smartphone is placed on a platform with, with an uh, imaging hole. It's a sticky platform to ensure that the design is universal for any kind of smartphones or, or tablets. And then here below is the electronic part. The uh, smartphone is connected with this electronics by, <coughs> by Wi-Fi connections. Uh, uh, by Bluetooth connection, sorry. And uh, the main, uh, main design is uh, pretty simple, so again there is a ring of LEDs, but in this uh, design there are LEDs of three mm, spectral bands of three colors, it's blue, green and red. And uh, so it made possible to take consecutive three spectral images, spectral band images, which uh, could be further converted uh, uh, for skin chromophore mm, mapping. And the third uh, design based on smartphone uh, involved uh, laser illumination. The idea was to use uh, laser lines instead of um, LED bands. And in this design we developed uh, uh, some optical scheme which ensured uh, ensured pretty nice uh, uniform illumination uh, simultaneously at all three used wavelengths so the one one red one green and one one blue and uh, this design allowed uh, to take mm, uh, four, uh, three mm, spectral line images uh, with a single snapshot uh, so Mm, it, uh, it's quite quite a nice technology for fast mapping of chromophores. 
Uh, so why is this technology? Mm, so the main mot motivation is that actually we are, if we are moving from uh, spectral band imaging to spectral line imaging, it means that we are improving spectral selectivity of imaging uh, more than for two orders of magnitude, uh, because uh, uh, line width of lasers, laser lines, of course, is less than uh, 0.1 or even 0.01 nanometer. So this it's extreme spectral selectivity, and uh, by snapshot. Uh, Mm, we are also improving imaging quality because we are avo avoiding motion artifacts and uh, there is a simpler and faster image, uh, image processing because we are just using numbers of wavelengths instead of integrals of spectral bands. So, so this idea was patented uh, nearly 10 years ago but it has, it's still developed. Uh, just to mm, to illustrate how uh, how nice this spectral selectivity is, uh, we had a collaboration with uh, Bank of Latvia. They have a collection of uh, of uh, fake banknotes taken out of uh, out of circulation, and uh, here is a part, just one part of twenty euro banknote. Uh, this is a, a real banknote and this is the same part of a fake banknote, so visually we cannot distinguish uh, a lot of differences there. But if we go to spectral line images, and especially to the ratios of spectral line images, then we see that it's, it's, it's really com completely different. Uh, just, uh, just two examples, two ratios. So, so this method is uh, extremely uh, sensitive to colors, uh, to and it can be used for all kinds of uh, pigment analysis, all kinds of um, color analysis. So we uh, uh, try to extend uh, this uh, idea uh, to four spectral line imaging images, and for that we also developed some new illumination scheme. So, like 25 years ago. Uh, we have developed uh, side emitting optical fibers together with our colleagues in Livani. Uh, in Latvia, you know, we have optical fiber manufacturer, which is now called Light Guide. And now in 2020, we also patented uh, idea that uh, mm, this kind of fiber can be used for very nice uh, uniform illumination simultaneously by several laser lines. In that case, uh, we had uh, four laser lines, so the, the infrared line is not shown here, but it's really, it was really mm, a good solution. And it was implemented in a, in a new device which was made last year, uh, which, was, which was four spectral line imaging uh, mm, camera prototype. We used the camera mm, which uh, had four uh, uh, four bands of uh, sensitivity. Mm, it's usually we have RGB cameras with three bands, but in that case, actually now there are cameras with four bands, with eight, sixteen, and so on bands. So we we used four band camera and made a device, uh, a pretty compact device, based on this principle. Uh, for spectral line imaging, uh, plus there was a possibility to get a fluorescence image by excitation mm, by four or five nanometer laser excitation. Uh, so that's that's how the device uh, looked and uh, there's just a short video uh, how it looks like and what's inside. So so that's uh, the, that's the camera. Uh, we have mm, side emitting uh, fibers attached to RGB laser module and to mm. infrared laser module uh, to emit four spectral lines. So then there is electronics, it is everything is bat battery powered and uh, so it's quite quite a nice compact device with, with uh, good functionality for mm, diagnostics of skin. Uh, uh, we also used uh, cameras with 16 band, mm. 
16 uh, band mosaic cameras, uh, and the, this was application for uh, sepsis diagnostics. Um, for, for so maybe you know the sepsis patients. The sepsis is really deadly, mm, deadly thing, and uh, the one one of symptoms for sepsis patients is that they have kind of marmorized marmor spots on the knees, and uh, it's uh, quite a good mm, uh, location where to diagnose uh, sepsis uh, at a very early stage. And for that, the uh, uh, device was developed uh, with two cameras. One was thermal camera and one was this 16-band uh, mosaic camera. And the design idea is that we have the same display and we simply rotate this device for 180 degrees and we can take uh, two images of the same spot, one thermal and one Mm, multispectral image and after that uh, we can calculate skin oxygen saturation and micro microcirculation functions which was published last uh, two years ago. Uh, <coughs> another device which uh, maybe is uh, most uh, mm, clinically studied, uh, we had 1500 clinical tests, more than 1500 and the device is uh, mm, pretty, pretty mm, simple. It has uh, four LEDs, one for autofluorescence excitation and three for uh, spectral images. For uh, spectral imaging, that's uh, three mm, spectral uh, mm, bands. And then we have developed some algorithm which uh, is sensitive to to melanoma, to distinguish melanoma from other pigmented lesions, and the device showed sensitivity of about 85% and specificity up to 95%. It was uh, tested at uh, four countries, uh, Latvia, Hungary, Bulgaria, and also, also mm, partly uh, <coughs> in, uh, in one more country. And uh, mm, so the idea of this uh, device, why it is uh, mm, maybe very prospective, is that uh, all the information mm, uh, is uh, sent to cloud computing. So the device can be used at, at any location on the globe and all information can be connected uh, in the cloud. So we have special, uh, have really special software, check your skin where this uh, melanoma parameter is quickly calculated. We can send information to some uh, consulting doctors, maybe in other continent. Uh, so this device looks uh, really interesting for further implementation. And uh, the last thing I want to share is uh, photoplasmography imaging. Uh, the idea, maybe it's very complicated word, photoplasmography. But, but that's, that's the method what's used in smartwatches now to measure your heart rate. Uh, and the, uh, uh, most of that uh, is uh, done in contact way, but also we can use non-contact approach, just illuminating skin by CW light, and usually it's green light. And in reflected light, we see some modulation, uh, which is caused due to Mm, changing of blood content in the tissues due to arterial uh, mm, extraction, uh, actually, uh, actually mm, change of vol volume of arteries with, e with each heartbeat. And uh, one of applications uh, which is interesting for doctors is that in that way we can follow mm, efficiency of anesthesia. Uh, before and during operations, because sometimes doctors are not sure if anesthesia works or not. So by this technology, we can follow mm, how the pulses, pulse amplitudes of, of PPG signals increase in result of anesthesia, because when we lose our senses, then our microcirculation increases, the heart beats harder. Uh, and uh, so we see this kind of inc increase and also we can map specific parts where this uh, uh, microcirculation changes are most expressed. So we have developed several 
devices for this application. So one was very small, four four by four centimeters only, with camera in the middle and with LED comprising uh, green light and also infrared because infrared PPG signals are also uh, <coughs> informative related to deeper blood vessels. So uh, one more device, a bit larger, uh, where the hand could be placed on a, mm, on, a on a vacuum pillow for fixing, and uh, it, it had more uh, more advanced, one could say, illumination units uh, with four pairs of green and infrared LEDs, which uh, allowed to get uh, quite quite high quality results. And this idea finally was implemented in hospital in a very simple way that we didn't use our own light source, but we just used uh, the standard operation lamp. And uh, all, all that should be done was uh, to connect camera mm, to this lamp, uh, to attach a green filter, gr a green bandpass filter to the camera to detect only a green light, which is most informative. And uh, so this device was installed and it's still used uh, in the Riga Hospital of Traumatology and Orthopedics and doctors are really very happy about that so they, they can always follow what's, what's happening with anesthetic uh, efficiency of their patients. So to summarize uh, so a family of camera-based prototype devices for non-contact optical, assess optical assessment of in vivo scan, skin has been designed, assembled and clinically tested. So one was multimodal imaging, concept device, skimager, and three smartphone-based devices with spectrally specific illumination units uh, for spectral line imaging device for skin chromophore mapping. A uh, multispectral and thermal imaging device for early sepsis diagnostics, a uh, multispectral fluorescence imaging device for skin melanoma screening, and photoplasmography imaging devices for remote monitoring of anesthesia efficiency during surgeries. Uh, so, all those are experimental mm, prototype devices, and uh, we really I welcome industrial partners to join for technology transfer and for further commercialization of uh, devices, at least maybe a few of them. But uh, there is a bottleneck why so far we are not very successful with commercial implementation, that uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it should be a medical device, and the medical devices have uh, strong regulations and there are hundreds of clinical measurements needed to collect sufficient statistics for permission to use uh, the devices as routine medical tools for in hospitals or clinics or family doctors' offices, and uh, and this part looks uh, too expensive so far, and so the current state of our devices so far is uh, we we can call them experimental demo devices, but all of them can be. Uh, further developed into mm, uh, routinely used uh, clinical devices. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Anna, for an amazing overview of your products and hope that uh, all of them will be commercialized in one or another way. And I just have a quick question. In your opinion, which of these uh, diagnostical or uh, imaging techniques are the most promising to be used uh, worldwide, in your opinion? Uh, so I understand this question about uh, our our several options used, so which, which one of them is uh, uh, more promising? Uh, so I, I would say that um, mm. uh, all of them have some specific uh, uh, promising features. Uh, so maybe for practical implementation, as I said, uh, uh, this device for melanoma screening uh, looks um, mm, very well adapted for clinical uh, mm, for clinical implementation. So as I said, it it has been tested in several countries, 
and uh, gave quite a nice uh, result. So that that could be maybe first in the row, but also other devices. So so could could be could be developed to, uh, for some specific applications. So Perfect. Brief answer. Perfect. Thank you, Yanis. Uh, so now we will have Augustinas Lisbaras, co-founder and CTO of Broly Sensor Technology, a high-tech photonics company that develops cutting-edge integrated sensor technology for industrial, consumer, and health applications. Augustinas, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to this workshop. So I just tried to share my screen. I hope you can see it and uh, let me know if, if it's in presentation mode right now in your screens. Yes, perfect. Okay, so uh, uh, as introduced, I'm from Brolis. Uh, Brolis Sensor Technology, which is now a recent branch of the original Brolis Semiconductor. And today I'll talk about uh, the gallium antimonide based photonic microsensors for industrial and biomedical applications. So I'll try to uh, highlight uh, some of the I would say recent or the last couple of years of technology developments within our company and where we are heading. Uh, so just to uh, wrap up who we are. So we are now a, a company that uh, has uh, 10 years of operation behind it. So we started as Broly Semiconductor, a spin-off in 2011. Uh, and since then we've uh, gone through, a, I would say, a winding road path, uh, which nevertheless was successful. So from a startup, Greenfield startup uh, in semiconductor technology and VC funded uh, company, we became an independent, uh, I would say, uh, long-term investor and uh, founder-owned uh, company uh, in 2017. Uh, and uh, when we started, we were uh, as a, co a component company, we, we kind of envisioned ourselves as a component supplier. However, this has changed and today we are a complete uh, product solution supplier. So that means we develop everything in-house from a semiconductor wafer component, then we integrate the component and build up the final system. So one of the first uh, application verticals or markets was uh, defense and security market, which we entered in 2015. And today it's uh, now an independent business, which we span out uh, recently, which is uh, profitable for the last five years. And uh, we generate uh, around 10 to 12 million euros every day every year there. And the goal is to, to do the same uh, with uh, uh, other market verticals where we see potential for our uh, semiconductor laser and photonic uh, technology platform that I will try to describe to you uh, in these slides. So we are in total four companies under two separate groups. So we are located in across three different uh, European locations, so UK, Lithuania, and Belgium. So our defense activities are in, in Vilnius and in Lan, Northern Ireland, and uh, our non-defense, so generic uh, uh, microsensor technology uh, activities is, uh, is split between our uh, Vilnius uh, headquarter office and our uh, silicon photonics and uh, R&D office in Ghent in Belgium. So all in all, we're about 65 people or so across the two companies. Uh, and uh, since... Uh, Today I'll talk, focus more on the non-defense side of the, of, the, of the activities. So I'll, I'll highlight what we do in our two offices in Vilnius and in Ghent. So this basically we, we uh, combine the full uh, technology vertical. So that means we, we start from the material synthesis, which we do in-house by uh, industrial MB technology, so which is Epitex. We focus on gallium and terminide. I'll tell a little bit more why. Uh, we have a complete, uh, fully automated back-end line. We have data science teams. We have application validation teams to enable us to build a product. And also on the GAN side, uh, we have a team that focuses on the so-called silicon photonics, which is a, uh, I would say a very advanced technology that allows us to utilize the CMOS platform to build uh, photonic integrated circuits for ultimate fo uh, footprint and form factor uh, photonic systems. And we have an, a, a front-end R&D office there. And uh, the generic focus of the company, so we are not a medical company, we're not a, a single product company, we are actually a generic uh, photonic sensor technology platform company, and we target different products which share, uh, I would say, the same photonic engine inside for different uh, markets, such as uh, industrial, agriculture, consumer, and medical, or biomedical, if you like. 
So just a little bit of what we have in house. I'll just run through it. So we're kind of uh, fully equipped to, to to deliver everything from uh, from the wafer to to the product. And with the recent COVID outbreak, uh, we are even further focusing more to have everything in house to enable full control and maximum flexibility of of the technology. So here you see some highlights of our rapid taxi and the back end. We have uh, testing front end. Uh, and then uh, what we develop as a technologist, I show this IP portfolio, but I think the, the, the main uh, message here is really the, the layers of technology that we develop inside the company. So from growth, chip design architecture, sensor architecture, algorithms and data, and then the, the integration technology of all of the hardware combined, which is not trivial, by the way. Uh, why Gallium and Timonite, and uh, why do we focus where we focus? So here you see just a slide which illustrates uh, if you like a spectrum uh, ranging from you know, roughly visible all the way to three microns and beyond and uh, in the semiconductor world this spectrum is covered by different uh, material platforms so to see so whenever we, we have something red or uh, very much near infrared so this is all governed by gallium arsenide technology the most mature semiconductor technology of uh, direct band gap uh, semiconductors uh, then we have the Datacom Telecom window between 1 and 1.5 micron. There we have indium phosphide, and indium phosphide is already interesting for sensing, at least the direct uh, molecular sensing, because of the mature hardware, and it's, it's been around for many decades now. Uh, and also we have uh, an existing, let's say, fairly high volume market of Datacom there, so, so the availability of components is there. However, the issue is there that we can only access the first overtone band, so while we have, let's say, uh, good characteristics for applications, such as good skin penetration, the molecular specificity is, is very low and the absorption is quite weak. And therefore, let's say the, the actual application space and the real sensing products that would be, let's say, integrated and uh, scaled uh, at a high level is fairly low. So in kind of, so, so basically the physics are not, Fully sufficient. If we go to the extreme long wavelengths, then we have access to the fundamental absorption bands, which provide us the you know the, as high specificity as physics can offer. We have very strong absorption. However, we have hardware issues such as you know we have poor skin penetration, just fundamentally due to water absorption and other uh, protein scattering uh, hardware. Uh, let's say is undeveloped and is very expensive, and room temperature detection technology is just. Uh, challenging by itself because we're at a very small uh, food and energy uh, uh, levels there. And Brawlers comes uh, right in between. So we are uh, the so-called combination band, which actually covers from roughly 1.5 to 2.5 uh, very efficiently. I think the sweet spot is between 1.7 to 2.5. Uh, here, here we have still sufficient skin penetration. We already have much higher specificity compared to the first overtone band, and we have also much stronger absorption. And uh, I mean, I think the, well, one of the main uh, probably advantages is really high specificity because we already have access to the combination absorption band. So it's not just the overtone, but it's also a combination of stretch and band absorption uh, uh, bands there. Uh, and uh, we're talking about small molecule detections wherever we have a CH, OH, NH, and, and other types of vibrations. And this is a direct sensing method. So that means I'm sensing directly uh, the molecule vibration, and that offers a very nice opportunity for remote sensing scenario. And what we also showed uh, with Brawl is that, well, first of all, we, we, we built components that were non-existing at this market. So this is kind of an undeveloped spectral region. And we also demonstrated that this uh, window is uh, SOI compatible. So SOI stands for the world where the silicon and insulator. So that means that we can use uh, mature uh, silicon technology to develop ultra compact uh, integrated sensor uh, solutions. And I will show more about that in the next slide. So what can we sense? The different molecules, uh, different fluids, gas, uh, I will focus mostly on fluids just because our main uh, spectral engine is, is a widely tunable or as we call a swept wavelength laser. So this gives us access to hundreds of nanometers of, of, of laser bandwidth, which we can tune across. And uh, this gives us uh, just by nature a possibility to, to, to really decouple 
complex uh, molecules from very complex matrices, be it you know an industrial fluid, a biological substance such as milk, it can be blood, it can be plasma, and so on and so forth. So here you see uh, a plot of what uh, about uh, five or six uh, different molecules, and in our wavelength region they are already very specific. So that means. Uh, every molecule has its own uh, fingerprint, which can be decoupled from the complex matrix. So, however, the challenge here is, of course, if it's a liquid phase uh, solution, that means that my spectra are very broad due to collisional broadening, and I need somehow to, to have access to this uh, very broad, broad spectral region and uh, to distinguish the individual features. So how we do that? Uh, so in our, our approach is to First of all, to have the maximum power density per nanometer so that I could have basically ultimate signal to noise ratio and then somehow scale that across the bandwidth. And uh, so we said, okay, I mean, having, I mean, I, I would either use then uh, several hundreds of lasers to basically have a sensor in across 300 nanometers or I can have one, but I need to sweep it very widely. And so we developed uh, the so called gain chip technology, which we embed in an external cavity. And so then we can tune across uh, the full bandwidth, as we see on the bottom right. Uh, just uh, this is an artificial uh, image of how that happens. So I have a very narrow line uh, laser, which is swept rapidly across uh, the entire bandwidth, which is uh, provided by one or more or more gain chips. Uh, so our uh, backbone of the hardware technology is, in fact, uh, can be split in three layers. Uh, is of course the the transmitter, the receiver, and then uh, the the control and filtering uh, uh, technology hardware. So the laser, uh, what we've developed uh, over the last ten years, uh, last decade, right? Uh, so we demonstrated that with a single gallium antimony chip, we can have uh, over 400 of nanometers of laser bandwidth, an output power of 50 milliwatts if it's uh, constructed as a, a small handheld uh, uh, discrete uh, component-based external cavity laser, and we demonstrated this performance across the entire 1850 to, to almost 2.5 micron band. So this is an excellent, uh, I would say, spectral engine to start working with and testing uh, different applications where this technology can be used. One of the challenges was that uh, no uh, low-cost uh, room temperature photodetector component existed. And while in the beginning, if you thought that we can use some of the extended in-gas technology from Hamamatsu and the likes, unfortunately, that turned out to be a low-yield technology, which is very difficult to scale in terms of cost per chip. So we were uh, kind of forced uh, to de develop that uh, in-house ourselves, which is at the same time in line with the hardware know-how and the technology infrastructure that we have. And today, we also have a very robust uh, bulk-based high-yield, high-volume uh, photo detector technology also developed in house based on the same lattice matched uh, gallium antimonide platform. I will have some more insights into that. So, this is uh, a receiver part. And over the last uh, several years, we also developed and demonstrated uh, that, uh, as I mentioned before, a conventional uh, telecom silicon photonic integrated circuit platform works quite well with type 1 gallium antimonide. So, we can definitely design uh, systems around it. And we demonstrated uh, laser operation from 1.9 to also almost 2.4 microns on silicon with gallium antimonide embedded in silicon with fairly good performance. So I will also show a bit more in the coming slides. But uh, just to highlight, these are the main building blocks of whatever spectral uh, spectroscopic sensor that we need. So now just a little bit about the photo detector technology. So this is not just a proof of concept technology, but today this is already a reliable high volume technology. So here you see a, uh, an example of a three inch uh, sized uh, full wafer process of a photodiode array, which consists of about uh, nearly 10,000 of, of devices. Uh, and we see 81% uh, array yield. Which so for array yield means that uh, if a single pixel in an array does not work, that is, this means this is a non-working array. So the, the yield on the single pixels uh, is, is much much higher. So it's ninety-five percent plus. Uh, we have uh, reasonably low dark currents. Our NEP is in the picowatts. We have a low D star of ten to the ten, 
and uh, cutoff wavelength at uh, 2.6 microns uh, on cooled room temperature with a very nice responsivity of around 1 m per watt. And here you see just a, a scalar map of the dark current across the wafer. So you see it's pretty uniform and the same as the, the, the histogram. So basically really uh, indicates a, a reliable technology. And this is something that is very difficult to find with alternative technologies at these wavelengths. So just to demonstrate uh, the, the maturity and the, the readability of the component technology for the system. And uh, yeah, this is of course uh, just that I mean, the semiconductor technology is very parallel, right? So everything is, is produced in, in parallel. And so we can scale to, 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 to high numbers uh, and high yields in a single process just by the nature of semiconductor technology. So of, of course, all of the processes that we do in-house has to be automated and, and, and run by robots instead of single measurements. But uh, key. And uh, moving now on to the laser side, so I'm demonstrating you a channel of gallium antimony integrated on silicon. Uh, so we have a hybrid laser, as we call it. So, so the gain, the optical gain, comes from a gallium antimony gain chip or semiconductor optical amplifier, which is embedded in silicon. And the external cavity is uh, defined uh, uh, by means of, let's see, standard uh, photonic integrated circuit technology, which is done in a CMOS fab. Uh, where we basically use a vernier type of, of laser tuning. Um, so we can uh, then have a single mode laser sweep across currently our channel design is about 120 to 130 nanometers. And you see a very nice uh, side mode suppression ratio, which is about 35 dB or more. The output power of this uh, hybrid chip it depends a little bit on the on the drive current. Uh, so for most applications which require low power consumption, such as wearable platform, we're talking about probably 100 to 300 uh, microwatts CW. Uh, however, our highest output powers that we achieved of silicon were in the range of up to 3 milliwatts CW with a threshold of 50 milliamps and power consumption of 300 milliwatts. So this is uh, really, I would say, uh, absolute state-of-the-art performance. So the first laser we demonstrated Globally, it was end of 2016 that this type of room temperature performance is possible. And I think now at Brolis, over the last years, we're just pushing it to a, to a, to a new level. Uh, the speed at which we can tune the light, so just again to highlight, everything is done on a monolithic hybrid uh, integrated circuit chip. Uh, so no moving parts, all electrical control, so we can uh, sweep uh, uh, the, the, the channel whether, uh, let's say, in this case, uh, if I have a channel of 120 nanometers and uh, my resolution is 0.8 nanometers, I can do that in three milliseconds. If I need twice the resolution, it will take me six milliseconds. But uh, so for most sensing applications, we have a, a ultra uh, compact uh, integrated circuits, an old semiconductor based platform that can operate in this from hundreds to up to kilohertz uh, range uh, with all electric control. So this is. Uh, a very, very nice feature. Uh, you see uh, below just how, how good the side mode suppression ratio is. And uh, then what is our typical sensor? How does it look like? So our current uh, sensor, which we call BRL02, so this is our second iteration of the integrated circuit, looks like this. So the blue block is the silicon chip where we have uh, all the integrated photonic integrated circuits realized. So that means I have four channels, so I have four uh, external cavities uh, realized inside. I have wavelength locking uh, architecture, I have wavelength tracking architecture there. And uh, then I embed four different uh, gallium antimony gain chips centered each at a different uh, spectrum position. And then all of this is combined to provide an output of these four channels. So with, with such a concept, I can then have a spectrometer, laser spectrometer on chip that provides up to 500 nanometers of laser bandwidth uh, of chip. And then uh, depends. Okay, okay, I'll move on. So this is how it looks in real life. And then if I show some pictures, so this is the integrated chip. That's how it looks compared to one cent euro cent. And if you zoom in there, you see the four channels, you see the silicon chip, you see the photodiodes in there. So this is the technology that we do. I'll run through this. What are we doing with this? We're running different uh, molecules for different applications. And uh, here, just to highlight, so something that's been running for at Brolis for, for several years now, transdermal sensing applications. So currently we're building a 
blood ethanol sensor. So we, at the moment, we are at about uh, close to one per mil uh, detection limit uh, over the, with a fairly long, uh, uh, basically, uh, kind of uh, stable detection across a long period of time, which is not trivial and very challenging. And then we have other applications that are now approaching market uh, related to industrial applications. And our first product is to be launched uh, by end of this year in the agriculture sector where such a sensor will be deployed for uh, substantially high volume applications in uh, agriculture. So then I'll just run through this. Uh, yeah, this is how other sensors look like, what we develop. And of course, ultimately, in probably like three years from now, we anticipate that such a sensor will be integrated into a wearable platform for different applications that do not exist today. So thank you for your attention. And with this, I'd like to, to finish. Thank you very much, Augustinos, for your presentation. Um, and I want to uh, ask you also a question. Uh, it was mentioned that your uh, sensor already works with glucose, lactate, ethanol, um, what are the future possibilities for, for your sensors also to be uh, applied? Uh, I, would, I would not say that it works with electricity and glucose. So this is, these are the molecules that we are looking at and we are developing uh, potential products on these molecules. But at the moment, uh, it's not yet uh, at the stage where this would be a commercial product. I think uh, I would say, okay, glucose is the, the most uh, I would say widely known molecule. However, uh, just I think we have the same issue or similar issue as the, the talk from Jan Spiegel is before. It's a very complex molecule to commercialize due to the, let's say, PMA FDA requirements and uh, extremely strict clinical trials and a very long uh, period of time to carry them out, as well as, uh, let's say, uh, the funds needed to be. So I, in my understanding, this is only medical companies can do that. So Brolis alone is definitely not doing uh, glucose all the way to the market. However, molecules such as lactate, ethanol, and other molecules that are relevant for the industrial sector, we are pushing all the way to the end product. And as I mentioned briefly, because time was running out, our first product that will be monitoring, uh, I believe, three or four different molecules uh, real time in vitro, in line, uh, in fluid in the agricultural sector will be uh, launched uh, by end of this year. So this will be our first commercial product on the sensor side after 10 years of development that uh, we anticipate uh, to enter the market and uh, other products will follow. So I would see on the side for us, in my opinion, we are in, in the exciting phase that finally uh, such deep tech that I presented is converging towards real market applications. So, yeah, yeah, yeah that, 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 that's the most amazing thing uh, when you can go from the deep tech more into uh, applicable more. Yes. Yeah. So thank you, Augustina, for your presentation. Also, I would like to say thank you to all the presenters and the participants that were very active in the first stage of the Baltic Photonics 2021 MedLife. And I would like uh, all of us to uh, a little bit take a rest, uh, to go for a lunch break, and we will continue with the program uh, 20 past uh, 1. Uh, if you are in Eastern European time and 20 past 12, if you are more from the Central European Europe. So see you after the break.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back from the lunch break. We will continue now uh, with the second part of both Photonics 2021 MedLife with the Photonics for Medical Applications. Peptosecond lasers have become one of the main uh, go-to tools in ultra-precise micro and nano-manufacturing. Chief Scientific Officer at Femtika Elena Sjomschowska will present capabilities and flexibilities of femtosecond laser medical uh, made medical 3D microstructures. So, Linus, the floor is yours. So, thank you very much for a kind introduction. It's a great honor and pleasure to present in this event. And as presented, I will be talking about how lasers can actually be enablers in various medical applications. So, first, uh, maybe a few quick words about the company. So Femtica is a spin-off from Vilnius University. We come to existence basically eight years ago with primary operations starting uh, around five years ago, six to five years ago, with first system being constructed around the same time. We're based in Sunrise Valley, Vilnius. We have around 40 employees, out of which multiple are PhDs or PhD students. Uh, I, for instance, am also an associate uh, professor of partnership in Vilnius University. So we have very tight connections to the academic uh, environment in Lithuania as well. As a result, we're very active in the research scene with various R&D projects funded by European Union or Lithuania. And we are also active in various communities such as Lithuanian Laser Association, EPIC, Tulas, and others. So the primary question is what we do and what is the added value that we bring to the market? So the primary idea behind what we do is that with the laser, you can do a lot of different machining techniques, so laser lithography, selective etching, ablation, inscribing, you name it. And for a very long time, it was considered that if you want to do some of these operations, you need a purpose-built machine just for that operation which meant that if you want to have all of them, you need multiple machines, and this results in a lot of issues regarding maintenance, software training, floor space, etc. But due to very high level of femtosecond laser development in the world, and especially in Lithuania, novel femtosecond lasers actually allow to achieve all of these relevant processing regimes with one laser, which then can be condensed to one uh, laser workstation, which basically means that we have universal tool that uh, allows to employ multiple different techniques. And these techniques, just to name, uh, name primary ones that will be relevant for this presentation, are cold processing or ablation. And without going into too much details, the idea here is that with femtosecond pulses, you can induce light matter interaction regimes virtually faster than heat dissipation from the affected area. So therefore, if you cut something, uh, the cuts are extremely clean. Also, methodology is extremely simple. It's very fast, and it's applicable to basically all materials imaginable, starting with something very soft like polymers, live tissue, ending with tungsten, uh, ceramics, and similar. Now, this is more of a two and a half D fabrication technology, but what if we want something more of a 3D. Where in that we have selective glass etching and the idea here is that instead of removing material with the laser we actually induce very specific modification in the volume of glasses or uh, or crystals. In our case it's mostly a few silica and then that modification etches out substantially faster than the rest of the material after it is placed in an etching solution which is something like KOH, HF, or something similar. And then we basically have what, what I can describe as almost an inverted 3D printing, where what you expose, uh, you remove. And this allows us to get true 3D shapes with relatively high surface quality. Fabrication is also relatively fast, and we can easily do relatively large structures. For instance, the ball joint you see on bottom right uh, is one of the examples of complex geometry, where basically we have a ball uh, enveloped in kind of a sleeve structure. And what I have to stress that this structure is made assembly free. In other words, it started its life as a single piece of glass, and then we just exposed areas that were needed for motion, 
we edged them out and we got something moving which was never assembled. Then, if we talk about additive manufacturing, of course, we work with two photon polymerization. And this technique is based around the idea that you focus on the second laser to a gel, uh, which can be a uh, very wide array of different materials, such as power and pol proteins, hydrogels, acrylates, silicon elastomers, hybrid organic and organic materials, and similar. And then, only the laser focal point, the irreversible chemical reactions are induced that basically harden the material. And then we inscribe what we need, we we'll put it into organic solvent, and we end up with polymeric 3D structure. And the advantages of, the, of this particular technique is that it has basically unlimited 3D geometry. It also can allow very high spatial resolution, basically down to 100 nanometers or even less. And it's actually very flexible and easy to tune for a specific application, as we will see throughout this presentation. And basically, in Femtica, we worked a uh, quite long time to make various uh, structures that do serve some purpose, if that purpose is just a demonstration in these cases. And as you can see, we showed that if we need, we can rely on multiple technologies to do basically a very similar thing. And then we choose technology according to price uh, requirements, to material requirements, and etc. So basically, we try to make our production pipeline and value proposition as flexible as possible. But of course, all of these are just nice demonstrations, and the ultimate question is where, well, why it's needed and how to make it. So talking about how to make it, we created this laser nanofactory setup that basically uh, was capable of doing all of the examples I showed so far. And it has a lot of features and it's basically a state-of-the-art system that we're currently selling quite actively to international market. In fact, we will be delivering up to five systems uh, by the end of this year alone, showing that there is interest and uh, place of this setup. It's also very flexible, it's tunable, and it's future-proof in the sense that it's made in a modular fashion. So if we as company create new modules, new ways of processing material, we can upgrade old, older systems, making them up to date as much as possible. The operation of Femtica also covers basically the whole uh, value chain, starting with the research. Someone can just come to us and say, look, we have this idea. Can you make it happen? Then we would we develop it to, to the point where, it's, where it is a uh, standardized procedure that can be repeated multiple times with maximum repeatability. And then we can either do batch production in our facilities or we can sell the whole technology system and et cetera. And I have to stress that our customers actually came at any of these three steps because some of them actually need research. Some of them has uh, a general idea of what they want to do. They just need a tool, and we try to be flexible, as flexible as possible. But this is more for general technology and what we generally do. But of course, we wanted to concentrate to some areas that would actually bring the most uh, value to the whole area and maybe even society as, as general. And that is medicine. And when we look to the modern medicine, the field is actually extremely active. And at the same time, it has very, I would dare to say, contradictory requirements somehow. Basically, uh, we are going toward individualized medicine, which is delivered at point of care. It has to be effective, flexible, but at the same time, it means that it has to be affordable. <clears throat> Sorry. And while medics and the various medical engineers have a lot of ideas what can be done, at the end of the day, we need to manufacture these things. And this is where we came, because with our flexibility and our technologies, we can basically make a lot of things that uh, various medical people or medical engineers can imagine. And I have to stress that everything that will be presented from this point on is done with various academic institution, the institutions that actually deal in the medical or related fields. So to give some examples of what we do, I will just give several quick examples. So first one is macromolecule separator. And the idea here is very simple. We just have a micropolitical system. We integrate 
some very precise elements to separate molecules. These could be filters or something else. And then basically we seal it off. And the, what we bring to the table is the fact that we can do channels very fast with the laser, but and then with polymerization, we can integrate these very precise elements. And basically application of this could be drug development and drug production in a passive manner. So this is kind of the zoomed in version of the device, actually one of the intersections before it is sealed. And basically the idea is that we integrate, uh, we fabricate the channel using a novel femtosecond burst technology at quite large translation velocity. We then integrate filter using polymerization. So basically we have a glass channel, which gives it it's also a rigidity. And at the same time, we integrate polymeric filter, which gives precision needed for such a fine application. And then we bond it with some other technique like thermal bonding, laser welding, etc. And basically thermal bonding is a technique again, designed to make this as cheap as possible because we're aiming to this device to be basically uh, almost a single-use device in some cases. And the idea is basically that we take the take what was fabricated with the laser and to save on laser time, we just put special clear plastic uh, cover and then we heat it up. And because we use special polymer, uh, polymer filter is not affected, but the channel is sealed. And basically, the channels are being tested. These devices are being tested right now, and initial results show quite good results. But uh, for final conclusions, we still need to wait a bit. And this is done in cooperation with Vitotas Magnus University. Next area is uh, scaffolds for cell growth, and especially uh, mechanically flexible scaffolds designed for flexible tissues because most of the materials that we process are actually hard and uh, for a uh, scaffold to be uh, capable of implanted in a soft tissue, it has to move somehow. So you have two choices. You can either uh, print out of newly developed soft materials, which takes time and immense investment in the material development, or you can just use our standard hard material and then display with geometry, which you can very easily do. And as a result, we basically looked into the past and our question was, what flexible uh, was ever done out of hard material? And of course, the, the answer that comes to mind is a chain mail. And basically, we fabricated the structure. Again, it is assembly-free, so basically all of these rings are fabricated uh, at once, so to say. And it, go it shows good mechanical stability. We can print relatively big structure, and basically, as our partners in Lutheran and Health, Healthcare University said, these can be easily moved from petri dish to petri dish with cells on them because we also tested biocompatibility, which proves to be very good. And uh, basically, this could be used to regenerate or fix some uh, either soft tissue, or this can also be used as a shape shifting scaffold that be then placed in a regularly shaped wound or disease-affected area. So uh, the final device that I would like to present, which was developed in cooperation with Kona Technology University, is basically electromechanical flow meter. And the idea with this device is that when we deal with drug, uh, uh, drug delivery to very sensitive beings like to like small children or let's say some uh, sports uh, horses and etc they are extremely sensitive to amount of drugs that are being delivered at any given point and of course there are measurement devices present in the market but most of them are actually uh, sitting somewhere uh, quite far away from the patient and when patient is moving irregularly and maybe it, it, it presses on the tube it's actually very hard to immediately see the difference. So our idea was to create a device that could be basically installed in the needle, which is delivering the drug. So basically the last point of delivery, basically going uh, almost towards a smart needle concept. And the concept for us is that we produce polymeric half valve, half condenser. And this can actually act as a condenser because we can modify polymer to be selectively metal coat 
basically only the polymer will be metal coated and nothing else. And then when this moves in the liquid, we basically can see changes in the capacitance. And then third, we can monitor the flow. So basically we did initial testing. We saw that even very thin metal coating is sufficient enough to see a uh, sufficient signal. And we also integrated it into a glass uh, body, which then could be placed in, let's say, a needle. And I have to stress that during metal coating process, because it's uh, chemical and tuned towards the polymer, uh, the uh, glass is not coated. So basically, this is an isolated device, and then you put it to very standard electronics, and then you can measure. So with that in mind, I see that my time is almost up, and uh, the conclusions are very simple. We see direct ray laser writing as a powerful tool in biomedical fabrication with huge tenability in terms of feature size, overall size, material selection, and geometry. It's basically name it. And I have to stress that this is not some curiosity which is done in some obscure lab somewhere. This is a, these are the solutions that are readily available in the market and gaining more and more traction. And we are always very interested in talking with experts from various fields, including biomedical and not only. And if someone has an idea that we should make something and it will change the world, we are always up to that. And with that, I would like to thank you. And I think I'm open for questions. Thank you, Linus. Thank you, Linus, for an amazing presentation of Tempica. Um, I have a question. Have you already an experience installing your developments into the commercial biomedical applications? So far, our primary installations were in other academic institutions because we started to penetrate this field not that long ago, at least in medical development uh, timeframes, around one to two years ago. So at the moment, we're mostly in low technology readiness level with a lot of these concepts, but we're pushing towards that. And we have some commercial sales of the structures towards these uh, applications, but not uh, system or technology sales. But we have some commercial interest and we're working towards that. Great, great. And as an expert, what do you think? Uh, what kind of micro nano fabrication uh, capabilities are not used enough uh, right now in the medical field and it is uh, just um, not reached the full potential in using it but it will be in the future so basically the thing is that uh, as a ex expert in material processing i know about a lot of other techniques that are older especially related to lithography or layer by layer fabrication and these are used the most and it actually pains me a bit because they inherently are square and when you look to the human body, how many squares can you see? And the most underutilized thing, in my personal opinion, is the fact that not it, the true 3D fabrication capabilities brought up by technologies that we bring to the table, and to some extent, some other 3D printing technologies can also maybe provide in a conjunction with what we do, uh, are heavily underutilized. And I have to be... Uh, hopeful in the sense that when we talk with medical professionals, they see what we offer and they immediately take these squared structures and turn them into something in the sketches for something that would mimic human body a lot better with irregular shape, boronoid shape, gyro, uh, gyro shapes. And we're like, yeah, sure, we can easily print it. So I think this is the most underutilized part of current manufacturing techniques is the fact that true nature mimicking 3D structures cannot really be easily produced with the old technologies, but they are still the most mostly prevalent. Okay, thank you, Linus. Uh, thank you for your answer. Thank you for your presentation. Now we'll continue thank with the pleasure. now we'll continue with the photonic sensor for real life monitoring of uh, hydrogen peroxide vapor the con the uh, contamination process during the age of multi-resistant bacteria and fast printing viruses, the contamination of any room, but especially medical rooms, needs special focus. LDI Innovation develops fluorescence-based photonic sensor and solutions. Their product manager, Otter Bane, will present photonic sensors development for online monitoring of hydrogen peroxide vapor decontamination procedures. Ot? Thank you. 
Uh, I'm glad to be in this photonics, Baltic Photonics 2021 event. Uh, and uh, in this talk, I represent, as you already told, the Estonian company LDI Innovation, which manufactures uh, fluorescence-based photonic sensors and different applications based on these, such as spectral fluorometers, uh, leaf lighters, uh, fluorometers, etc. But here we talk about the very, uh, I'm going to present a very uh, specific application, which is the real time monitoring of uh, hydrogen peroxide vapor decontamination procedures. This uh, niche application is also applicable in the field of life sciences and med life. And so it could be of interest to you. Uh, the, shortly, the outline of the talk, uh, I will introduce this very specific application uh, and then I'll show you how the sample experiment looks like and we, we will try to motivate uh, the need for this uh, specific sensor. Then the sensor construction and uh, experimental results will be shown with uh, some conclusive remarks. Uh, here in these pictures, you can, you can see a few iterations of this so-called H2B spectral detector, as well as our spectral fluorometer. Uh, so first of all, what is this niche application? Uh, suppose there is an outbreak of some multi-resistant bacteria in some hospital room, or more relevant today, uh, there has been just a very high level of virus in some public room. So then a very thorough and effective way to make these rooms safe again for the public is to use uh, hydrogen peroxide vapor machines, such as are depicted uh, here from our Finnish partners which we have used in these experiments. Now, this is uh, just an example of this uh, experiment. Uh, uh, here we tested a small meeting room in the corner of a larger office. And uh, so during this decontamination procedure, all air ducts to the room are sealed off. And then the air is circulated by a large fan. Uh, but there will, also, there will always be some regions where the airflow is not as good or the decontamination procedure will not be as effective. So this is where our sensor comes in and uh, we are the ones who could measure the effectiveness of this decontamination procedure in real time. Uh, so and the innovation manufactures photonic sensors which can find pathogens on various surfaces as well as monitor the death of these pathogens. But uh, here, typically, small spore covered metal discs are placed into various areas of the decontaminated room. So, uh, if these spores will grow, in a growth solution one to seven days after the decontamination procedure, then typically the, uh, the users of the vaporized hydrogen peroxide device can be sure that the procedure was successful. But our device uh, uses these same spores as a functional material and measures their fluorescence properties in real time making it much easier to immediately uh, get a gauge on uh, how effective the decontamination procedure is and if we need to reduce the time for vaporized hydrogen peroxide or increase the time and we will get instant uh, feedback. Uh, in our uh, experiment, uh, we had a very small enclosure, this one cubic meter box shown here in this slide. And uh, we used quite a high 
concentrations of, of vaporized hydrogen peroxide to, to check how well our sensor really works. We, our HEB sensor has, it was equipped with live spores inside of this box during this monitoring experiment. Uh, as uh, we, we use the industry standard uh, uh, bacterial spores in our device development. Uh, these are uh, either Geobacillus terothermophilus or Bacillus atrophos. And typically these spores are the, the last microorganism to die when exposed to hydrogen peroxide vapor. So we can be entirely certain that everything else, viruses, uh, bacteria, fungi, everything else that was in this room is dead if these spores are dead. So that's why we, we use them in our experiment. Uh, the basic, basic principle of operation is depicted here. So what do we actually measure? Here are two fluorescent spectra of the spores uh, before and after the decontamination procedures. The colors show the relative spectral intensities, while the x-axis represents the fluorescence emission wavelength and y-axis the fluorescent excitation wavelength. It turns out that uh, immediately when the hydrogen peroxide vapor comes into contact with the spores, their fluorescence signal falls dramatically, as well as it shifts spectrally towards shorter wavelengths. So this uh, fall off is very dependent on concentration and time. So we can use this uh, signal to estimate cell death over time quite easily. Uh, se sensor construction itself is quite simple. We have uh, multiple well-separated LED wavelengths that excite the, the, the spores and there is a single photon counting detector behind the switchable uh, high-grade fluorescence filter. Uh, the device f works fully wirelessly, uh, transmitting the results over Wi-Fi uh, while operating on battery for a full work day without the need for change of batteries. We do need to change the spore samples between uh, decontaminating one room or, or the other. Uh, if we look at the, what, how the raw data looks like, the raw data coming out of this device is very repeatable. And uh, here in the start, you can see how the, uh, spec, how the fluorescence signal falls off immediately after we place the sensor inside the uh, the contaminated room with hydrogen peroxide vapor. And as soon as we take it out at different time points here, uh, the signal rises again, but not to the same level as it was before and not uh, spectrally to the same position. Uh, so a few comments, a few more comments uh, about how this uh, what we think uh, happens during this uh, procedure scientifically. Uh, first of all, if uh, hydrogen peroxide comes into contact with, uh, with spores or any other cells, there is a short term dynamic effect of this uh, hydrogen peroxide, the ox oxygen part of this, and there is uh, strong fluorescence quenching happening. Then uh, when the signal has fallen to a relatively low level, it, uh, the speed of the fall off seems to reduce and there is uh, 
oxidation of the DNA and the cell walls and everything like that uh, is going on. And when we let the gas out or put the catalyzer inside the room that catalyzes the hydrogen peroxide back to uh, oxygen and water, then uh, we see that the long-term static effect has occurred and uh, the signal has fallen. The, the spores are dead and uh, we can be sure that the procedure has been effective. Uh, we have measured only without the real-time measurements also, but uh, uh, the difference between the initial state and the exit state is uh, in this case quite a lot uh, smaller and we found that the real-time approach is much better. And uh, our newest sensors all use uh, this type of uh, approach. Uh, here you can see just a few graphs at different uh, vaporized hydrogen peroxide concentrations uh, because there is a very strong uh, time concentration dependence for the vaporized uh, hydrogen peroxide to act. So if it's just a few tens of parts per million in the room, uh, the procedure can take hours and hours and it's uh, not uh, linear to the concentration so if you have a few hundred parts per meter, then the decontamination takes just uh, minutes or at least tens of minutes, depending on the concentration. So our sensor needs to take this uh, effect into account. Um, here, the, you can see in this higher plot that uh, the dependence of uh, the relative fluorescence signal on the vaporized hydrogen peroxide concentration is exponential in its nature and it's most sensitive uh, when the concentration is actually lowest. So this is, this is the part which needs to be monitored more thoroughly because this is... Uh, not as effective as if it's 300 or 400 parts per million, the effect is pretty similar and uh, we just had a few minutes more, but if, uh, uh, if the effect, if the concentration is 20 or 100 parts per million, then the uh, hydrogen peroxide oxide's effect is really much, much lower and it's this needs to be taken into account. Uh, here is uh, just a few calculations that we will use in our device uh, based on uh, some scientific literature that is uh, referenced here. But I see that my time is almost up. Uh, so, to conclude, uh, we have created a very niche application photonic sensor which can be used to uh, monitor uh, decontamination, very highly efficient decontamination process in real time, uh, supposedly in medical or, or life science settings. So this, uh, in effect, would save uh, time and money for, for, the, for the organization using it. And uh, another conclusion is that modern LED light sources and detectors enable this device to be smaller and smaller as so developments do continue. Um, and that's about it. Thank you. Thank you all for, for your presentation.
Um, I have a question. Uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, all we heard about that we need to have disinfection, that there are a lot of uh, viruses, bacteria, bacteria that we need to some kind of disinfect them. And from your perspective, um, does the uh, need for this kind of application for uh, the, the contamination of hydrogen oxide is increased over uh, this uh, last year period, or it uh, didn't affect at all? Uh, our partner in Finland, uh, who manufactures the, these devices, so even maybe too high demand for their device, so it spiked and they couldn't keep up with the manufacturing. So we were, uh, we were testing these, our monitoring devices with them, but then they were swamped with the, the, all, all of the, uh, how do you say, there were just too many orders for their uh, device. So I think it's now better and now you can order these devices again, but uh, the world market for this application was uh, really in very, very high demand in, in the last year because of this ongoing pandemic and uh, the worries that are going with it. Because it's quite certain that if you use this device, then you'll have decontaminated every surface on the, in this room that, that uh, people have been in contact with, so that's why they or ordered from us the development of this sensor. So we, we did it for them and together with them, the, okay. the manufacturers of this uh, paper as a type. And, um, and what do you see the future for the further development of this technology? For the future, we actually are trying to make this device more versatile so that you can, you can use it not only to monitor this vaporized hydrogen peroxide decontamination, but also uh, to just take the device and put it against the surface in, in a hospital room, for example, and it could tell you uh, if it is, if the surface is, to, it is got contaminated, and uh, what the type of contamination it is, roughly. So, how dangerous is it? What is the state state of disinfection? So, we have envisions that uh, the people who who carry out these uh, contaminations they can use it in between uh, like wiping the rooms and check if the work has been done properly or if more work is, is needed. So it will, it will in, be kind of indicator, very, very quick indicator. Maybe um, one. Yeah. yeah, sounds amazing. <laughs> so we'll be looking uh, further for your uh, results presentations, hope, hope in the next event. So thank you all once again for your presentation and for your answers and for thank the you. rest of all. And for the rest of us, um, I would like to say that we just reached another coffee break, which uh, now will be also included with the online networking, which will be held on wonder.me platform. The link for the networking you will find down below in the agenda. And also it was already shared with you uh, in the chat window. So feel free to connect. Uh, to see other your colleagues to find new contact and see you all um, later for the further Baltic Photonics 2021 MedLife program uh, half past 2 p.m. Looking forward to it.
Good afternoon, everyone. So welcome back from coffee break, and let's uh, continue with our uh, next session, which is called Endemic Medical Challenges for Photonics. Uh, I will be moderating it, and I'm Mangarda Smolinowskas, professor at Vilnius University Physics Faculty Laser Research Center. Um, and so we can give time to Karolis Leonavages, a yeah, CTO at Droplet of Genomics, and we already see his titles on our screens. So please, Karolin, take your time. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so thanks a lot for inviting me to this uh, conference. Uh, this is going to be my first time in the uh, talk presenting to the laser audience. So uh, the topics might be unfamiliar, but hopefully everybody finds something interesting and, uh, and useful. So I'll just um, uh, begin with a brief introduction into what we do at the company. Uh, we, we look at uh, different uh, screening options that uh, people use in biological research. And uh, just to give a brief overview, uh, the, the basic options are pipetting manually using micro pipettes. So this is the first, um, uh, the, the first method from the 70s, roughly. Uh, then the, if you want to increase the throughput and uh, increase the chance of discovering something, uh, the next option is uh, using robotics and microplates. So that um, roughly allows you to do 10,000 experiments per day. And the latest and final trend is uh, using droplets as, uh, as reaction vessels, which uh, allows to screen really large libraries uh, spanning around a million of variants um, per single experiment. And what this allows to do is uh, to design new biological entities, uh, which can vary in complexity. So just looking um, into these manual methods um, and then doing hundreds of experiments per day, uh, these were the first uh, sort of uh, technologies available to the researchers, and they are allowed to discover uh, stuff like specialty chemicals, recombinant proteins, and other uh, fairly simple um, biological entities. Uh, moving on to roboticized uh, microplate systems, um, people could screen 10,000 variants per day, and uh, that basically allows to deal with a larger complexity of drugs and, uh, and beginning um, to screen antibodies. And finally, the, the ultimate um, uh, library sizes of a million allow to design complex antibodies and cells themselves. Uh, so as a company, we participate in the, in the latter space, and uh, we do that using our uh, instrument offering, uh, which in a nutshell is a device to screen uh, droplet libraries spanning uh, from 10,000 to roughly 10 million. And what it does is a combination of uh, high speed analysis followed by particle selection methods. And this is typically done at the rates up to a thousand times per second. Uh, so what this means in practice is um, your suspension containing um, variants, uh, cell variants or different protein variants, they are en encapsulated within droplets, which also house a, um, an assay of some sort. And then after some incubation or other kinds of induction, some of those um, droplets will begin to fluoresce. And based on that fluorescence, you can identify which one of those are um, basically the variants that you would like to select. So the other step is the selection itself. And you can see this process within the instrument, um, how, how it looks like in practice. Um, so th there are two cameras uh, on the left hand side, you can see the, the, the process of analysis and, um, and deflection into one of the two uh, wells. And uh, these particles, they eventually end up in um, either positive or negative wells. And just using a pipette, you can, um, you can pipette out a collection of uh, selected droplets containing the variants that, um, that you were screening for. Uh, so there are two technologies that uh, that are used uh, for the identification of the variants that you need, and those are the fluorescence analysis. So that's basically cytometry, and, uh, and there's also an, an opportunity for imaging-based analysis uh, and then classification using AI. So the the former allows to do um, much greater throughputs, uh, reaching 10,000 um, uh, samples per second, well, not samples but events, uh, while the latter only allows to do about 10 events per second. So we strongly prefer the, the, the former, the fluorescence-based analysis, as it allows to screen millions of these droplets in a meaningful amount of time. Uh, so today I'm going to touch upon two topics. Uh, one of them is uh, droplet content identification using fluorescence, so this uh, cytometry-based approach. And I'm also going to briefly introduce uh, some of the methods that we use to analyze droplets themselves, as we, we use those to stabilize instrument operation by uh, monitoring droplet volume, contents, and uh, how fast they're produced. 
So to begin with, uh, the fluorescence analysis for, for droplet content screening, um, the setup is actually quite simple, actually something that an undergraduate might be asked to, to do, but uh, the devil is always uh, in the details. Uh, so for this type of analysis, we use uh, microfluidic chips, and that basically only allows us to use one side uh, for both excitation and detection. So that uh, brings issues with reflections and also other uh, spectral separation problems. Uh, to compound that, we have uh, four independent channels uh, for four for excitation, four for um, um, detection. So it's also a problem of filtering and the spectral separation in addition to about 10 watts of infrared light uh, that is used for um, high-speed camera illumination. Uh, so in, in, and on top of that, we also have the conflicting requirements for imaging and the light collection. So there's, an, there's a conflict of numerical aperture as well as view area as uh, having one of those bigger decreases the other one and finally we have the problems with uncertainty for uh, particle position within the droplet as we have no control on how tightly focused these uh, these particles are within the channel so the the final problem i think is one of the most interesting as um, we spend quite a bit of time of um, trying to improve um, how these particles are excited regardless of their position and the solution actually resembles a barcode scanner uh, so something that projects a light across a, a space so you wouldn't have to align it um, on, a, on a micron uh, tolerance level and um, it, it basically relies on on this light sheet um, to excite uh, particles within a plane and there are two projections here uh, showing how the particles could be distributed across the, the height dimension as well as the uh, width dimension across the channel as these droplets move along the line so the the quality of the analysis then depends on the quality of this line and uh, we, <coughs> we we tried several different approaches on how to form this line um, so that it could be as sharp as possible uh, but also uh, would have a fairly low numerical aperture as eventually we need a, a sheet not a a, a converging um, a line profile so we tried fresno lenses so this uh, cheap pmma molded um, um, beam shaping optics which uh, didn't really give us a good result uh, i think um, it, it was a problem with the collimation and we eventually solved that by moving towards the cylindrical lenses uh, which um, as we believe gave us a sharper profile and then allowed us to resolve the finer detail in those uh, droplets and just for reference there are there's a couple of example uh, signal traces uh, that we captured on the uh, droplets containing cells and uh, other particles so a droplet contains a complex um, mixture of fluorescent objects that should really result in multiple peaks um, so that's that what, that's what we managed to achieve eventually using uh, cylindrical lenses uh, so to move on to the other topic of uh, droplet analysis, uh, so it's something that we need to do to stabilize our instrument operation, and uh, roughly that's uh, that's the, a context uh, that uh, we deal with. Uh, so these droplets are formed at um, thousand times a second, and uh, we have an on onboard uh, computer that um, that needs to segment those and measure the, the volume and speed. Uh, so to those familiar with um, machine learning, that's uh, eventually the route that we took. Um, and that's, that's basically because the diversity of droplet shape, sizes, contents, and the channels that we deal with, uh, it, it's, quite, um, it's quite big to use a basic machine learning approach. Uh, there were a couple of approaches that we initially tried. One was based on semantic uh, pixel segmentation that was very accurate but fairly slow. And another one was uh, a simpler single shot detection method that did not give us good accuracy. Uh, so the, what we ended up uh, doing was a mix of two. Uh, we ended up um, combining those two into a two-step uh, process where a channel will be segmented out of an image basically to boost the speed and uh, fix um, detection area shape and then eventually that would then be segmented uh, into droplets and could give us um, an accuracy of over 95 percent iou at over 10 10 fps um, at uh, 1080p resolution and that's um, that's all the analysis that we do on these uh, on these chips online and so just to sum up um, Droplet analysis is uh, what we use for screening drugs, and uh, then light sheets are used to identify their contents um, uh, by by basically providing the means to excite uh, particle fl fluorescence within them. And uh, instruments stay then stabilized using a multi-step uh, AA mo model approach for um, droplet shape measurement.
So I would like to thank the team. So this is all the people, uh, many of whom provided training data for AI models. And I would also like to thank the instrumentation team, especially as, the, as Dalus is the optics lead who designed much of, the, much of those um, uh, laser-based uh, techniques. And Rokas is the AI lead uh, for droplet segmentation. So thank you all for your attention. And I guess now is the time for questions. So we have uh, time for, for several questions. Please uh, go ahead. Who has it? Uh, I don't see any written. If not, maybe I can give one or two. Uh, could you show your slide of uh, the uh, mi microscopy uh, setup and this, one. this light, light sheet uh, instrumentation? Yeah. This one or? Well, perhaps we don't see it now, at least everyone. Uh, well, regarding the, the light sheet, what is the limiting factor for your throughput and resolution? Could, could you comment a bit more? I think it's quite an uh, interesting uh, part regarding the instrumentation. There are, uh, so the ability to form these uh, collimated uh, sheets. So basically the, the quality of, uh, the main limiting factor is the quality of those uh, light, sheets that, light sheets that are produced and they are a factor of uh, several, several beam forming elements. And uh, so those including collimation lenses on the laser side, there's also cylindrical lenses um, and uh, finally the objective itself. And so we have to get all of those right so that we get a, a more or less flat line profile at the area where the droplets are flying through. Because uh, if we miss those, if let's say we uh, we end up with a focal plane, so let's say a high numerical aperture light sheet, uh, then it really depends on where you position the chip, and uh, the signal quality suffers as a result of that. And also, if we uh, if if we miss the uh, line width, uh, then we excite many particles at once. So these uh, signals they look like Gaussian profiles regarding of how many particles you have with them. So what we expect is several peaks from a single droplet, and we just end up with a single Gaussian one. And so that's, I think that's the, the main important uh, part, just to get that uh, line sharp and unstable. Uh, OK, and uh, uh, further, uh, a bit further on it, since we have time, uh, do you think or do you find that uh, some micro optical devices could be helpful like an array of micro lenses or or some kind of uh, some kind of additional uh, micro focusing uh, elements could could help you with distinguishing se separate droplets not to have them merge as an image so we we considered um micro optics on the chip uh, that's that's always a possibility but uh, just for context these chips uh, they, they have to cost um, on, the, on the production side they have to cost less than 50 euros per chip and uh, fabricating uh, micro optics on chips the the fairly um, cost intensive process uh, so we can't really do that on the on the place where those particles are well, basically next to the particles. Uh, what we did consider is diffraction optics to, to form the lines, um, but we haven't managed to, we just haven't managed to do that. And regarding your question, using micro lenses, uh, the, these line generators, line generators based on uh, Fresnel optics, so the, the multi-cylinder sort of patterns on the, on the PMMA uh, optics, they, they kind of work like that, uh, but we haven't managed to get a good line profile out of those. Uh, so I don't know exactly what the reason was, whether we missed something or uh, just, um, yeah, just, just the collimation factors are different. Um, so that's that, that was our experience. Uh, so yeah, we, we can't do anything into the chips. Uh, then we, we try to uh, form the beam shape on the instrument side as, as well as possible. And of those, uh, the, the j just simple cylindrical glass lenses, um, spherical glass, that just works all right. OK, thank you. Uh, well, we still have some time and no questions arising. If you want to, to say something more, Karoli, you have, you have time. If not, we can have a short uh, break till uh, the next presenter, uh, Pavel Albrecht, will give a presentation. Uh, we're together with Joanna Borkowska, as, as I see. Okay, they're ready. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, thanks for the time. I really appreciate uh, having the chance to present to the laser community because uh, I don't know, maybe somebody has some experience that um, 
that they could share in forming these uh, line beams and line light sheets. Uh, we're not uh, laser specialists at droplet genomics. We try to uh, basically learn on the job. So I imagine there's some we missed something uh, maybe fundamental that uh, somebody knows. Uh, so I'd appreciate it if you gave me a, a, a shout out. Um, thanks again. Okay, thank you. We'll try. So we have uh, five minutes till till next scheduled presentation. Perhaps uh, we should wait so whoever can join in time and, and uh, find it as, as scheduled. Unless uh, Pavel and Joanna, if you would like, you can uh, use it as as an extra time and. Uh, Present more about yourself, about your company, or, or some more uh, general brief in introduction, if, if you will. So we can exploit the time and and, and still have full presentation as, as scheduled in, in, in the timetable. Um, actually, uh, we are talking about our company in, in the slides also. So I don't know if. Uh, it's needed to uh, duplicate the presentation now. But if you have any questions be before the presentation, we gladly answer them. Okay. Uh, Tadas uh, writes in a chat that uh, do you have uh, some, uh, like a perhaps a pro proposed question to answer as a brief introduction since the the event is happening in virtually in Lithuania. Yeah, I, have you had any cooperation with uh, Lithuanian laser companies or? or... Um, no, no, we do not have any cooperation uh, actually with any uh, laser companies until now, at least. Um, we hope it will change. We are not that old company. Uh, actually, we are on market like around four years, but uh, the advertisement and everything uh, started not more than two years ago. So we are just building the mark and we are waiting for cooperations. Okay, good. Uh... Yeah, if, if 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 you see the chat and uh, so there are some of our like uh, proposed short 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 topics for a uh, still a minute or two about uh, challenges or 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 or, or CV lasers. Uh, mm. Do you see it or should I read it? Yeah, yeah, I see, I see. I'm I'm reading it. I mean, yeah. uh, I think it's not for us, the question. Uh, oh, for that, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay, so it's it's uh, almost like a, like, like time uh, for, for your original presentation, yeah? So uh, please uh, uh, become ready, Pavel uh, and Joanna, and uh, uh, you can share your, your screen, yes, and prepare for for, for, for giving a 15 minutes talk. And uh, uh, I think we can start like around now or so when you're ready. Yes. Uh, uh, okay. Um, can you see the presentation? Yes, I see, but I think it's not seen for the uh, audience. Okay, so it's okay. okay. So yes, we can start. Yeah. So okay. yeah, please uh, 
give a presentation. Okay, so uh, my name is Pavel Albrecht. I'm a co-founder and CTO of Tercitive Company. Um, our topic is uh, customizable search substrates and artificial intelligence for medical applications. Um, for those uh, who are not familiar with spectroscopy, um, I would like to briefly uh, tell you about it. Um, so, uh, Raman spectroscopy is based on the scattering, inelastic scattering. And this is the problem of the regular Raman scattering spectroscopy uh, because only one photon per 10 million photons are scattered in a, inelastically. So uh, people notice that, that you can only measure the powders and uh, they figure out that metal nanoparticles can enhance the signal. And this is how the SERS spectroscopy uh, was developed. And um, here I marked that the, um, they, they show that it's only uh, one per 10 million photons uh, scattered. Uh, and I would like to tell you uh, and show you actually the uh, sc scheme, how the SERS measurements uh, works. So first uh, you have uh, your material that you would like to measure, uh, you can apply it on the SERS substrates uh, by a droplet or immerse it in the solution of your material, you know, chemical or, or uh, cells. Then you measure it with the Raman uh, spectrometer and you get the spectrum, which is the fingerprint of measured uh, compound or, uh, or, or organism or anything you want to measure. Um, oops. So uh, in this case, uh, we thought that uh, producing the search substrates will be a good idea because on the market there are not many now more, but when we were uh, trying to um, create our own search substrates, there were just a few companies uh, and they were not actually reliable. So uh, our products are uh, uh, covered with two different uh, metal particles. One is just uh, uh, silver nanoparticles. The other one is also covered with gold nanoparticles on the top of the silver ones. And uh, you can uh, choose between different types of uh, substrates. It's actually more of the shape and a little bit about the performance. We have the premium substrates, which are uh, more homogeneous, uh, more uh, repeatable. So the measurements are like almost the same on all the uh, premium substrates. Also, we sell the S substrates, which are the small substrates with the size of uh, 3.5 uh, per 3.5 milliliter, uh, millimeters. But also we can have uh, possibility to uh, tell us the size that would be needed uh, by the um, scientists uh, for the measurements. And my friend uh, Asha will tell about it a little bit more further. Uh, and we figure out how to prepare the uh, surface, which is hydrophobic and hydrophilic. What you can see here, like the do droplet is almost perfectly uh, round. And in the hydrophilic uh, substrates, it covers all the uh, surface. Okay, my turn. Uh, hello, I'm Joanna Nabokowska and I'm a biologist and R&D specialist in Sersitiv and that's why I would like to um, tell you about how Sers may be used in uh, bio biology life science research. Uh, so for me, perfect diagnostic tool should uh, require minimal sample preparation, should give quick results, uh, be sensitive, 
and be repeat repeatable and reliable. And actually, Ceres is a great candidate uh, to this because uh, really it's we can actually measure unprepared sample without any labeling. We can obtain obtain specific uh, fingerprint of any sample, whole blood, urine, plasma, and so on. It depends what we want to study. Uh, so this is really the advantage of this. Uh, it gives quick results because we just need some short incubation and then we acquire a signal in a couple of seconds, sometimes minutes, but in comparison to other methods, it's quite quick. It's really extremely sensitive because it measure really um, can detect compounds in really low concentrations. Uh, repeatable and reliable, this is the thing that must be improved, but with proper tools, it is, uh, is, it is possible to, to make this method uh, repeatable. Uh, Pavel will tell something about this uh, later. Uh, <clears throat> so we wanted to create CERS substrates dedicated for life science research. Uh, to be easy uh, to handle by biologists. Uh, that's why we prepared substrates that fit uh, and are easy to, to work with 96 well plate. Uh, it may be simple, but really important uh, because in biology, when we have multiple samples uh, from many patients, multi -repl multiple replicates, it's important that we can uh, have these samples in, with, in order. Uh, that's why this is really useful. Uh, the size of substrates is really useful. And in addition, we can uh, use small volume, uh, about 100 uh, microliters of sample. Uh, so this is also important in life science when we have limited access, for example, to, to, to amount of, uh, of blood or so on. Uh, the second thing that we did, uh, is what Pavel said. We have two uh, kind, um, two types of active surface, and of course the hydrophilic one is dedicated for life science because the biological samples are in, are in water, and thanks to that we can easily work with the um, those samples. Uh, and about the sizes, these uh, custom sizes uh, are dedicated for, for example, biosensors, because if you want to create um, some cells-based biosensor, um, we often need little, uh, really small substrates, and that's why here we can create the substrate with the um, given custom dimensions. Uh, so how can we... Uh, use cells in biology, uh, I would like to uh, tell something about uh, biosensors. Uh, this is the example of biosensor that uh, was designed by the scientists from Jagiellonian University from uh, Poland, and we participated uh, in uh, the, this, this project, the grant proposal. So in this case, we use CERS uh, just as a reporter um, technique. Similarly, in similar like uh, in case of fluorescence dyes, here we have Raman reporter. So we have nanoparticles covered with a specific antibody. And on the other side of the uh, of this, we have cells substrate covered also with Raman reporter and a specific antibody. And if we have our uh, antigen that we are looking for, for example, biomarker of some disease, uh, these beams uh, to each other and give really, really strong enhancement. And in this uh, project, this uh, kind of detection uh, is going to be used with the microfluidic uh, system. So we put our sample, we, we put our probes for three different mar markers, for example. And if the marker is present in the sample, we get this uh, binding, really strong enhancement of signal, and uh, we can uh, detect if the biomarker is in the sample or not. Uh, so this is one, one example. Uh, and the second one is, of course, we can use this specific fingerprint of given sample to identify it, for example. And I just want to show you some, uh, some results uh, that we obtained. Here we have a living uh, dermal fibroblasts gr that uh, grow uh, on our substrate. This uh, green uh, dye stain uh, only living cells. 
Uh, and here we have, this is uh, from HELA cells, the specific fingerprint of uh, HELA uh, with some specific bands uh, uh, highlighted uh, here. Also, our substrates were used for bacteria identification. Here we have scanning electron microscope image of um, Neisseria bacteria on our substrate. And here we have the spectra of, uh, of this bacteria, of three different strains of this bacteria. But as you see, just with our bare eye, we can distinguish between them because they look quite similar. However, when we have proper tools and proper type of analysis, we can, uh, based on such spectra, identify which uh, bacteria it is, is it. And Pavel will tell more about uh, these methods. Um, uh, as you know, probably, uh, Raman is a nice uh, tool for uh, identification of uh, compound samples because of uh, the fingerprints, the fingerprint that the Raman spectra gives us. So for this uh, particular uh, um, classification method, means PCA, uh, it's principal component analysis. Uh, it's a nice tool to identify different uh, species of, uh, for example, bacteria. Uh, but uh, this is the most uh, popular technique, uh, at least among scientists, to uh, identify uh, different species or different compounds because it's easy, fast, and as you may see, it's a catching because it looks nice. But the problem is that, um, as you see at this graph, all the points of spectra are actually in one place. So this is not the most accurate method for identification of samples. Uh, also, uh, the uh, reliability of this classification is not on the high levels. Uh, therefore, we thought about uh, combining it uh, with more uh, complex uh, machine learning um, um, analysis. So it looks like this, that uh, you get the spectra of different uh, species of bacteria. For example, it no, doesn't uh, have to be like this. It can be any compound. Uh, then you learn a model, teach a model actually, uh, the patterns and the convolutional net neural networks uh, actually uh, looks for the patterns by themselves. Uh, you, you don't give them any uh, clues, ideas. It's just it, you give them data and it learned by itself and uh, it find the patterns of different spectra by itself. Um, the thing is that to learn a model, uh, you need a huge amount of data. It's like um, thousands of spectra for, uh, to, to learn it. What is what? I mean, like, for example, you have to have thousands of spectra of Escherichia coli or Salmonella or something to teach the model that this is Salmonella. And this is what we want to do further. There are many publications about it, but we want to make this tool uh, available for everyone on our uh, program. Uh, we called it uh, TVs. Uh, for now, we have only um, some tools like visualization, uh, which is fully customizable. Uh, so you can like, um, change the colors, uh, you can give the names of the axis or the plot or anything you want to do. You just have to put the data and it's actually done. Uh, you can also uh, manipulate the data. I mean, uh, you can press the optimization uh, of the data and this is the row spectra. If you uh, use the um, baseline correction, then you reduce the baseline, which is actually uh, 
used by all the scientists for the publications or the calculations or for everything. And also you can uh, do the data normalization just by one click. Uh, the other uh, function of our uh, program is actually PCA. We have also uh, counting the uh, enhancement factor. And the next step will be to teach the models uh, the data to distinguish between different compounds. And we would like to cooperate with some companies and uh, universities to achieve the um, huge amounts of any spectra, like also for biological scientists, forensics, everything, just to make a huge data so anyone can um, put their uh, spectrum and look what is it uh, according to our, our program, our model. And thank you for your kind attention. And I guess it's a question and answer session. Um, sorry for just two minutes. Okay, thank you, Pavel and Joanna. And we have uh, questions actually from both sides, the loud ones and the uh, quiet ones. So perhaps it's more correct to, to, to start answering from the loud ones. Yes, uh, uh, namely uh, expressed by Otto Reban. Uh, what is the limit of detection for SARS, for example, for bacteria? Um, for bacteria, it's around, uh, I mean, single bacteria can be uh, seen in this spectra. I mean, when you measure the compounds, uh, you can, we have actually results from our customers that are uh, around uh, 10 to minus 12 um, moles, but we never achieved this by ourselves, actually. Um, our best uh, results are around 10 to minus 9 uh, mole. Okay. And th there is another question from uh, also from Otre Bane uh, about how are the samples applied onto the substrate? Are liquid droplets just dried there or what is meant by incubation? Um, uh, you put the SERS substrates, um, and by immersion, uh, we mean that you put it uh, into the solution, for example, for you know, 10 hours, 20 hours, it depends on you. Um, of course, the longer uh, it stays uh, in the liquid, um, the better signal it will have, probably, uh, unless you make the multi-layer of the uh, compounds on the surface. Uh, by droplet, uh, we mean that you put the droplet and um, wait until it it's dry. Okay, thank you. Uh, meanwhile, one more question arose uh, from Anna Semenova. Uh, thank you for interesting talk. So, thank you. Uh, could you please characterize the structure of silver and gold cell substrates, uh, like size, morphology of the particles? Okay, um, the size of the uh, nanoparticles are um, between 70 and 350 nanometers. Um, actually, we use the silver substrate uh, to create the uh, silver gold substrate because we needed the um, good uh, roughness of the surface. So we have used the uh, Mm, silver substrate, which were first, mm, they worked, and then uh, we figure out that they have different uh, um, mm. oh, um, I forgot the properties. Word. properties. Uh, exactly. Uh, from the silver ones, so it's like we create uh, the silver substrate and we cover it with a thin layer of gold nanoparticles to change the, uh, the surface. <laughs> the surface, yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you uh, for your answers. Uh, as you may see, there are some more questions written in text internally, but maybe you can answer them in text as well, yes, because yes, it's sure. our time to move to the next uh, presenter and give him a presentation and so thank you for your answers and you, you can proceed in text format. 
And the next presenter is uh, Professor Virginius Barza from Toronto University. And his talk will be about nonlinear optical microscopy for cancer diagnosis. So please, Virginio, take your stage and... Great, thank you. Let me find my presentation. Okay. I hope you see it. Yes, we do. Thank you. Okay, so uh, hi everyone. Uh, I will talk today about nonlinear optical microscopy for cancer diagnostics. Work is done uh, in Toronto University and also in Vilnius University. So we have a, a joint project here, and the parts are done in, on one side of the ocean, and the other parts on the other side of the ocean. So we started uh, the looking at uh, the cancer samples and the pathology samples uh, around 2010. That was the first publication. And I'm showing you the uh, 3D structure of uh, prostate, uh, uh, prostate tumor in mouse model. And uh, we could image with uh, fluorescence, like... Uh, uh, it would be two photon fluorescence uh, microscope, and that is the first image. Then uh, there is a second harmonic generation I briefly mentioned. You are in optics, so probably you know that uh, the second harmonic is very nicely generated from collagen. So collagen is nicely visible in uh, that tissue. And third harmonic, you can generate also third harmonic from the sample. and. Uh, image uh, with a microscope uh, and uh, uh, that is uh, uh, that call highlights the nuclei of the cells and if it's a cancer then the nuclear the uh, nucleus of the cell is different so it's possible to use a uh, third harmonic for uh, for detection of uh, cancer and uh, uh, second harmonic can be also used for detection of cancer because uh, collagen is modified during cancer progression. It's more, uh, its properties, density are modified. So I will talk today mostly about second harmonic, but third harmonic uh, uh, can be combined. They are uh, all the all three uh, detection channels can be uh, combined in one, and uh, you can you can see that the last uh, image uh, shows you combined image. So that was 2010. We looked at different samples, and uh, now uh, now uh, I'm uh, showing the. Last one, and uh, the last one, now we're looking at the margin, tumor margin, or in the in different tissues, but this in this case, it's a lung tissue. So we have a tumor here. Uh, you see, that's what pathology sees. And then uh, the healthy part is somewhere here. So you, uh, you have a transition, and it's very important to understand the transition because uh, two things. One practical that when surgeons are doing surgery, they have to know where to cut uh, that uh, you have the uh, right uh, right uh, area to cut either in this case here or here or there. So it's not really clear because the uh, the transition is is always very difficult. The other thing is that. Uh, if we are seeing collagen, we can see the uh, collagen uh, uh, arrangement. And uh, then uh, the hypothesis is that if the cancer is very uh, uh, aggressive, 
then the cells migrate along the co uh, collagen strands, and then the metastasis occurs very, uh, very rapidly. If the collagen, and that would be radiating, the collagen would be radiating. If the collagen is arranged in the parallel uh, to the uh, to the surface of the of the tumor. Um, then uh, the cells have hard time to migrate, and and uh, that uh, that would give uh, uh, less aggressive cancer. So uh, as you see, collagen is very important to to, to image. And here, second harmonic generation uh, image overlaid onto HNE staining. What pathologist sees, and uh, right away you see that in tumor part. Uh, we have here in tumor part the, there is no collagen uh, practically, and then there is a transition area where more and more collagen appears, and uh, then here it gets to the more normal collagen. So that's SHG intensity, and uh, uh, nowadays you can you can record it uh, uh, rather easily, even with the two photon microscope, uh, putting the right uh, wavelengths. So, but uh, we went uh, a bit further, and uh, we will show what can be done uh, with the analysis of the images, and we used polarization. So we uh, we looked at Stokes-Muller polarimetry and extracted polarization parameters. We looked at the texture parameters, and we used machine learning then to, uh, to determine uh, where is cancer and non-cancer. So that's, in a nutshell, what I'm going to show you today. And for example, if we use polarization, uh, then you can see here a, a, a chiral susceptibility ratio. I don't go into much details just to show you that uh, the, it looked like uh, at this point the, uh, the margin was clear, but uh, now with the polarization, we can see that there is here an invasion of cancer uh, because you see another color, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, simply collagen modified, uh, and uh, here is more fibrotic collagen, and the natural collagen would be more in, in that region. So we can visualize better uh, and, uh, different collagen structures. Here, yeah, degree of circular polarization, for example, gives very nice also contrast uh, where the, where the uh, tumor is spreading. If we look at our devices, so we, we build our devices from scratch. So sometimes we use also uh, the, our own uh, lasers, oscillators, uh, we build ourselves. Uh, so, so here there is an uh, oscillator, for example, uh, 14 megahertz uh, pulse repetition rate. It's better for imaging when it's scanning. Uh, we built this, uh, yeah, more than 10 years ago. So at that time, commercially, uh, those things were not available at, with these parameters. Now uh, you can buy them. So, uh, so uh, then the beam goes through the scanning mirrors uh, and then uh, goes into the Sample, we add polarization state generators, then we collect second harmonic, get polarization state analyzers and detect. That is in the scanning mode. If we have the wide field mode, which uh, uh, it's faster, uh, so then uh, we have, uh, uh, again, the whole uh, amplified uh, laser, which uh, eliminates the sample. And then uh, it's the, the sample is image, second harmonic, for example, uh, and goes uh, the signal goes into the camera. Again, we have polarization state generators and analyzers, and we can measure uh, things at different polarization states. Uh, so we measure intensity, different polarizations. We also do texture analysis. Uh, texture analysis, just we get the image, here, and then we'll look at the values of the neighbors, and depending on those values, 
uh, we uh, get gray level co-occurrence matrix, and then from there we cal calculate different uh, uh, statistical parameters, contrast, correlation, entropy, angular second moment, inverse difference moment. Those are five contrast parameters which give a good uh, difference between cancer and non-cancer. There are other contrast parameters which are not so successful. So we stop uh, at those five parameters. Um, so that's what we do now. I will present one of the cases, uh, which uh, is the breast cancer microarray, how we analyzed it. So if we take uh, um, the flow of the experiment, we image with different polarizations. Uh, then we extract polarimetric parameters in terms of stocks uh, parameters. Then we go through the uh, 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 extracting the intensity ratio, degree of polarization, SHD, CD, SHD, LD, uh, other parameters can be extracted. Uh, uh, so from stocks, we can go already to susceptibility tensor. And uh, once we get to those images, then we take the image, images, subdivide and subimages. And uh, then uh, we analyze statistically mean and uh, 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 the deviation means uh, absolute deviation and the texture parameters. Once we have those parameters for each sub-image, uh, we, uh, we, we have uh, approximately, uh, so, so we have 36 parameters. We use 32 parameters in this work. Then we do uh, uh, logistic regression classification with machine learning, and then we give the samples uh, uh, to machine learning to detect uh, uh, the cancer, non-cancer area. So that's the flow of the experiment. Uh, if you look at the samples uh, itself, so this is microarray, uh, and uh, you see the uh, two more br uh, breast tumor samples, and you see normal samples. Uh, so there, there are different kinds of breast tumors. So uh, we look at, uh, at, at the ones uh, which uh, have uh, expressed receptors, uh, progesterone receptor, for example, uh, human growth factor 2 receptor, estrogen receptor. So so triple positive uh, would be when all three receptors uh, are expressed and triple negative will be uh, where there is none of the receptors expressed and that's the most aggressive cancer. So then we image uh, uh, in SHG and different polarimetric uh, uh, states and then extract polarimetric parameters. So here I show in B, um, the core, so each core is 700 microns uh, approximately. So, so you see the one core at the high resolution, this, uh, this whole uh, array is of low resolution. Uh, then you get high resolution, we can go even higher. So, so it's diffraction limited resolution. And uh, you see in D just a uh, um, small area, which again is at high resolution. So it's a vast amount of data that we get and we have to analyze it. So if we go to each core, uh, you have the normal and then three types of cancer. This is intensity ratio, degree circular polarization, SHGCT and SHGLD. Uh, you, you see visually already that some cores are quite different uh, in intensity, but intensity is not, uh, not enough. It's enough to uh, recognize cancer to a low accuracy, but for high accuracy, you need polarization parameters and texture parameters. So on each core, we subdivide that in 64 images and get texture parameters as well. So we end up with huge amount of data and you see uh, normal, triple positive, double positive, and triple negative cases. Uh, of uh, tissue. Then we have here each polarimetric parameter as an, Im as an image. And uh, even smaller, here you have 
uh, the mean standard deviation and then the texture parameters, five texture parameters. And now what this mandala, I call it mandala, means that if there is a connection, uh, a significant difference between one of the parameters, let's say in normal SHGLD and in tumor SHGLD, so there, there would be uh, a connection. If, the, if there is no significant uh, um, uh, difference, then there is another colorful connection. There are a lot of connections. And then in summary, we see that normal triple negative, uh, highly significant differences. We see normal, uh, in all, basically in all cases of cancer, normal, we see significant difference. Between the cancer types, significance is much lower. So what is good is really to, to, to look cancer, non-cancer. That's where the, uh, the method shines. And then if we do the intensity analysis uh, 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 with, uh, with machine learning, so, 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 so we, can, uh, we can do machine uh, learning uh, algorithm, and then we look uh, after that, how uh, the determination is performed on the new samples, which machine learning uh, has not seen. So if we do uh, just intensity, then uh, you have accuracy, uh, prediction accuracy was 86%. Uh, if we do polarization parameters and the intensity is 87, there is an improvement. Uh, the, sorry, not in, not polarization. The texture parameters, the texture parameters on the intensity. If we add polarization uh, parameters without texture, then it's 89 uh, polarization accuracy. And if we have uh, all the parameters, polarization parameters plus texture parameters, we get 94 percent the polarization accuracy. Uh, on average, so so in this particular core, uh, we uh, had normal tissue. Uh, uh, so normal core, it was uh, predictive was ninety c point one percent accuracy. Tumor is predicted uh, with less accuracy, eighty six point five. But uh, I think we have some explanations here that uh, you see the area which was. Uh, uh, misclassified, and if we look at collagen, that collagen uh, was still closer to the healthy collagen than to the cancer collagen. So simply, those are survival co collagen strands which are not uh, modified by cancer, and therefore there is uh, less accuracy in the determination. But if we combine with third harmonic, uh, accuracy will go up. So uh, today, as you see, uh, uh, we are in the, uh, in the process of uh, getting this, uh, uh, this uh, technology to clinical trials and get on different cancer, uh, cancer uh, uh, types. And uh, hopefully at uh, some point this uh, can be put to use in in the clinics and pathologists can improve their cancer diagnostic. Uh, I would like to uh, thank my group for, from the uh, University of Toronto. Here we, uh, we were happy to, to, to meet uh, a few weeks ago after a long uh, uh, separation uh, in my backyard. Uh, we had a party and uh, also, I'd like to thank the Lithuanian group. Uh, here was pre-pandemic uh, picture still, and we have uh, collaborators of Princess Margaret Cancer Center uh, from, uh, uh, from Toronto and National Cancer Institute uh, from Vilnius, the National Pathology uh, Center uh, from Vilnius uh, as well. And, uh, the, the Lithuanian group is in Vilnius University Physics Faculty. So thank you for your attention. I will entertain questions.
Thank you, Virginia. Uh, we have one minute left and three questions. Actually, one loud question, one comment, which can be read in the chat and one uh, silent in text. So we'll start with a loud and uh, which is again from Otrebane. Uh, can this second harmonic generation microscopy be used in vivo or also, or is it uh, applicable only for tissue samples? And yeah, and is it uh, used already used in the field, like in hospitals, uh, in hospital labs to detect tumors? So, uh, so uh, it's uh, okay. The first one that uh, yes, it can be uh, used in vivo. Uh, because second harmonic generation doesn't require labeling. Collagen is visible uh, without labeling. Uh, we have some development, but uh, in vivo, it's, uh, it's always uh, more difficult. But, uh, but there are the, some ideas there. And now uh, for the clinic, uh, yeah, we, we work with pathologists but uh, it's on the in the experimental stage that uh, is still well we need a, a clinical trial bigger clinical trial in, in order to get into uh, the use but uh, we are moving towards that okay thank you uh, so uh, the text questions perhaps can be answered in, in text and we need to move uh, forward to another presenter who is uh, Professor Katerina Svanberg from Lund University. And th this will be the last talk of this session before the coffee break. So, Miss Katerina, if you are ready, you can have a stage. Okay, thank you so much okay. for the kind invitation. And uh, you can see my screen, I hope, here, and you can hear me. So I will discuss with you photonics research in healthcare and also touch upon some industrial spin-off. And the, the, the techniques that I will discuss is both photodynamic therapy interstitially and gas and scattering media absorption spectroscopy. I start with this uh, telling uh, about worldwide health threats. And of course, one of them is the increasing incidence of cancer and here we need early detection, but also mineral invasive therapy. We also know that there will be a doubling of cancer cases until 2040. But we have another threat, which is also very, very valid for us, and that's the infectious diseases and the antibiotic resistance. To the right there, you see the distribution of cancer globally divided among the different continents and 18.1 million new cancer cases last year. We know that cancer is more um, appearing in areas where we have urban uh, areas with cities, large cities, than on the countryside. And this is particularly true for both breast cancer and prostate cancer. And to the right there, you see the proportion of death caused by the different cancer types and also other diseases. And you see that cancer stands for approximately one third of all death in the Western world, only overnumbered by cardiovascular disease. There are, of course, many different treatment modalities in oncology. Surgery, surgery with or without chemotherapy, and other patients are chosen for external ionizer radiation therapy or brachytherapy. And uh, the evolution of linear accelerators have been very, very impressive. But anyway, there is a need for minimal invasive individualized treatment modalities. And it might be that photodynamic therapy based on light, a sensitizing agent and the oxygen in the body is one of these therapies that could really help patients in particular to give treatment which is uh, selective for the tumor and also give less side effects because many of these other treatments, of course, are well known for 
alarming side effects for the patients. Photodynamic therapy has been uh, used at Lund University Hospital many, many years. Already 1987, we treated the first patient here in Lund, and until now, approximately 3,000 non-melanoma skin cancers have been treated. And to the left there, you see one example where you really point out the selective necrosis. And the red ring shows that the light was distributed equally over the whole area, but still you see that it's only the tumor that is necrotic after approximately four days. And this is another example, an anecdotic case, of course, but we have also performed phase three studies with a lot of patients included and found approximately 90% cure rate, which was in line with conventional techniques, but with favorable aspects for PDT concerning, for example, healing time and cosmetic outcome. But there is a limitation, of course, and uh, applying the light perpendicular from the surface means that we have a limited penetration into the tissue. So one way of overcoming this is to put the fibers directly into the tumor and that let the line shine from inside into the tumor and treat on site. In this talk, I will concentrate on prostate cancer because that's a perfect target for interstitial PDT. And you see also the statistics there where prostate cancer um, in men 2020 stands for 20% of all cancer cases. And you also see to the right there that it's lung cancer and prostate cancer, which are the two ones for the male population. And there is a constantly increasing incidence of prostate cancer, mainly, of course, based on better diagnostics, but also a true increase, as we believe. Many of these patients, they get ionized radiation therapy, both externally and with brachytherapy. But in the range of 15 to 25 or even more, maybe up to 40 percent, the tumor recur. And these are the patients that we are particularly interested in at the moment. With this interactive interstitial PDT instrumentation, which has a worldwide patent, as you see to the right there, the first sketch, more or less on the backside of an envelope. And in the middle, you see the system and the prototype, the first prototype you see to the left there. And this is the company SpectraCure which has produced this based on the worldwide pattern coming from um, Division of Atomic Physics with Sune Swanberg as the one behind the pattern. This treatment system has uh, six to 18 treatment and diagnostic fibers. So the, the beauty with this system is that besides giving the treatment, it can also in real time monitor the light transmission, the sensitizer fluorescence, and the tissue oxygenation. And you recognize these are the three components that are uh, that should be there to make the tumor cells die off. This is a 3D mapping of the fluorescence of one kind of sensitizer in a treated prostate gland. And you see from the beginning, the red and dark red marks out high intensity areas of the sensitizer, uh, sensitizing agent. On the other hand, at the treatment end, you see that almost all sensitizing agent is bleached away, which means a successful therapy, if you would like to say it like that. There is a correlation which we show here in between the sensitizer concentration and the cell death. You see how extremely well the necrotic formation follows the high intensity areas of the sensitizing agent. And the former speaker was also connected to Princess Margaret Hospital in Toronto, Canada. And that's one of the sites where an interstitial 
PDT clinical trial has started and, and going on for recurrent prostate cancer with, with approval. There are also uh, the same study going on in London and we have agreement or the company has agreement signed with University of Pennsylvania and Memorial Sloan Kettering also. This is a treatment overview using the laser unit with the dosimetry system. The treatment planning goes first with an ultrasound image of the prostate administration of the sensitizer, insertion of the fibers into the prostate according to the, pro to the program and the light delivery, which means that it's an individualized therapy based on the optical parameters of that particular patient. And this is a flow chart showing the same thing. And it also shows that the light delivery session is interrupted with the monitoring sessions to adjust the dosimetry and monitor all the time the different um, optical parameters during the therapy. This is a scene from one of the treatment um, sessions, and you can see it follows approximately all the clinical standards as um, is shown in this picture. So the uniqueness of this interstitial therapy is that the same fibers are used both for therapy and for monitoring. Of these three uh, aspects, the, the light, the sensitizer, and the oxygen, and it results in an interactive dosimetry, which means that at the same time, giving full treatment to the target, the recurrent prostate cancer, also sparing the organs at risk. And that's what you see below there, where the prostate as a target is lined out, but also the risk organs like the rectum, the sphincter, the urethra, which means that this, the program takes into account not only the tumor, but also the organs at risk, which in turn give a possibility for minimal side effects for the patient. This shows how the fibers are inserted through this matrix and with the ultrasound probe in the rectal uh, cavity. And uh, this only to show how the prostate is located below the urinary bladder in the middle of the pelvic region and the fibers that with the matrix and the fibers inserted according to what was calculated based on the optical parameters. And the, as you see here, alternating the therapeutic light and the monitoring light. So it's all the time an interruption and an ongoing treatment. And here you see the fibers inserted in place. The therapy can be given either of the whole gland, the whole prostate, or as a focal therapy, which means that only the tumor is uh, the target. And this is the trend these days, but also for widespread recurrent tumor, of course, the whole prostate should be treated as, oh, sorry, as shown here. And this is one focal therapy where you see only the tumor is treated and taken into account all the risk organs. From that, I would like to move to the other section of my talk, and that's the gas and scattering media absorption spectroscopy a method with many applications in biophotonics. And as a curiosity, I can mention that, um, um, that uh, um, Janis Alnis from Riga, he was visiting in um, Lund when this technique was developed. So Janis Alnis is on the first paper of Gosmos. That's, that's nice to know for the Riga people maybe. Here you see how this technique works. 
you send in laser into the tissue or into the, the scattering media, which can be anything. It can be uh, pharmaceutical tablets, it can be fruit, it can be milk packages, but it can also, of course, be biological tissue. And when the laser light hits a vacuole or a hole filled with gas, you can see a needle stitch like the signal because absorption in gases are so much more narrow, maybe up to 10,000 times more narrow than, for example, the, the signals from the tissue when you measure, e.g., uh, the fluorescence or so. And that can be done in different geometries. Either you send the light right through, as is shown to the left there, or you shine it uh, and let it pass into the vacuole and then come back at the same side. And why is this interesting? Yeah, here we have the other threat that I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, the antibiotic resistance, which is really, really a threat to the whole world. As a medical person, I would even say that it might be more of, of a dangerous threat than the global warming. And you see there the world map and the European map of the uh, percentage of people carrying multi-resistant bacteria. And you can see in Asia, for example, many countries up to 50%. But if you go down to the European map, you see exactly the same in Southern Europe. Your country, as well as Sweden and the Nordic countries has a better situation, but but that, that is for now, and we don't know what happens later. In the middle, you see a, a, a scheme there of, with, a, with a timeline, with the development of different um, antibiotics. And what you see is that there has been a boom during the years 1960 to 70, where many new antibiotic drugs were developed. But you can also see that this trend is not anymore there, and very few new antibiotics are developed. To the very right below, you see a photo which I took in a, in a pharmacy in China, and that really points out the problem, because here any customer without any prescription from a doctor can purchase any of these antibiotics and start to use it without having any knowledge. We also all know that the, that the doctor behind developing uh, penicillin was Alexander Fleming, and for that he got the Nobel Prize 1945. So can gas in scattering media, absorption spectroscopy, or the gas mask have, uh, does that have any influence in this problematic uh, scenery. Might be that we could develop, not, not yet, we don't have it, but we are aiming at developing guiding, techno guiding uh, tools for the doctor deciding what kind of medication should be given to patients, e.g. patients with sinusitis. And this is one of the clinical trials that we have been doing where we where we compare our um, optical-based uh, uh, technique, the gas mask, with computer tomography scanning, using, as you see, two lasers with the wavelength 760 to, fi to fit the oxygen, one of the oxygen lines, as well as the water vapor uh, wavelengths to, to uh, hit the water vapor light. And why do we do that? We use water vapor to normalize our oxygen signal, because the whole thing is to measure whether we have oxygen or not in the hollow organs, like in the sinuses, because that is, can be a good indicator that there I'm sorry, are it's one no, minute left. no bacteria, but virus instead. And of course, a patient who has virus should never, ever have antibiotics. The same thing goes for the air infection in small kids. And here we use both the gosmos 
technique and the, the reflectance spectroscopy to monitor the color of the eardrum, which also has an implication in interpreting the disease. And last thing I will mention for you is that this is also a perfect technique for monitoring premature children when they are born before week 37 and have lung problems. And this is brought also into a small spin-off company called GPX Medical, and they are developing in situ lung monitoring for 24-hour surveillance, surveillance of these small kids, alarming system for lung complication. So this is the list of many of the, the collaborators during the years, and you can truly see here how we have been working in Lund with medical people, but at the same time in collaboration with technical people and people from physics. So this is a real interdisciplinary work that I was presenting. And that is to build bridges in this, in this situation in between physics and medicine. And we could really claim that it is at the crossroads where th things really happen. And with that, I thank you so much for the attention. Thanks. Thank you, Katarina, for your very impressive presentation. And uh, I don't see uh, any questions written and we have a uh, time for coffee break, but if no one minds, I have one, one question from my side, based on your vast experience with uh, treating, diagnosing cancer, do you find it eventually as a local or a constitutional disease? Because yes. treating with photodynamic, it's local yes. treatment. And yes. if it's a constitutional, so it's re restarting after a while. Yeah? So it means uh, it needs to be repeated the procedure. Yeah, it's, it's of course a local therapy, but on the other hand, uh, combining that with fluorescence detection, you could also use, but that is of course not photodynamic therapy, that, that's to utilize other, other type of light. I mean, then, then you go down in wavelengths and, and you can illuminate the tissue. And the beauty is that you can discover tumors which are not seen by conventional techniques or by the naked eye. So this is a very, very sensitive technique and we have been working a lot with that since many, many years in different kind of clinical settings. And that, that's good. We did one clinical uh, uh, trial or clinical study in Vilnius um, some years ago with very, very promising results. That was in early cervical cancer, uterine cervical cancer, which was also published with 110 patients included. So, so th that is, has also great promise, of course, and we have seen the work down in Munich by Herbert Stepp and coll collaborators in urinary bladder, for example, to detect early urinary bladder cancer, even before you can detect it by the naked eye. Okay, thank you, and good luck with your studies and towards up, up, applying them into real life. So uh, with this answer, I see no, no more questions are raising uh, uh, and uh, we should switch to coffee break as kindly Maria as invites to switch to have a room to a coffee room, virtual one. So everyone is welcomed and we will come back here uh, in half an hour. So at 16.20 PM, PM yeah, or 4.20 PM. Uh, for the next session, which will be about medical challenges and photonic so solutions. Uh, more presentations, sh sh shorter ones. Okay, so see, meet you in coffee break or see you in the next session. Thank you for your attention.
Hello again, everyone. Uh, welcome back from uh, coffee break. And we continue our last session for today, which is dedicated to medical challenges and photonic solutions. I'm pitching one, so we'll have uh, more of shorter presentations and a live queue to pre present and answer uh, the questions. And so the first presenter is Adomas Klimantas from uh, UV Reso, and he will give us the, the presentation. So please start the session. Great. Thanks, Mangirdas. I hope all of you had a great uh, virtual coffee and uh, we can get back to the event stuff. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the revival of ultraviolet germicidal irradiation and what opportunities the current pandemic presented and what opportunities we have for the future. Um, Right, so I guess most of you probably know what UVGI can do. Basically, um, it can disrupt the RNA and DNA structures of various microorganisms, including bacteria, viruses, and fungi. Uh, so it can be used for various kinds of sterilization. And uh, the effectiveness of, uh, of ultraviolet irradiation against the COVID-19 pathogens were all, was also confirmed during the last year, so there's no question about that. And obviously, that presents us with great uh, opportunities today uh, of helping the planet as well as Lithuania and, and, and many other countries. Uh, one in interest, interesting thing is that there is an increasing rate of governmental approval for uh, closed ultraviolet systems for the use of those kinds of systems that you see in this picture in the center, which do not have a direct uh, ultraviolet light which cannot harm human bodies and skin and cause any irritation and that's why these systems can disinfect areas when people are present and, uh, and, and these kinds of systems are getting more and more approval. Uh, so we like to call ourselves uh, kind of the pioneers of UVGI in Lithuania and why is that? It's mainly because we are the, main, the first company in Lithuania, and I think in the whole Baltics, which is exclusively uh, focused on applying uh, ultraviolet uh, germicidal irradiations for eradication of microorganisms. Um, and of course, as I've already said, the pandemic presented us with great opportunities. And during the pandemic, we as a team formed. Uh, when the full lockdown started, we joined the Hack the Crisis Hackathon. And, uh, and we were one of the winners of the hackathon with the idea of uh, creating a, a mask which uses ultraviolet light to disinfect all the air that uh, is being breathed out by uh, potential virus carriers. And after the hackathon, we received um, uh, a, a project by, uh, funded by the Lithuanian government called Innostartas. And that's how our company as a startup started. And by the summer, we already had developed two distinctive paths of, of startup development. So one was innovation development, creating solutions to problems which haven't been solved or are being solved in very inefficient ways by creating our own systems and also by um, creating partnerships with uh, existing system uh, manufacturers across, across the globe uh, for installing existing systems in Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. And by autumn 2020, we already had uh, uh, quite a large team for a startup and first commercial projects and sales. Um, and, and, and we, uh, not long afterwards, we already had our break-even point. Um, so by today, we have already solved quite a few challenges across, uh, across Lithuania, across various industries. You can see quite, quite a few of uh, big names among our clients. Uh, one of the biggest is probably the biggest, of course, is Sweatbank. We've installed uh, uh, closed ultraviolet air disinfection systems all across Lithuania in their offices. Um, but also we were able to help food industry and uh, even uh, holders of heritage buildings, which are battling mold problems. Um, but in terms of the main problem, COVID-19 disease prevention. So our systems are being used in schools, universities, offices, construction companies, and many other kinds of businesses and institutions across the country. We also have 
quite a few ongoing uh, innovation projects. So as I said, this um, battling COVID-19 with existing systems is one part of our startup. The other part is developing our own systems. And one of the main projects is uh, disinfection robot, R&D project with Roberto Sistemos, also working with various uh, meat and other food processing companies for uh, removal of bacteria. And the most, the latest project is concerned with water sterilization. And all of these projects we are uh, doing with collaboration with the main scientific institutions of Lithuania, international scientists and approval of Lithuanian governmental institutions as well, especially when the school children are, are concerned, that is very, very relevant. And of course, this presents opportunities as well as um, collaboration opportunities. And we are very keen on finding um, potential partners in international expansion, scientific research collaboration, R&D opportunities, for example, trying to somehow increase the potential of ultraviolet germicidal irradiation by combining ozone and titanium dioxide appliances. And finally, uh, various specific industrial appliances for eradication of specific microorganisms. So feel free to reach out to us. Why you should reach out to us mainly because we probably are, as I said, the number one team uh, in the Baltics, which works with exclusively ultraviolet germicidal irradiation. And um, our expertise, of course, comes from the fact that we have PhD level scientists working in our team. We have uh, a few uh, junior members and the team is growing and growing. We have established collaboration with the top research centers, connections with state officials, and which is very important. We have partnership deals with quite a few top international suppliers of both already made appliances and uh, ultraviolet lamps. Um, so, therefore, we have quite a, an incredible growth potential. Uh, we've become profitable in one year as a startup, which is quite a rare thing. And we've grown from zero to eight in just one and a half years. So, great opportunities ahead. Feel free to reach out and uh, I'm waiting for, for your questions. Thanks. Thank you, Adamo. And... Uh... I don't see any specific questions uh, to you. Uh, maybe even one coming from my side. Uh, what are the limitations of your proposed uh, technique, which is like impressive, but uh, any dimensions or, or, or time durations? What are restrictions for, for it to be uh, not widely, but what, uh, what restrictions you, you, you face as uh, limiting factor for efficient uh, use of your proposed technology? Well, I think one of the main things is that people generally are afraid of ultraviolet light because they're not used to closed ultraviolet systems. And uh, the main thing they, they think about is the, the huge smell of ozone and the open ultraviolet light, which is harmful for one's eyes and skin. So this is a very, very uh, difficult stigma to overcome. And every day when we're talking to potential customers, we need to stress this more, more than ever that the systems are safe to be operated when people are present, when we're talking about those systems that battle COVID-19 in schools and other, other areas. So I'd say believing the technology is probably the main thing. It's not about the actual research anymore, which is more than enough. Okay, great. Uh, the answer sounds promising. So, <laughs> good, good, good luck with such approach, uh, realizing it. And thus, now we can switch to the other presenter, Dr. Antanas Urbos from uh, Workshop of Photonics. And he'll give us a talk about another high precision technology. So, please, Antani, take your time. So, hello, everybody. Antana Surbas is my name. I'm coming from Workshop of Photonics. And uh, I'm going to uh, tell you what we did uh, so far for medical and life sciences. So first of all, who we are. Uh, we work uh, more than 18 years in laser, uh, laser micro machining. 
And uh, the main material we work with is glass, but uh, it could be any other material because uh, we work with femtosecond lasers and no material can withstand uh, femtosecond uh, light pulses. We uh, have uh, several patents related to this uh, laser micromachining. And the, uh, our work is based on the, today 45 professionals, uh, six of them are PhDs, and 24 have physical background at the master or bachelor's uh, level. So how we do and what we do? Uh, we usually start from prototyping uh, uh, for realization of some ideas our customers have. And if it uh, is proven, uh, then uh, we can offer pr production service up to 1,000 features uh, per, per month. And uh, if uh, the case goes well, then we offer laser systems that uh, enable uh, producing uh, these features uh, at, at the customer premises. And as I mentioned, we work with all materials, but mostly with uh, transparent materials. So what we did uh, for uh, uh, medical and uh, life sciences uh, uh, fields. So one thing is uh, microfluidics chips uh, made from glass, which are bio in the article. And uh, uh, it is uh, not cheap, but very reliable thing. For plastic, we, you can see that we can uh, fabricate horizontal and vertical channels, which uh, are needed for full service uh, uh, of uh, microfluidic chips. Here you can see a multi-layered sandwich of five layers where the closed channels are located uh, in uh, different uh, heights uh, of the uh, chip. So between them, we make uh, vertical channels like here. And what is important, uh, it is uh, bonded without uh, adhesives. Uh, it is uh, laser welded. We made some filters for inhalators, uh, like, like this one. And uh, uh, this is uh, drilling met metallic foils uh, up and whole diameters uh, are down to one micron in diameter. So, which means that uh, it can be very tiny filtering uh, of air uh, or liquids. What we did uh, more, this is a cell probe uh, of several microns uh, in the diameter where micron size, uh, uh, the hole is drilled in one wall of, the, uh, of this uh, probe. So uh, it is uh, used for cell engineering to extract parts of cells from inside. Here is another kind of probe. Uh, it is uh, a metallic needle. So uh, if uh, someone needs uh, some good probes, we can offer it uh, without any problem. What we really uh, did uh, more, it is uh, optical fiber diffusers which are usually used for intravenal uh, irradiation of your tissue. So, uh, and uh, what, what we are proud of, that we can make uh, uh, controllable uh, shape uh, of uh, scattered uh, light, meaning that uh, the light can be scattered at the tip end, at the back end uh, of your diffuser, or can be distributed evenly. And if you need such, uh, uh, such uh, diffusers, we can give you, you a phone of people who are already uh, making them. Also, we did uh, some uh, capillaries uh, with very precise uh, cutting results. It, it was uh, submicron accuracy. So, and these are guys with whom we work. Some of them are suppliers to, uh, to uh, medical or life sciences. Some of them, that like flex medical, me diagnostics, uh, 10 times genomics, they are already working in that field. So, and if you have micro challenge, 
don't hesitate, contact us, and we most probably will help you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Antane, for your presentation. Uh, I saw a question, but it seems like it was for, for Adomas and he, he already answered it. But if, if there are no more questions, I think it can be uh, also addressed to, to uh, like related to your presentation. And this was by Sergei Bobichenko. Any example of practical use, which uh, one of applications would you could distinguish as already used in practice? Uh, all these things uh, which were demonstrated on presentations, they are practically used. They are, uh, it was an order from end user and customer, and we designed uh, together uh, some, uh, something, and they, they are using it in their lab or, or, the, or the practice. All, all the examples are real. Okay, so good to know, good, good to see that it's already applied, not just proving the principle it is possible. Uh, I don't Every, see... All, all of them are working. Great. Uh, and uh, yes, it, it, the answer is convincing. There is no, no, no more, there are no more questions. So perhaps we can switch to the other presenter, namely Christina Anna Nietzsche. Up again about uh, enabling laser technologies. So, Christina, once you are ready, please uh, take your time and give us your presentation. Okay, thank, thank you guys, sorry. <laughs> Some kind of technical difficulties. So, uh, hey everyone, I, like it was mentioned, I'm Christina and I'm a cluster manager at Laser and Engineering Technologies Cluster, LITEC. LITEC is a cluster based in the capital of Lithuania, Vilnius. It is a structure based on mutual trust and understanding that is being coordinated by the Science and Technology Park of Institute of Physics. Now it gathers 19 companies and organizations active in the field of tonics or related engineering technologies that carry out jointly R&D initiatives and projects. Uh, besides the members, we are very active within the ecosystem that surrounds us in Lithuania that previously the Minister Kaitis gave us a brief introduction. Each member of the cluster LITEC um, the LITEC community uh, is being uh, created by uh, creating uh, added value photonics based manufacturing chain. So each member uh, brings something to it. Uh, within this manufacturing chain, we can create anything from the simple uh, optical component to laser system or laser micro machinery. So each member supplements to it uh, directly by developing laser or photonics based product services electronics components, um, or indirectly by consulting, marketing, or, or training. The competences within the cluster include, but are not limited, not limited to, are uh, the short and ultra short pulse lasers, optical components and optical mechanical components, electronics, precise mechanics, laser micro machining workstations, that are, all, that are all being implemented into the industry, such as science, manufacturing, um, space, automotive, and uh, medical life science. And I will give you a few examples where uh, cluster members have their uh, suggestions um, and solutions. For example, 3D Pro is the largest 3D printing prototyping center in Lithuania, um, that their company offers an innovative additive manufacturing way for serial production and prototyping for various industries, including uh, healthcare. Expla a manufacturer of lasers and laser systems uh, with researchers at the University of Twente in Netherlands and other partners in the European project PAMOT have developed and are currently testing a device that can detect breast cancer at a very early stage and that is more accurately than current X-ray mammography without causing discomfort to patients. The other company is QS Laser that provides compact sub-nanosecond high-energy diet pump 
air-cooled lasers suitable for medical equipment and manufacturing, also for medical diagnostical systems, spectroscopy, and digital uh, holography. Ultrafast lasers manufacturer uh, Lithilith introduces the market with a compact, clean, and short pulses air-cooled femtosecond fiber laser for biophotonics. Um, it is an easy, integrated, robust external disturbances and reliable solution for multiphoton microscopy, leading to a sharp diagnostical images. And uh, alas, uh, Lithuanian designer uh, company of laser micro machining uh, systems for industrial, scientific, and uh, medical applications. They provide solutions for corrosion resistant uh, marking of stainless steel, manufacturing of stents, and much more. As a cluster, as I mentioned, we are very active in the national level within the Lithuanian laser community, but we are also very active within European cross sectorial partnership, digitalization, and internationalization activities. We, are, we as a cluster are the partners of the largest pan European digital innovation hub uh, for photonics, Photon Hub Europe. Uh, this initiative aims to help SMEs to accelerate by taking photonics based solutions. Including, uh, including uh, health sector. SMEs can get professional guidance, access to financial instruments like SK funding, access to the best EU photonic centers, and also share their own uh, knowledge and innovations. Uh, this community also has created a virtual community platform where you can find the latest news about photonics related events, funding opportunities, or other insights. Also share some information about your innovations. And if you would like to discuss more about the collaboration possibilities, get in touch with uh, the tech partners, members, uh, get to know more about the Photon Hub initiative or find and discuss more possibilities for collaboration or just have any other questions, uh, do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, do we have uh, any questions now? We don't see to have any questions. Uh, so, as as I understand, to, to better understand this uh, cluster, that like you just provided a few kind of benchmark uh, examples, kind of small success story or the, the processes which were already transferred towards more practical applications, right? Yeah, this is. I, I just showed overview of a few of the tech members, companies that are located here in Lithuania, and just the solutions, uh, laser-based solutions that they already are providing to the uh, medical industry. So just give an ev overview and also a possibility for other companies to contact us and see of the possible uh, future collaboration opportunities. Okay, and um, during the longer run or let's say longer run like five years or ten years do you see uh some changes improvements augmentation whatever of this uh, cluster and also of the uh, end users yeah if we are talking about the cluster as an organization uh, that is of course like every other company so a cluster is like a community so uh, it will grow. Uh, we are attracting uh, new companies. We are uh, expanding our manufacturing chain uh, that is added value. Uh, and we are helping those companies that work with the tech uh, just to be more internationalized and to find those cross-sectoral um, connection, join points. So this is uh, just like our uh, main aim. So in the in, in uh, future, for five years, I think we will be more uh, European level visible, uh, even that we are right now. Okay, thank you. Good, good, good to know and good, good luck. Um, so perhaps we can switch uh, to our presenter, uh, to Tadas Kilnushis, who will again give us uh, some presentation about laser or at least laser related technology and medical device miniaturization. So Tade, please uh, take your stage and give us your presentation. Thank you, Mangirdas. Uh, I'm Tadas Kildushas from Machine One, and I would like to introduce you quickly into molded interconnected devices and uh, SSAO technologies that's enabling it. 
So uh, briefly, uh, I'll talk very quickly about uh, what are MIDs or molded interconnected devices as a sale and what are the applications for, for, for those technologies. So basically molded interconnected devices is when instead of using a printed circuit board or PCB, uh, electrical circuitry is uh, made directly on the device or in the device, usually on the casing of the device inside of it. And the main advantages of that is that it can save space by uh, making a tighter packaging uh, since you don't need a flat circuit board uh, inside. It can re reduce the weight. And also it can add additional features like functional surfaces uh, in some cases, uh, some other things that would not be possible otherwise. And the best thing about, uh, about the technology is that it has really no shape limits and can be made on 3D devices, on 3D uh, surfaces, uh, which allows that very tight packaging inside the device. Some of the applications where it's used now, it's uh, in automotive, for example, packaging uh, electronics inside the steering wheel uh, or in the front panel. Consumer electronics, where it's widely used uh, mostly for antennas and mobile phones. It's in medical devices and also in telecommunications, again, for some antennas uh, integrated uh, and some other applications. Technologies for molded interconnected devices, um, some of them are quite old. Uh, most of them are 3D printing like, uh, where circuitry is basically uh, put on uh, from extruders or, or similar technologies on the, uh, on the device. Some are lithography based. Uh, the mostly, uh, most widely used laser direct structuring is laser based. And SSA uh, is a new one uh, coming into the picture. So the currently mostly used one, uh, laser direct structuring technology uh, from LBKF, is a two-step technology, which is laser-based uh, acti activation uh, and then uh, chemical plating of, uh, of the electrodes. The, ma the main thing, uh, the key feature is that it's used with special materials that uh, must have metal additives in the material, which also has some drawbacks uh, on itself because uh, using special materials makes it more expensive. And also uh, material properties change from the standard materials that are used in, uh, in the industry. And another thing is that it also can provide electromagnetic shielding, which is not ideal, especially when used for one of the most popular applications, uh, which is antennas. And now a little introduction in SSAO technology, uh, which is developed at Center for Physical Sciences and Technology. And, and what's different here? So, same as uh, laser direct structuring uh, technology, it's a two-step two uh, process. One uh, first step is laser-based, uh, where we are forming the shape of the electrodes that will be done on uh, a 3D or 2D surface. And then it's uh, chemical plating uh, technology where copper and uh, in most cases, a sandwich of copper, nickel, and gold will be plated onto the surface to form the real contacts. <clears throat> the difference from, from other technologies is that it works with pretty much any material. Uh, it has been tested with a lot of polymers, with ceramics, with glasses, silicon, and there is no uh, limitation in shapes. It can be uh, may, uh, made to work on 3D shapes on large uh, objects, as well as on delicate objects, for example, thin films, and it does not damage uh, the object itself. And since it, uh, 
does not need any specific material, any special material. Uh, there is no need to use metal additives inside the material. Uh, the price of the material stays the same and uh, material properties does not change. So uh, it's much easier to integrate into existing uh, production uh, processes. Uh, adhesion strength of the contacts formed is uh, really high. And recently for uh, some automotive applications, we have been doing tests where the objects with uh, contacts form of it. Uh, we are measuring the resistivity before, uh, before the test and then boil the sample in the water for a couple of hours, measure the, the resistivity after it, and it's still... Uh, it still stays in the same uh, acceptable levels. So it really can withstand uh, really uh, <clears throat> aggressive uh, environments. Uh, the tracks uh, formed, the width of the tracks formed depends on the material, but it can be from several millimeters down to tens of microns. And recent researches are also starting to work on single digit micron uh, tracks, uh, which is uh, at the moment possible on some of the materials, for example, on glass. And due to uh, high adhesion strength, uh, it can be used on flexible materials. Uh, it also can be uh, made invisible uh, to human eye because of uh, narrow track width. And with the recent development, it probably will be possible to make it transparent for uh, some wavelengths of the uh, laser light as well. So the applications, the current ones, as I've mentioned, are in antennas, in automotive electronics, in micro devices. And for medical markets, we are seeing a potential applications in lab on chips, on medical wearable devices, where tight packaging is uh, very important on medical sensors, also uh, potentially some ultrasound transducers and similar applications. So if you see any, uh, any potential for, uh, for use in your field, uh, just contact us. Uh, we'll be happy to discuss uh, how, to, how to move forward and how to arrange some tests, whether the technology can be applicable. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tade, for impressive presentation. Uh, sounds really like uh, new technological solutions are available. I don't see qu any questions from the audience, but I have one of my own. Uh, you mentioned that there is no limitations for the surface, uh, but what are the limitations, if there are, or to what extent there are no limitations regarding uh, resolution or accuracy of the printing? How, how small the circuits can be made? So it very much depends on the material. Uh, for example, on plastics, we, we can go below 10 microns, but not on every material, and it's not easy to do. On glass, there were some results where it's uh, down to one micron and probably can be uh, going below that. Uh, but as I say, it's very much a material dependent, dependent process for the resolution. For the accuracy, it's, uh, it's the same. Uh, if uh, we need a high resolution, of course, we'll have uh, high accuracy as well. Where it's not needed, uh, it can be optimized for higher throughput uh, on larger objects uh, with wider tracks. Okay, good, clear. So thank you for for the answer and as there are no more questions so we proceed further and switch to our uh, speaker Gilvina Sianchoras is from a uh, company Zive or Zive uh, so okay so please uh, uh, present one more smart uh, card uh, technological device for monitoring uh, uh, biomedical related issues Hello for everybody. Uh, I am Gilvina Sianchoras and representative of uh, <coughs> company Zaif. And we created uh, a small, small device uh, for cardi 
cardiac monitoring uh, for use at home. It's, it's uh, innovation, uh, not mostly technological, but, uh, but uh, we <coughs> did this device in small size. Uh, we can, can use uh, all time. We, we walk, we, we rest, we, we some sports or, or other activities. Uh, and and uh, it's uh, this device, I think, uh, can <coughs> provide some uh, early diagnostics uh, for cardiac disease. And uh, we start company three years, uh, and uh, in two years, we done some jobs. We, we established uh, electronics, uh, and, and uh, certified as me medical de device class two. And we have um, proved that, uh, that uh, our ECG device uh, work properly and, and doctors can uh, analyze and, and see the ECG and uh, how it uh, can be used. It's, it's the uh, chest strap and, and our device uh, you, <coughs> You can uh, you have all, all time. It's a battery life uh, uh, three days. Uh, now then later can we charge uh, with two hours and and use uh, <coughs> all, all the time and on day and night and and you have uh, all all data from your heart. And what we're doing now. It's uh, the analysis, uh, eye-based uh, software with uh, analysis, uh, which can say what problems we find in, in ECG and uh, can diagnose early stage of, uh, of some diseases uh, like uh, myocardic infarctic, stroke, uh, and, and other <clears throat> bad conditions. Uh, our team is uh, it's me medical team. We have uh, doctors, uh, mostly cardiologists, but uh, in the team have um, and from another uh, types of, of medicine and, and very interesting. When we started, we think we we're doing device for cardiologists, but later we understand what uh, this. Uh, this type of data uh, using um, toxicologists and uh, and infectologists uh, in in the COVID uh, uh, pandemic and neurologists and other other uh, <coughs> doctors and uh, our technical team uh, we have uh, engineers and programmers and uh, I developing team. And we think that uh, this uh, device, it's medical device, can go to the market in the next year and save some lives in Lithuania and whole world. And we have no direct connection with photonics, but think that can can be some devices later with, uh, with lasers or, or other photonics elements. And I think I can answer questions. Okay, thank you, Jirvene, for your presentation. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I do not see any questions uh, uh, arising. So again, my task to, to, to provide you with, with it. Uh, the, the strap you showed uh, for heart rate monitoring seems pretty similar to, to the one uh, I have and the ones who run or ride a bike or do some other kind of sport activities. How, how it differs from the ones uh, which are already commercially available? Is it just the software of transferring or, or processing data or is it the device itself like uh, the hardware is different or it's a combination of both maybe? Oh, I think it's a combination of both. Well, first, uh, we have uh, all all ECG, uh, mostly 
fitness devices have uh, only heart rate. We have uh, all ECG and we can find uh, not not only heart rate but but and uh, extra systoles and and pauses and and uh, some other <clears throat> interesting findings in the CG and we have uh, Bluetooth related data transfer from device to, to phone and from phone to to our cloud and we provide eye based uh, analysis in the cloud and return the results to the phone for application. Okay, so it means it's both uh, the hardware, the software, and the combination is, is yeah. and, more... And mostly the difference is that uh, our device is medically certified and it's medical device, not, uh, uh, not fitness device. Okay, good. Thank you for uh, your additional explanation. Uh, and now we can switch to our presenter. Uh, again, Tadas. Uh, this time Lipinskas, uh, and uh, he will give us uh, some innovative illumination for surgery and scientific applications. So Tade, when you're ready, please start and we're listening. Thank you, Mangerdas, for introduction. My name is Tadas Lipinskas, uh, and uh, today I will introduce Optogamma, a small company based in Vilnius. Uh, uh, actually, we uh, work in the field of uh, laser-related technologies and components, and our main products uh, are the, I could say, we have three main lines of the products. One is a iSafe 1.5 spec nanometer, uh, micrometer spectral range nanosecond lasers, mostly developed for portable devices like range finding. Uh, another product group is uh, dedicated for beam delivery and beam shaping. It's uh, beam expanders, collimators, laser power attenuators, uh, mostly used for laser integrators, not only for the medical applications or, or biomedical, but as well for laser micro-machining, some microscopy, um, multi-photon polymerization, polymeriz polymerization system, etc. And the third group of our product is related to the components uh, as uh, laser mirrors, polarizers, crystals, etc. But today I will talk uh, more about the, uh, all these products you can find at our website for sure. But today I will talk about the other uh, task we recently uh, uh, solved for, for uh, worked on for our local surgeons. So we got a task to develop in intelligent uh, lightning systems for standard uh, surgery uh, in order to uh, enhance the contracts between different tissues uh, during the surgery operations. And the uh, uh, idea was uh, very simple. So we started from the analyzing different uh, tissue parameters with the incident light. Uh, so it's reflected light, transmitted, uh, scattered, uh, absorbed, or the fluorescence. Uh, and uh, because of the uh, these different parameters for each tissue, we, we got uh, different uh, spectrums, for especially for reflection, what is important uh, for the vis visual in inspection. And um, we did this analysis uh, uh, within spectral range from UV up to near infrared spectral range. And here in the pictures, uh, you see the image of the open su surgery of the Vistar line rat and the uniform white illumination. And the simplest example of, on the, for the same picture on the blue, green, and red light. And as you can see, there is a different contrast be between the different tissues uh, and this makes a uh, uh, possibility to find the optimal parameters to enhance uh, the visual detection. So we did uh, some modeling uh, of illumination spectra uh, between, and, and, and we analyzed uh, uh, potential contrast enhancement 
and the, for the lot of the tissues or majority of the tissues, we were able to achieve more than 50 or more than 80% contrast enhancement. Uh, and that would, was very helpful for, for the surgeons. So based on that, we uh, produced the prototype of this intelligent lightning system, including nine independent color channels for the lightning. We did some pre-programmed pre uh, programs for, for elimination for dedicated or requested tissues. Uh, the, the prototype has the color, temperature color adjustment from 3,000 to 8,000 Kelvin, uh, quite intensive uh, illumination. And what is important, it's, uh, uh, we, we achieved more than 90% illumination field uniformity. So it was a prototype. Uh, we finished at this stage. Uh, the prototype was validated. And um, at the moment, we are looking partners, not only in the surgery field or in the medical field, but also maybe some microscopy applications or scientific applications. Also, we're interested to find the partners for clinical trials, certification, or maybe manufacturing. So. That's it about this development. And if you have any questions, so please ask. Thank you, Tade, for presentation. Again, I still don't see questions from the audience. So my duty to ask uh, at least one for you. Uh, so you are providing the laser sources or the already combined integrated device uh, as, as a tool to, to solve some process, yeah? Yeah, so actually this uh, lightning system was not related with the lasers, but actually we have a competences for the general photonics understanding and the uh, interaction with the tissues. So uh, for this task, we would not use any lasers. There was an idea, but that actually with the LED uh, lightning, we achieved quite nice results and uh, uh, it seems that we can, can in implement maybe for the future some laser lightning or maybe for some fluorescence or some maybe other uh, applications. So we will see. But yeah, this time it was just general illumination for the uh, gen eye detection, yeah, for the vision. Okay, good, clear. Thank you. Uh, if there are no more questions so we can switch to to have a presenter dr leonard svensson from uh photonic sweden right so please you're welcome to give your presentation for us okay then i'll start my screen here so is it okay it's okay yep good uh, Lena Svensson here from Photonic Sweden. It's a short review ab about activities in, in Sweden. So what we do, we are an economic association. We were founded in 2011. We are three persons working actively. Board members are 10 and 52 member companies and we're 120 personal members. We have five university members, 13 large company members, 13 supply members, 21 uh, small and mid-sized members. And what we do, uh, we are covering um, many different applications, but it could be 5G, 6G, light fidelity, intelligent lighting, agriculture, food and manufacturing. We arrange uh, conferences every year. 2018, it was in Northern Optics where many of you attended. Uh, uh, it was in Lund. And uh, 2019 was the last one we arranged, it was in Stockholm. And also there was an honorable prize to Professor Emeritus Simmons von Berg that occasion. Uh, we had to postpone 2020, 2021, and the next time will be in UMU 2022. We also arranged uh, photonics workshops within our uh, program. Uh, one was uh, Photonics for Recycling that was held uh, outside Stockholm in the northern part of Sweden, Skellefteå. 
We also arrange opera pubs, that's uh, seminars where people interested in photonics can come and listen to uh, presentations. And after we have uh, some food and beer uh, to get associated. And now we have had uh, digital paintings, which is not that fun. But hopefully in October, we will have the first uh, uh, live meeting. So we arranged those in Stockholm, Gothenburg and Lund. We also uh, have been uh, in involved in 10 EU projects, and three of them are currently working. It's Photonhub Europe, Best Form 21, and Carla. Uh, Nordic Photonics Forum meeting is something that we try to get the people in the Nordic countries uh, involved in. And we started the first time in 2017 in Ole, Finland, and we have had nine of these meetings. Uh, the last one was in May this year. It was a startup for us and Photonics Finland within Fulton Hub Europe, which was also mentioned before the presentation. The next one will be uh, 1st December in, in Turkey, where Photonics Finland arranged their optics uh, days. Uh, the new project, Carla, uh, it's a photonic career hub. Carla is aimed at university students uh, as a possibility strains for researchers from photonics and non-photonics focused areas. And in May next year, it will be either in Lund or in Stockholm, so it's a free of charge, but really to attract uh, uh, researchers and students to get more acquainted with uh, photonics. And one of the uh, projects that might be of interest, it's, uh, you have the link down here, you can download these reports. Uh, the target application project aims to promote and support photonics as a key enabling technology. They focus on life science applications in the market where Europe holds a leading position. It's medical technologies, pharmaceuticals, agriculture, and food. And also here you have a possibility to download. There was a report here for about uh, 100 Swedish photonics companies uh, it's, uh, it was done in 2016, but might be interested if you are looking for uh, photonics companies in Sweden. Uh, in medical technology, we have, for instance, uh, a cobalt uh, manufacturer of special tail. This is a, a spe special tail for advanced optogenetics research, but they make a lot of different microchip laser for life science, metrology, science, industrial, and scientific. And we have clinical laser thermia systems in Lund. Uh, the laser generated heat induces destruction of the targeted tumor. And we have uh, Spectacure, as you heard Katarina Svanberg talk about with photodynamic therapy. And uh, there, there's uh, the combination of light and ultrasound enables measurement with light deep in the tissue. It, it's a project going on in, at Lund University by Stefan Krull, but also Spectacure, I think, is in, involved in this. Uh, so they use both ultrasound and lasers to make uh, the detection. And the uh, RISE Technology Research Institute of Sweden uh, in this case, uh, I will uh, show you here the far UVC light. It's uh, 27 and 222 nanometers. is strongly absorbed by the nucleic acids of pathogens such as coronaviruses. Namely, it could inactivate these pathogens. And uh, they are also having a hood XVAL, uh, fiber optics and special optical fibers manufacturing, also the signing of it. And uh, in digital cell morphology, uh, cell vision, it's also in the south in uh, Malmö. Uh, they have uh, introduced innovative automation, digital imaging, and artificial neural network technology, which has been very successful. And uh, as pioneer, the world's brightest X-ray sources, Exilium is relentlessly pushing the limits of X-ray sources technologies to enable new breakthroughs in science, medicine, and manufacturing. And the uh, X-ray imaging detectors, cadmium telluride, CMOS technology, uh, to directly convert photons to electrical signals. Uh, 
and we have uh, GE, 3D visualization. Their volume viewer provides state-of-the-art 3D visualization and processing capabilities for reading and comparing CT, MR, 3D, X-ray, PET, and PET-CT data sets. And uh, we also have FLIR here, which may manufactures thermal cameras and uh, it used for defense for the public health and measuring uh, for COVID. And the uh, sensor, they make uh, sensors for alcohol test for safety driving. Other Swedish photonics activities, there is a uh, Vinova program, smart electronics systems. And in Sweden, we have over 300,000 people employed in the electronic uh, industry. And uh, there's a Visual Sweden, uh, an initiative based in Östergötland oriented to promote innovation and regional growth within the visualization and analysis, but they cover uh, very many companies in whole Sweden. And there is uh, AgTech uh, innovation for tomorrow's agriculture, and it's including sensors and so. And if you want to get in contact with us, we have uh, our mail address and phone numbers here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I don't see any questions rising. I, as I understand, your uh, photoing Sweden is also like a cluster, pretty similar to the LITEC, yes? yes. Uh, so basically combining and gathering the laser expertise manufacturers and, and some specific solutions. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Good. So, uh, well, that's clear. <laughs> so it means no, no more specific questions. And thank you for your presentation again. And we can switch to the next presenter, Ugo Gru. I hope I pronounce at least understandably. And <laughs> representing uh, Opto Sigma company. And again, solutions and, and devices or, or, or components for, for, for making solutions. So please, Ugo. Take your stage and yes, and time. Hi, thank you so much. Okay, um, okay. So let's share and see if everything is working well. Can you see my screen? Can you see the screen well? Good. Yes. Good. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much for uh, for attending and you know discussing with me a little bit. So I wanted to come here and uh, discuss a little bit about our company and one of the services that we provide which is a custom solution for optomechanical assemblies, which can be very interesting uh, when we talk about biomedical systems, right? So just to speak uh, a little bit about um, OptoSigma in a way. So we're a company that was created in 2014 in Europe, but we are actually a branch from Sigma Cookie that was created in 1977. So a much bigger company uh, that works especially in off-the-shelf components, but also in optical design and optical assemblies, which is exactly what uh, I'm hoping to discuss today with you and present with you. Um, quick overview, um, maybe some of us, uh, some of you know us, maybe some of you don't. So just to get a quick overview, um, of course, part of our, um, let's say, offering and services includes there are different optical and photonics components, such as um, lenses, mirrors, but also holders, everything else. Uh, but as I mentioned, today we are going to discuss a little bit more about uh, the service that we offer, which is uh, optical assemblies. So to go directly into this, um, I decided to go to multiple examples just to show you and then you know discuss with them directly on it. So two situations that we made in the past and that I think could be interesting for you to get an idea of what we're able to do is to work in microscopy especially. So either it is with uh, systems like this one, which are modular microscopy systems. So basically we're using a lot of different parts that we made ourselves. And so we make it custom for the customer to make sure that it fits their requirements. And so this is a full microscopy system, which is called the Opto Nano or another situation solution. Here it's an example that we made for the University in Paris, since we're located in France, it was easy to discuss with them uh, directly, where we provided a custom long working distance objective. So we had already one that was uh, standard and we decided to 
make a few modifications on DNA, a few modifications on the glass thickness, and to make sure that it fits in the system. So this is, um, let's say, a first um, introduction to part of the service that we can offer, which is um, taking something that is standard close to what we have and then make a small modification. This can be very interesting, especially if you're a little bit uh, shorter on lead time, maybe on budget, and that you are looking for a, let's say, more simple solution. Now, another option could be to go from scratch. So here I have two examples. So one of them isn't exactly um, for biomedical system, which was the SuperCam project on the rover that went to Mars, uh, I think it was a few months ago. So we had a few of our optics in there to do uh, some Raman spectroscopy, right? So in this case, it's purely a question of the customer has all the specification he needs, and then we're working with them, trying to put the specification, put all the, the optics and all the optomechanics into a system that fits some very difficult, let's say, environmental conditions. Uh, in space, as you can imagine, it's not exactly uh, the most friendly environment. So this was one of the bigger projects that we made. Another one we made was for microscopy, so multi-photon microscopy, but still. So the customer had an idea on a design for an objective, a ZMAX idea. And so we worked with him uh, for about a year and a half to find a good design, a good solution, because we're providing design. And then once the design was okay, we decided also to manufacture all the optics, which is quite interesting because in a way, you only have one supplier, so one supplier for the design and also one supplier for uh, the assembly in itself. So we worked on this and we delivered through prototypes and they were okay, so we decided to go into full production. And this is a way for me to maybe explain to you uh, that if you're looking for a special microscope, maybe a special objective that uh, you might not find as well, well, you can always come to us because as we can do design and manufacturing, it's a good way to exchange, to find maybe what are the differences between what's available on the market and what's possible for your application. And then you only have one person to discuss with, which is always very important to not get confused in all the different uh, issues. And speaking about issues, of course, if there's a problem, then we're the one solving the problem. You don't have to find all the information as well, which is uh, quite interesting. So these two projects also I wanted to, let's say, um, give a quick presentation to make sure that you can uh, you can see the full spectrum of um, offering that we can make on these optical assemblies, um, made for microscopy, of course. Maybe finally, um, to recap a little bit uh, what I mentioned, and maybe this we can discuss a bit more, especially if you have uh, questions on it. So I mentioned one challenge, one supplier, one question, one contact. This is very important for us. Uh, we want to make sure that we can have a lot of added values to the request that you're giving us. And we wanna make sure we can take your project, whether it is a research project, so maybe a few quantities, but very difficult specs, or a industry project, which requires maybe a little bit more volume, uh, maybe lower specs, but still a very, um, let's say, dedicated way to work with the project and to work with, with you, the customer. So this is two of the things that we specialize in um, on both of them. Also in terms of, uh, so to kind of match what I discussed about OEM and research, technical support and sales support is very strong with us. Uh, we are a, a smaller company, uh, as I mentioned, we're starting to grow. So we wanna be placed as a challenger. We wanna be there to help you. And technical support and sales support is very important for us. Um, so that will go with me, the sales engineer or directly the engineer uh, in the factories that are here to help you uh, working on the project. Yeah. So, Again, as I, as I mentioned, uh, I'm the sales engineer for Lithuania, uh, for Opto Sigma Europe. So if you have any questions, any project, um, anything that can relate to the products that we can offer or the services that we can offer, and you have a project that you want to work on with us, don't hesitate to let us know. You can let me know. There's a, my contact right here, and we will be more than happy to work on your project, discuss with you, see what we can do, and trying to find a solution that matches your system. Okay, thank you, Ugo, uh, for your presentation. Uh, I see no questions from the audience, but again, just to be sure and to have some takeaway message. So your main idea of, of, of a presentation is that besides all the optical elements, components, you also offer the, the solutions like custom-built specific, uh, well, assemblies or 
uh, setups or at least help with it in, in, in all stages in designing, providing components and also testing, optimizing? Yes, exactly. Uh, we, work, we can work in different ways. So either we start from everything. So we do the design, we do the assembly. Of course, we'll do the testings afterwards uh, so that we can ship everything to you. But if you already have a design and you're looking for a manufacturer, that is also totally possible for us. Of course, we set up an NDA. We discuss about uh, the design that you have and if it's possible for us to make it. And then once we find a solution, we take some time to do proof of concept and prototype, then we can go into production, which is really the way that uh, we want to work. Either you have a design and we work on it on, or we do the design and we work on it also. Okay, good. Good to know that you are so flexible and who knows sooner or later, but it seems like uh, <laughs> sometime perhaps someone will need such services. So thanks again, Ugo. And, Thank you so uh, much for inviting. Yes, you're welcome. So now, according to the schedule, the session is over, but Tadas asked me to give a short presentation on my own, and I was polite not to answer no. So Tade, please overtake my moderation, and I can share a few slides uh, of my own presentation. Uh, let's see, I was not prepared uh, originally, but let's see. Uh, See how 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 it how it looks. Uh, so I'm I'm very glad to introduce uh, Mangirdas Malinauskas from Vilnius University, and he also works with biomedical applications. So please, Mangirdas, the floor is yours. You have a few minutes. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so you should see by now uh, the presentation of, of of mine. Yeah. So just few slides, as you might see in in the left bottom. Uh, it's an excerpt from uh, invited talk in virtual conference in San Diego, in Icaleo conference. And so just the most interesting and related to novel technological photonic solutions, which might be also applied to medical applications. So the title basically summarizes everything. It's laser 3D nano manufacturing or 3D printing of renewable organics, like plant-based materials, as well as pure inorganics, which means crystallines, uh, ceramics, and so on, via multi-photon lithography, which is enabled by femtosecond lasers. Quite similar technique to what uh, was uh, presented by Dr. Antana Surbas from a Workshop of Photonics. So we use light to 3D print uh, devices, uh, or actually uh, structures, uh, down to nanoscale resolution and up to millimeter in dimensions. Okay, uh, this can be called as a true multi-scale and multicolor 3D printer as it enables nanometer individual features to be combined into millimeter assembled objects with no breaking fragmentation in, in dimensions, meaning nanometer features, objects of overall dimensions over tens of millimeters and continuous scaling, whether it's photonics, precision prototyping, bioscaffolds, micro-optics, uh, Mm, microfluidics and so forth. And the materials, which gives us opportunity to produce colorful structures in the material sense, can be organics, hybrids, or inorga inorganic substances, like biopolymers, proteins, hybrid organic, inorganic composites, which can be structured as plastics, but uh, offer uh, functional properties of inorganics, like glasses and dope plastics or dome glasses, and finally, ceramics and crystals, which can be 3D shaped uh, using the same technique. As for renewable resins, uh, we have developed one uh, resin together with Konos uh, Technological University, namely Professor Yolita Ostroskete. Uh, one single resin, which is made from acrylated epoxidized soybean oil, so it's a bio-renewable plant-based resin, which is suitable for laser lithography as well as for tabletop 3D printings. Uh, printers, which uses very different exposure parameters, ranging from millimeters uh, to milliwatts per square centimeter to terawatts per square centimeter. And of course, the dimensions vary from nanometers to millimeters, and single uh, renewable plant-based resin is suitable to fill all the, all the dimensions and all the exposure conditions. And again, a uh, uh, wide variety of applications. So, of course, we as researchers publish it uh, on a yearly basis, our advances, but for a final slide or takeaway message, let's switch for something completely different and to inorganics. 
how can be made inorganic structures uh, made uh, consisting of glassy or ceramic substances and any shape, whether free form statue or bulky uh, cubic or whatever geometry uh, structures, as well as porous, highly porous, like nanophotonic uh, devices, photonic crystals with sub 100 nanometer in spatial resolution, as well as scaffolds uh, of super five millimeter in sizes. So it means no fundamental restriction in dimensions or geometry and the material. So let's look at the material, of course, many studies, but the outcome material after post-processing, thermal post-processing out of uh, hybrid organic, inorganic material, it can be turned into purely inorganic uh, substance and with resolution is uh, repeatable and downscaled below 100 of nanometers of individual features. So the developed technology consists of making a uh, hybrid material consisting also of silicon and zirconium, laser writing, lithography, yes, 3D printing, then uh, developing heating at elevated temperatures for extended periods of time and enabling the organic part to evaporate and remaining to isotropic shrinkage of uh, the structures, still preserving the geometry and converting into ceramics, such as uh, crystallites, uh, diamond-like materials, uh, tetragonal zircone, which is a, known as abrasion resistant, or monoclinal zircone, which is a biomaterial and still 3D structure. Uh, and by this, my I say I must say that my time is over as for presentation, but not yours. Of course, if you have any uh, questions, comments, or discussion, we can have it now or any time later. Just write me to email or or let's meet the. Our uh, our year, uh, uh, okay. I see as 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 one question from Ot uh, Rabane of regarding: Is it possible to directly three D print holograms? Uh, yes, in principle, there are no direct limitations. You just need to have a model and uh, materialize it. So it's CAD CAM fabrication, computer aided design, computer aided manufacturing. Uh, of course, it will depend on how small features you want to have, how many of them, it, but it's like a technological approach, how to achieve the needed resolution throughput without spending too much time or, or, or losing repeatability or whatever issues. But in principle, yes, uh, I, I removed actually some uh, example slides, not, not made by the results were made, not by our group, but of holograms used using this technique. Uh, just a hint, uh, the holograms can be directly 3D printed on tips of on optical fibers, like on faces of optical fibers. So whether to shape light, the outcoming light of a fiber, it can be applied as well as integrated in any kind of uh, optical platforms. Okay, thank you, Martin, gives us for your nice presentation. And I have written an ending talk <laughs> to summarize <laughs> all the session. Okay. So you are welcome to close the session. Yeah. OK, so uh, my personal Im impression as, as, as a, a chairman of this session, so uh, it was nice to hear how many and see how many medical solutions are being solved as medical problems by physical uh, technological advances, uh, namely photonic ones. And that is good, like uh, new smart devices are helping with early diagnosis and real-time monitoring without uh, causing too, too much difficulties to, to, to have it precise, fast, and all the time. So this is great. And at the same time, as a being pure scientist myself, uh, I, I would uh, encourage and ask or raise the question of to look deeper and find out the reason why are these diseases uh, emerging at all. Because I think these uh, tools for diagnosis uh, are not helping to as tools for prophylaxis yes, to avoid it. It's just confirming the cases. So like for coronavirus, we testing is good, we know, but typically it's when it's already positive. And vaccine is much better since it enables us uh, to prevent it. So by this uh, philosophical question, uh, I, I wish that we can meet uh, next year in the same Baltic Photonics event, and um, we can have the same questions, but maybe we can have more answers to them. Okay, so 
this is the end and thank you all for for presentations for for answers organizers for for doing it uh, virtual <laughs> yes and let let's meet next year whether virtual or hopefully physically and uh, have more answers to all the questions thank you and goodbye <laughs>